Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku become a vigilante. If you guys enjoy this movie comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story one irrelevant ghost from AO3. So let's start the video. Izuku wasn't sure how many more times he could have his heart broken before he could no longer summon enough hope or determination to keep himself going. But despite everything, he hadn't reached the point of no return yet. Not when he was diagnosed quirkless and his mom fell to her knees, sobbing out apologies for the future she knew was waiting for him. Not when his dad left only a few months afterwards. And not years later when he realized that Hisashi Midoriya hadn't left them for a job overseas, but rather because he didn't want to be the father of a quirkless son. Not when his best friend became his worst bully. And not when the one person he'd always admired, the number one hero himself, told Izuku that he could never be a hero without a quirk. It had been a close call, that last one. But after All Might had left, Izuku finally admitted to himself that he hadn't really expected any other answer. His whole life, people had ridiculed him for believing that he could be a hero, and those who didn't just pitied him instead. If not even his own mother believed in his, admittedly flawed, dream, how could he expect someone like All Might to say anything other than exactly what he had? Honestly, there was even something to what the number one had said, about how being a hero wasn't the only way to help people. There were plenty of other ways Izuku could make himself useful, even without a quirk. Truth be told, had it not been for Izuku encountering the sludge villain again on his way home, he might have given up on being a hero entirely. He'd very nearly walked past the scene. After all, what was the point of observing a hero fight if the information he gained from it would be entirely useless to him, when very familiar-sounding explosions caught his attention and drew him over? The heroes on the scene hadn't been able to do anything but damage control while Kaken had been suffocating, fighting desperately and ineffectively for his own life. Izuku hadn't been very effective either. But his impulsive actions did manage to create an opening for Kaken to take a gasping breath of air, buying more time for All Might to show up and save the day. Izuku had slipped away pretty quickly after that, not wanting to be lectured for his stupidity or caught by Kaken on the way out. And luckily, the rest of his walk home was nowhere near as exciting as the first part had been, and it had given him plenty of time to think. Specifically, he found himself reflecting on his future and the dream he'd been carrying with him for so long, and he'd come to a long overdue conclusion. Midoriya Izuku would never be a hero like All Might, or any of the other pro heroes he saw on the news on a near daily basis, but that didn't mean he couldn't be a hero at all. He'd just need to change his research a bit. He'd need to learn more about the underground heroes instead. They wouldn't be as easy to find and observe like the flashy daytime heroes were, but Izuku was sure it could be done, and he'd been correct about that. If the fact that he had been following an underground hero for several blocks now was any proof, Izuku had done his best to be inconspicuous as he'd wandered around the city, hoping to stumble across a hero on patrol, and after having no luck for three nights in a row, he'd finally succeeded. The sound of threats shouted in a gravelly voice had interrupted the otherwise silent night and had drawn him towards the scene, and he'd turned the corner just in time to see an underground hero incapacitate the still-shouting villain. Izuku had recognized the man almost immediately, Eraserhead, one of the few underground heroes he'd had any luck finding information on. It was only because the hero had a day job as a teacher at UA that Izuku had any clue who he was. Otherwise, he would have been completely obscure in the same way every other underground hero was. In the same way Izuku would be, eventually. After that, Izuku had taken to clinging to shadows, avoiding street lamps and keeping his footsteps light even as he hustled to try and keep up with Eraserhead who hopped from rooftop to rooftop with the ease and grace of a cat. The pace he was forced to keep in order to not lose sight of the man made it difficult to take notes in the journal he'd brought with him. It was a new one, since the other had been ruined by Kakin. And so far the information he'd found about underground heroes online had only been enough to fill the first seven pages. But he did manage to scribble some brief observations in his own version of short and as he half-jogged to keep up. Every so often a racer head would stop and stand on the edge of a rooftop gaze sweeping over the city below him, looking for any sign of villains, assumedly. And Izuku would quickly duck into an alley or the shadow of the building, taking the opportunity to catch his breath and scribble a few more words down. So far, he really only had information about the man's style of movement. Izuku hadn't seen enough of the scuffle with the villain to really get a sense of Eraserhead's fighting style, except that he clearly favored quick takedowns, likely facilitated by sneak attacks, which was impressive enough on its own. Eraserhead moved in a way that was both fluid and certain, he never seemed to second-guess a jump, no matter how wide the gap or steep the drop. It seemed that the man moved on instinct to some degree, and Izuku couldn't help but wonder what it was like to trust his own body that deeply. It was, he supposed, a skill he'd have to develop if he wanted to be a hero, 
After all, even with the help of support equipment, a hero's most useful tool was their body, and he'd have to be able to trust that he could physically do whatever he needed to do to save someone or stop a villain. The racer had stopped in his tracks for the fifth or sixth time and, used to the pattern, Izuku ducked into the dark alleyway between the building the hero was on and the next, crouching down to rest his notebook on his knees. He turned the page carefully and started writing ideas for physical training for himself, not just for strength but for agility and speed as well. So far, his plan mostly amounted to running a lot and eventually trying his hand at roof hopping like a racer head. But he figured that with some additional research he could probably find some workouts online that would be useful. He had just finished riding Parker, when he heard the scuff of shoes on concrete above him and he stood quickly, craning his neck up to see which direction a racer head was moving, just like he'd done several times before. This time, however, he looked up to find a pair of yellow goggles staring straight down at him in turn, and he barely even had the time to jump in surprise before the heavy gray scarf a racer head wore had descended down towards him, pinning his arms to his chest as it restrained him in a way that no normal scarf could have done. He briefly wondered how a racer had controlled the scarf. Was it a secondary quirk, or just incredibly advanced support gear? Either way, he didn't have much more time to think before he felt his feet leave the ground and he was jarringly lifted up to the rooftop above. The scarf remained around him as he was deposited in a somewhat awkward sitting position. The other end of the fabric held in a racer head's firm grip. Izuku was vaguely aware that his eyes and mouth were both wide open in what he was sure was a ridiculous stunned expression. The racer head's face, on the other hand, was inscrutable, and Izuku shifted awkwardly under the gaze of those yellow goggles. Um, I can explain. Izuku offered after the silence had dragged on for too long, doing his best to wave politely despite his wrists being pinned to his waist. Technically, Izuku hadn't been doing anything illegal, right? Getting caught tailing a pro hero wasn't a great look, he knew that, but he'd been doing it for the purpose of learning. Surely a teacher could appreciate that aspect of it? By all means, Eraser had answered in a gruff, almost bored tone, explain. There were two skills that Shouta Aizawa considered vital to his career as a pro hero, the first being stealth, instrumental in his ability to end a fight before the villain he's arresting is even aware it's begun, and the second being his situational awareness. Aizawa had honed his observational skills into a fine-edged sword, and there was very little that happened around him that he wasn't at least peripherally aware of. For example, the fact that he'd been tailed for several blocks by someone who didn't look much older than 12 certainly hadn't escaped his notice. He'd first seen the kid right after he'd gotten the drop on a villain who was using some sort of melting quirk to break into a jewelry store. It was the third store in nearly as many days to be robbed. And while no one had gotten hurt, Aizawa knew it was only a matter of time before theft and property damage became more. The villain hadn't been difficult to restrain once Aizawa had erased his quirk and getting the quirk suppression cuffs on him had been a breeze. It had been about the time Aizawa had finished alerting the cops to the captured villain that he saw the kid. He'd come around the corner and then immediately ducked back once he saw the scene unfolding, which hadn't struck Aizawa as anything too odd at the time. It was common sense to avoid an area with an active villain. Even if said villain was already defeated, better to be safe, just in case the worst happened. It was only after a police car had arrived, taken Aizawa's statement and left with the villain that Aizawa realized something about the situation was strange. The kid hadn't left. He was still standing right around the corner, occasionally peeking around before quickly tucking himself back into hiding. Aizawa kept an eye on him as he climbed up to roof level and resumed his patrol as usual, moving from rooftop to rooftop as he kept an eye out for trouble. The boy followed him, clearly doing his best to stay hidden. He wasn't even doing that bad of a job, either. Clearly, the kid had no experience with stealth, but he was sticking to shadows and staying behind cover as he kept a respectable distance between himself and Aizawa. If the kid had been tailing a normal person, he might have even been successful at going unnoticed. Aizawa found himself stopping every couple of blocks, taking a few moments to observe his shadow under the guise of looking for villains. The kid wasn't dressed like he'd been planning to tail somebody, wearing jeans and a normal t-shirt, a white shirt, at that, and carrying around a notebook and pen with him. Every time Aizawa stopped, the kid would duck into a nearby alley or hide in a storefront alcove and scribble something down in his notebook until Aizawa started moving again, at which point he'd close the book and continue following along. At first, Aizawa assumed that the kid would eventually lose interest and turn around to head back home. But that started to seem less and less likely as the end of his patrol approached and the kid was still figuratively on his heels. It'd be easy enough for Aizawa to shake him and head home, but curiosity got the better of him, so he stopped once again and waited for the kid to get into a hiding spot. Conveniently, he chose to duck into the alley right below the building Aizawa had perched atop, and he immediately crouched down and began writing again. Aizawa idly wondered if this was all for some school assignment as he moved towards the edge of the roof above the kid. The sole of his shoe scuffed against the ledge as he stepped onto it, 
and the kid looked up just in time to meet his eyes as he erased his quirk and sent his capture weapon down towards him. He set the kid down on the roof in front of him, looking down at his shocked face with an involuntary flash of amusement. The kid wore the same expression that his students wore anytime he used a logical ruse, all wide-eyed and open-mouthed like a hooked fish. Now that Aizawa was face to face with him, the kid looked a lot like his students in more than just his expression. That was to say, he was just an average kid. Despite what Aizawa had initially thought, the kid was probably 14 or 15, with a round baby face and large eyes that made him seem younger. He didn't seem to have a mutation quirk, and Aizawa felt his eyes start to sting as he kept his own quirk active. Um, I can explain. The kid wriggled slightly, although it seemed more like an attempt to gesture than to free himself of the restraint. By all means, explain. Okay so, I was following you, obviously, I mean, clearly you figured that part out already, I mean. It makes sense that a pro hero would know when they're being followed and it's not like I'm particularly good at it or anything. But anyway, I wasn't trying to do anything bad. I just wanted to, um, watch you. Like, like study you, I mean. That doesn't sound much better, actually. Take a breath, kid. Aizawa interrupted, taken somewhat aback by the sheer volume and speed of the kid's explanation. Clearly, Aizawa was coming off more intimidating than he had intended, if the nervous rambling was anything to go by. It was a common problem for him, if he was being honest. How about you start with your name, and do your parents know where you are right now? The kid shifted and looked away guiltily, answering the second question without even opening his mouth. Er, right. My name's Midoriya. Izuku. And um, no. Not really. Why are you following me, Midoriya? I want to be a hero. An underground hero. Midoriya answered, sounding equal parts sheepish and determined. He leaned forward slightly as he continued. But it's so hard to find information on underground heroes online. For obvious reasons, I mean. If you rely on the element of surprise, having a bunch of easily accessible information about you would be pretty counterproductive. And I was just walking around and when I saw you capture that villain I thought, well, I thought I could maybe observe you and learn something that might help me get into UA. I see. Aizawa took another look at Midoriya as he processed what he'd just been told. So, the kid wanted to be a hero, specifically, an underground hero. It wasn't a particularly glamorous lifestyle, and came with a fraction of the pay and practically none of the recognition normally associated with hero work. Most of the kids who got into UA wanted to be heroes, but Aizawa could count on his hands the amount of kids he'd taught who had willingly chosen to be underground heroes. Midoriya was fairly scrawny, and it was clear that he'd never had any sort of training, which, frankly, was to be expected for most of the students who applied to UA. Usually only those kids who came from wealthy heroic families had any sort of prior training. That was Aizawa's job, after all, well, his other job, to prepare his students for the career they chose. What mattered more than prior training was raw potential. And as far as Aizawa could tell, Midoriya seemed to have that in spades. After all, for someone to know their own limits well enough to know that the life of an underground hero is more suited to them and their quirk than the alternative, and then for that same person to show so much initiative as to actively tail a hero in order to learn something. Well, that was a good sign, if nothing else. You'll need to get better at blending in, in a crowd or in the shadows. Hoo-ha. The kid flinched slightly, startled, and learned to use your peripheral vision as well as reflections to keep someone in your line of sight. That way, it's less obvious that you're watching them. Midoriya's mouth opened for a moment and shut it again, an intent expression coming over his face as he nodded vigorously. Figure out your strengths and your weaknesses. Learn how to utilize the first to cover the latter. I particularly recommend activities to increase speed and agility. Strength is important, but not as much as finesse. Underground heroes are at their best when they strike fast and with the element of surprise. By that point, Midoriya was nodding with so much enthusiasm that it was a wonder his head stayed on his shoulders. And kid, he paused for a moment to emphasize the importance of his next words. Stop going out at all hours of the night to chase heroes. Aizawa let his capture weapon drop from around Midoriya's torso after he gave one final nod winding it back up to sit comfortably over his shoulders. Come on, I'll walk you home. Despite the gloomy, overcast weather that likely heralded an oncoming storm, Izuku was in unusually high spirits as he left school, tightening the straps of his backpack so that it sat firmly against his back. He'd managed to slip out of one of the building's back entrances. He'd gotten very good at disappearing into the crowded hallways after final dismissal, and so far no one had caught him leaving out the staff exit. The familiar roar of conversations, punctuated with shouting and laughter as a flood of students made their way out of the building was still close enough for him to hear, but for now, Izuku was alone. Giving the straps of his bag a final tug to make sure it was secure, Izuku climbed onto the lid of the dumpster where cafeteria trash was usually taken out, careful not to stand in the middle of the lid in case it decided to break, and jumped so that he could grab the ledge of a second-story window. 
From there, he continued to scale his way up the wall, using windows and weather-worn cracks in the brickwork to get to the roof, high enough up that it was unlikely anyone would see him. Even so, he stayed low as he made his way to the opposite side of the school, hoping that no one had any reason to look up. It had been almost three months now since his encounter with the pro hero eraser had, and Izuku had taken his advice to heart immediately. It took a lot of research and planning, but he'd come up with a training plan that focused heavily on speed, agility, and stamina. It involved quite a lot of running and just as much gymnastics. But despite the sore muscles and bruises Izuku had earned himself over the course of the past several weeks, he could tell that he was improving. He was no longer as clumsy as he used to be. And while he still occasionally second-guessed his ability to land a jump or things of that nature, he was slowly growing in confidence, to the point that he had finally decided to brave roof hopping. He didn't dare jump from buildings too tall yet, given that he still took one too many accidental tumbles for comfort. But he was getting there despite sticking to buildings only a few stories tall. With drops that would hurt if he fell but not kill or permanently injure him, Izuku had to admit that there was something exhilarating about roof hopping. Even when he barely made a jump, when he made it home with his hands scraped raw from only just managing to grab the concrete edges and haul himself up, it felt good. Izuku knew it was probably just a combination of adrenaline and growing confidence in his physical ability that made him so lightheaded and giddy even when he was completely exhausted at the end of the day. But he couldn't help but feel like there was something more to it as well. Maybe it wasn't just a coincidence that All Might had so nearly crushed his dreams on top of a building the very same afternoon that Kakin told him he should take a swan dive off the roof. Maybe it wasn't a big fuck you from the universe, like Izuku had originally believed, but instead a hint, a sign that he was finally on the right path, the path that would take him to the future he'd wanted for himself since he was old enough to dream. The flood of hope that warmed Izuku from the inside was almost unfamiliar. He'd been so acquainted with determination in his life that he'd forgotten it wasn't the same as honest, childlike hope. The lightness in his chest carried him for nearly three blocks, jumping from roof to roof with an assuredness that was completely unlike his normal self. After landing a particularly long jump, one that he'd fallen from a few times before, earning him the nasty bruising that painted his upper right arm and right hip a deep purple, Izuku couldn't help but let out a long, excited whoop that had been building in his chest for a while tossing his arms in the air for just a moment before tucking them back to his sides, pushing himself to build even more speed as he sprinted home. It was the first time since he'd started training himself that he made it home without a single fall, or even any close calls for that matter. And Izuku was rather proud of himself as he carefully climbed down the back of his apartment building until he had both feet on the solid ground. His progress had been painful, but he had proof that he was improving, and it was enough to have him humming a cheery tune as he made his way around the building and up the stairs to his own front door. Mom, I'm home. He called as he closed the door behind him, towing off his shoes and dropping his key back into his bag, which he tossed carelessly into his room as he passed it. The bag landed with a thud and slid halfway under his bed, almost obscured by the black and yellow blanket that hung off it. How is school? His mom asked as he stepped into the den, smiling at him from where she sat at a table, sewing machine and bolts of fabric covering every last inch of free space. She'd been busy recently with some intricate custom project at work and had apparently decided to bring some of that work home with her. It was okay, he told her honestly, but the walk home was really great. She smiled at him. I'm glad to hear it. Are you going back out before dinner? I think so. I want to go for a run before it gets too late. Izuku had gotten into the habit of running at least twice a day, once early, before the sun rose, and once right before sunset, in addition to his roof hopping to and from school. His mom didn't know about his latter training. For good reason, Midoriya and Ko was a chronic warrior, and the idea that her son was taking part in an activity so likely to end in broken bones or worse would likely have driven her mad with anxiety. Izuku didn't like keeping things from her, but it was something he was well used to doing anyway. As much as she wanted the best for him, he wanted the best for her as well. And if that meant a few lies of omission so that she didn't spend every minute of her day worrying about him, then he would bear the guilt with a smile. There's a smoothie in the fridge for you, she told him as he made his way into the kitchen to grab a snack, and he smiled appreciatively over his shoulder at her. Thanks. Inko had been so supportive of Izuku's new workout routine and his personalized diet plan that he'd spent hours researching, and he felt his chest tighten with gratitude for his incredible mother. Being the single mother of a quirkless child wasn't easy, let alone a quirkless child that insisted that he'd be a hero. But despite all her doubts, Inko had done her best for him, and Izuku tried to never take it for granted. It would have been so much easier for Inko to have walked out on Izuku when he was diagnosed, just like his father had done, but she had stayed. She never seemed to resent her son for his quirklessness or blame him for Hasashi leaving, even though Izuku would have understood if she did. But no, Inko loved Izuku and he swore to himself, 
Always, that even if he didn't become a hero, he'd find some way to take care of her as well as she had taken care of him. Izuku snagged the smoothie from the fridge and sipped it as he made his way back to his room to change out of his school uniform and into more appropriate running clothes. Once he'd changed, he pulled his bag out from under his bed and set it neatly next to his desk instead, pulling one of his notebooks out as he did so. In the past, he'd been in the habit of only having one hero journal at a time, filling the pages with a disorganized mess of analysis, pages for pro heroes, villains, and classmates all mixed together with no separation. Now, he carried three notebooks with him. One that was basically no different than any of his previous analysis journals, one that was dedicated entirely to notes on underground heroes, and one marking his own training progress. In the nearly three months Izuku had been using the three notebooks, the general analysis book and his training book were nearly out of space already, but his notebook on underground heroes was barely half full. Despite having spent tens of hours delving into the depths of the internet, listening to obscure podcast episodes and disappointingly general documentaries, nothing had proved as useful for his analysis as the hour he'd spent tailing Eraserhead months ago. Izuku hadn't gone out searching for underground heroes since then, figuring that he'd already tested his luck enough and worried that the next hero he followed around wouldn't be as unexpectedly kind as Eraserhead had been. The last thing he needed was to be arrested by an underground hero and then have to explain to his mom that he'd snuck out in the middle of the night to go hero chasing, a hobby which she already only barely allowed him to pursue in the daytime. Even so, Izuku had to admit that he was frustrated with the lack of information he'd been able to put in his notebook. The advice Eraserhead had given him was an excellent starting point, but Izuku knew he'd need more if he were going to get into UA and become a quirkless hero. With a sigh. Izuku tossed the notebook onto his desk as a reminder to do more research later that night. He was hopeful that he might eventually stumble on just the right enthusiast discussion board or chat room that would be able to offer him the information he needed. After washing up his smoothie cup and letting his mom know that he was headed out, Izuku stepped outside and immediately started at a light jog, headed down the stairs and out onto the empty sidewalk below. He jogged until he made it to the park a few blocks away, which had a walking path circling it. The park was currently abandoned, just like he'd expected. With the sun setting, the kids who would normally have been playing there had long since been called home, and any adults who might have been walking the path had also left. It was just Izuku, and he readjusted his earbuds so they wouldn't fall out as he increased his pace, going faster after every completed lap until he was at a dead sprint. It felt good to run, even once he reached the point where his muscles started burning and his lungs started gasping. Knowing that every moment he pushed himself past his previous limit was also taking him one step closer to his end goal made it easier for Izuku to keep going even when he felt like he couldn't go any faster or further. Finally, as the final song on the playlist Izuku had made specifically for running came on, he slowed back to a jog, letting his heart and breathing settle back into their normal patterns. He jogged most of the way back home as well, only dropping to a walking pace when he was a block away. The moment he did, he became aware of how heavy and unsteady his legs were. Izuku was very familiar with the soreness he would experience the next morning. He hadn't been fully without aches since well before he'd started his relentless training regimen, and he also knew the sense of accomplishment that would come with it. Besides, his muscles were never too tired for him to evade Kaken or his other classmates after school, so he really didn't think he was overdoing it, at least. After he'd showered and had dinner with his mom, Izuku retreated back to his room. Between the pile of homework he had to do and his continued research into underground heroes, it was nearly midnight before Izuku put all of his things away and stood up from his desk, joints popping as he stretched for the first time in several hours. Izuku turned off the desk lamp and dropped onto his bed with a yawn, too exhausted to even climb underneath the black and yellow striped blanket. It used to be an all-might bed set, but Izuku had replaced it not long after the incident. The racer head didn't have any merch that Izuku could find, but the striped blanket and matching black sheets had reminded him of the underground hero's black outfit and his signature yellow goggles. Izuku winced as the memories of the incident tried to force themselves back to the forefront of his mind, and he stubbornly forced himself to think about anything else. He thought about his plans for the next day, the same as any other day, really, except he'd have to struggle through a presentation about the history of quirks and their effect on modern society. It was meant to be a group project, but obviously no one had volunteered to be his partner, and so Izuku had finished the entire presentation and the accompanying essay on his own. It was probably for the best. He could already hear the jeers of his classmates, asking how he could do a project about quirks when he didn't have one of his own. Not to mention that he decided to put a particular focus on how the spread of quirks had changed the focus of nearly every scientific community from space travel and clean energy to the research of quirks and development of support items for heroes and heroes in training alike. He'd included a quote about how mankind would have already made it to the moon had it not been for the sudden appearance of quirks. Even though Izuku's stance was actually very neutral, he doubted his classmates would see it that way. 
part of him wanted to change some of his slides and rewrite his essay, but the more rational part of him knew that it would be pointless. He'd be mocked no matter what, and any attempts he made to avoid that outcome would be a waste of his own time. Izuku scrubbed a hand down his face and forced himself to crawl under his blanket, hoping that laying in a more comfortable position would make it easier to stop thinking and just sleep. Instead, he just found himself staring blankly at his wall, occasionally glancing over to the clock on his nightstand. Time was both inching by and passing all too fast, and Izuku felt himself getting more and more irritated as sleep continued to evade him. The bone-deep exhaustion he'd felt just before getting into bed had completely receded, leaving Izuku feeling wired and restless. The red numbering on his alarm clock read 2.27 by the time Izuku gave up on the idea of getting any sleep at all that night, so he threw his blanket aside in frustration and got out of bed. Huffing to himself as he quietly stalked into the kitchen for a glass of orange juice, he stood in the middle of the dark kitchen for several minutes, sipping his juice and weighing his options. He didn't want to get back in bed if he was just going to be wide awake anyway, and he didn't want to watch TV in the living room and risk disturbing his mom. The idea of sitting at his desk and trying to do more research seemed unlikely. He could barely hold on to his thoughts, each one sliding away before he'd fully had time to consider it, and he knew that he'd just end up even more frustrated with himself if he tried doing anything that required him to think. The only other choice Izuku could come up with was to go for a run, or maybe get more roof-hopping practice, and he had to admit that it was pretty appealing. He was antsy, so full of energy that he didn't know what else to do with. Besides, if he exercised now, he could probably get away with skipping his usual morning run and instead use that time to actually get some sleep before school. Izuku quickly changed into jogging pants and a hoodie and climbed out his window. He didn't want to risk coming back through the front door in case his mom was awake by the time he returned, making his way to the roof of the building with ease. He followed his normal route towards Alder, occasionally using street lamps and dumpsters to clear distances too far for him to jump. Izuku had only gone a few blocks from his apartment when he heard a sudden, high-pitched shriek pierce the otherwise quiet night. He stopped mid-stride, arms windmilling slightly to keep himself from falling off the edge of the roof he'd been about to jump from. The scream had come from somewhere to his right, and he turned to face that direction, squinting into the darkness like he might somehow see what was going on. Ah, get away from me. He was already bolting towards the shout before he'd even made the conscious decision to check it out, only slowing when he could see the woman in an alleyway down below. She was being cornered at the farthest end from the street by two men, one of whom held a knife out towards her while the other seemed to be rooting through her purse. Izuku crouched slightly, creeping towards the edge of the roof right about the alley. The two men didn't have any obvious quirks, but Izuku felt it was safe to assume that the knife-wielding mugger probably didn't have a quirk meant for offense, at the very least, anything good. The one with the knife asked his partner, glancing over as the other man dumped the contents of the purse on the ground with a frustrated grunt. No wallet. Where's the fucking cash? He directed the last part at the woman, practically growling it at her, and she gasped and shrank further back until her shoulder hit the brick wall behind her. I, I don't have anything on me. I forgot my wallet at home today. She explained, desperation seeping into her tone. Bullshit. The first guy spat, suddenly lunging towards her until he had the collar of her shirt in one hand and the knife pressed directly against her throat. Check her pockets. Izuku pulled up his hood and drew it tight around his face. Sparing a moment to be grateful that the night had been cool enough to warrant the sweatshirt, before he had a chance to second-guess himself or come up with a better plan of action, he threw himself off the roof, aiming to land on the second criminal. He hit his target with more force than he'd expected, and instead of momentarily stunning the guy like he'd intended, he ended up driving the man into the pavement and, apparently, knocking him out cold. That was lucky, Izuku thought as he rolled off the man's limp form, coming up into a crouch to stare down the man with the knife. He'd accidentally evened the odds for himself, and hopefully had managed to slightly intimidate the remaining criminal in the process. Now that he had gotten himself into this situation, he knew he needed every advantage to make up for his lack of information on his opponent and his lack of training beside us all. Get away from her. Izuku tried to lower his voice, but the result was not as impressive or demanding as he'd hoped. The man sucked his teeth for a moment, eyes flashing between Izuku and his prone friend. After a tense moment, the man clearly came to some sort of internal decision, and in one quick motion he shoved the woman roughly towards Izuku, who only barely managed to catch her before she knocked both of them to the ground. Izuku grabbed her by her forearm and helped her regain her balance, moving so that he was between her and the mugger. Go, get to safety and call the police. The woman didn't hesitate, turning and sprinting onto the street, headed down the block towards a store that was open all night. A searing pain tore through Izuku's left shoulder and he gasped, spinning around to find himself face to face with the man whose blade was now dripping with a dark liquid. 
Izuku pressed his hand to his shoulder and was startled to find his sleeve already wet with blood. Stupid, why would you turn your back on a knife-wielding villain? Izuku scolded himself, before pitching himself backwards to avoid the man's next swipe at him. The man kept swinging the knife in large, clumsy arcs, keeping Izuku on the defensive as he ducked to avoid getting even more injured. Even though he had so far managed to be fast enough to stay out of the man's reach, Izuku knew he couldn't keep dodging forever. He was running out of space to maneuver in the cramped alley. And while adrenaline had immediately worked to dull the pain in his arm, he knew it was only a matter of time before his injury caught up with him again. Waiting for the police or a pro hero to arrive was out of the question. Izuku needed to end the fight, and end it soon. Okay, Izuku, think. The man had a fair bit of height on Izuku. Although he was scarecrow thin and didn't seem particularly strong, his large, dramatic swings had been good for keeping Izuku at bay so far, but also left him open to a counter-attack. If Izuku timed it right, he could duck under the man's arm and try to knock him off balance. Wait, wait. Now, Izuku crouched under the man's slashing knife, angling himself so that his shoulder slammed into the man's stomach when he lunged forward. He heard the air leave the criminal's lungs in a whoosh as he met his mark. The man's back hit the ground hard and Izuku took advantage of his winded state to wrestle the knife out of his hand, pressing his knees into the villain's shoulders in order to keep him pinned down. The sound of approaching sirens pierced the roar of blood rushing in Izuku's ears and he took in the scene around him. The man he'd knocked out earlier still seemed out cold and unlikely to come to any time soon, but the one he had pinned was quickly recovering from being dazed. Izuku had to leave before the cops arrived, even if they didn't arrest him on the spot. They'd still have to send him to the hospital and call his mom, and he couldn't inflict that sort of stress on her, but he really didn't want the conscious criminal to get away. Izuku didn't have anything to restrain him with, and a brief glance around the alley didn't turn up anything useful, so he was left with only one real option. The sirens sounded like they were only a block or so away. If Izuku was going to get away before they arrived, he needed to act quickly. Sorry about this. Izuku cringed in sympathy as he brought the handle of the knife down on the man's head with enough force to knock him out. But if you hadn't been threatening that lady, this wouldn't have happened. Izuku tossed the knife aside as he got to his feet, acutely aware of the red and blue light bouncing off the buildings around him. Getting back to the roof with an injured arm wasn't entirely impossible. But by the time Izuku had done it, two police cruisers had pulled to a stop on the street below. Stay where you are. One of the officers shouted at him as they leapt out of the car, while the other rushed into the alley to check the muggers over. Izuku ran back the way he came, ignoring the alarmed shouts of the officers. He's the one that saved me. The faint sound of a woman's voice called to them from the back of the second car, but then Izuku was too far away to hear any response. He didn't check if he was being followed, he didn't hear the sound of any cars nearby, and he doubted the police would have been able to keep up with him on foot, but he didn't stop running until he was nearly home. Finally he slowed, allowing himself to catch his breath as he closed the rest of the distance to his open bedroom window. He climbed inside carefully, shutting the window and drawing the curtains behind himself before he collapsed on the floor. His shoulder was throbbing, the searing pain returning suddenly enough to steal the breath he had just caught. The soft fabric of his jacket was plastered to his chest and upper arm on the left side, and he was almost afraid to look down at himself. Izuku was no stranger to being injured, and he wouldn't say that he had a particularly weak stomach, but then again, he'd never been stabbed before. He'd never lost so much blood before. The room was starting to sway slightly, and the part of Izuku that could still think logically knew that he'd pass out soon if he didn't tend to his wound. Forcing himself to sit up took a considerable amount of energy, and Izuku kept his injured arm tucked close to his body as he crawled towards his backpack. With his good arm, he managed to fish out the first aid kit he always kept inside it, flipping open the latches one at a time before dumping the kit's contents onto the floor. Izuku sifted through the pile, grabbing a roll of gauze and cotton pads, as well as a small bottle of hydrogen peroxide. The sleeve of his shirt was plastered to his skin. And he hissed through his teeth as he peeled the fabric away from the gash and slowly pulled the shirt off entirely. The black sweatshirt hadn't shown exactly how much blood he'd been losing, but Izuku's head spun as he looked down at his red-covered arm. It was hard to tell exactly how deep the cut was because of the blood still oozing from it, but Izuku was starting to worry that just wrapping it in gauze wasn't going to be good enough. He knew he had a tube of surgical glue that he'd never needed before. Frankly, the burn cream came in more handy than anything else in his first aid kit, although he kept everything well stocked just in case, and he wondered briefly if that would be more useful. His squeamishness at just the thought of gluing his own skin back together nearly made him hurl, however, so he ultimately decided that the bandages would have to do. Izuku used some of the cotton pads and the hydrogen peroxide to clean the cut and the skin around it. 
before pressing a clean pad to the cut and using the gauze to secure it in place. It was a little uncomfortable, having the gauze wrap around his shoulder and under his arm, and he decided that if the cut didn't require extra treatment the next morning, he'd replace the gauze with tape instead. As it was, though, Izuku was too exhausted to do anything more than climb into bed and close his eyes. His light was still on and the pile of first aid items still scattered across his floor, but he couldn't bring himself to care as the gentle hand of sleep took hold of him, bringing him easily into unconsciousness. Izuku frowned down at the scene unfolding below him, tearing his eyes away for a brief moment to glance at the dim face of his wristwatch. It was nearly 3.30 in the morning, which meant that he was already two and a half hours past his self-imposed curfew. Still, it wasn't like he could just ignore what was happening. Perched on the edge of a roof and shrouded by darkness, Izuku watched a group of three men climb back and forth through a busted storefront window, each carrying an empty duffel bag in and a full one out. They were emptying the bags into the boot of a car idling by the curb, a fourth man waiting in the driver's seat in case they needed a quick getaway. Clearly, they'd disabled the store's alarm system, and the rest of the block was full of dark, empty storefronts. It wasn't a residential area, so there was little hope of a neighbor seeing the robbery in progress and calling the police. Izuku supposed that he should call the cops and let them handle the situation, but he knew that they wouldn't get there in time to stop the thieves from getting away. Over the past two months, he'd been timing police response and forming a map of underground hero patrols, which is how he also knew that no other hero was likely to swoop in and intervene now. Maybe Izuku would have just gone ahead and called the cops and made his way home if it had been a normal store. After all, Izuku was exhausted and still sore from a scuffle with a purse snatcher the day before, and he already had little hope of getting any sleep before school as it was. If these men had chosen to rob any other place, Izuku might have let the proper authorities handle it. As it was, though, they had chosen the one store in the area that had a backroom full of unlicensed support gear, both stolen and specifically designed for black market sales. Izuku would know. He'd been there three weeks ago buying the collapsible staff he now pulled from the ring on his belt. One end could be electrified with a push of a button on the middle section. The other end hit a bladed extension that he could also deploy at will. As well as the staff, Izuku had picked up a few other items that were certainly illegal for anyone other than licensed heroes to own, although he'd only gone for non-lethal gadgets. A few pairs of handcuffs, not quirk-suppressing like the ones heroes and cops carried, but strong enough that they could contain most of the common grade villains Izuku had begun coming into contact with. Several items useful for confusion and evasion, including smoke grenades, flares that were blindingly bright when lit, and beacons that shone a beam of light into the air and emitted an ear-piercing siren when activated and a disc that when thrown would launch a net made of material similar to that of Eraserhead's capture weapon. Similar, but not the same, given that the details of Eraserhead's scarf were something only the hero himself and likely the designer of it seemed privy to. Not every item for sale had been as mostly harmless as Izuku's purchases, however, and it looked like the thieves were intent on emptying the shelves. He couldn't in good conscience risk letting these villains get away with items that could be used to hurt or kill heroes and civilians alike. Izuku held his compact staff lightly waiting until the three thieves had gone back into the dark store to drop down to street level. He needed to take out the driver first, and fast, before the others came back and he was outnumbered. One of the criminals seemed to have some sort of glass-related quirk. Izuku hadn't seen them break into the store, but he saw the way the scrawnier of the group seemed to will the jagged hole in the glass to open wider when it snagged at his duffel back. He couldn't be sure what the extent of the man's quirk was, but Izuku did know that there was enough glass around, between the shattered window and the various glass storefronts lining the road, that he didn't want to get caught in a head-on confrontation with him. Of the other two men, one had no apparent quirk and the other had a mutation quirk. The latter was quite a bit larger than his friend's and had fins on the back of his neck, his forearms, and his calves. His face was mostly normal, if somewhat more angular and gaunt than would have been expected of a man with that much muscle. But he had five large, obvious gills ringing the sides of his throat. He reminded Izuku of a shark villain he'd witnessed Mount Lady take down the day she debuted, but only because of the fins really. This man, while well over six foot and built like a competitive bodybuilder, was nowhere near as large as that villain had been, and not mutated to quite the same degree either. Izuku used his thumb to pull back the pin on his staff, and it expanded with a jolt that would have launched the weapon from his grip had he not learned to expect it. It wasn't possible to sneak up on the driver. In the time Izuku had been observing the scene, he noted that the driver seemed the most paranoid of the bunch. While the men inside the store spoke excitedly to each other about the haul they were pulling, the driver only spoke to shush them or to tell them to hurry up, and his eyes seemed to be constantly darting around checking his mirrors every few seconds as though he expected the cops to somehow sneak up behind him. Since stealth wasn't an option, 
Izuku chose to move quickly instead, rushing the car and jamming the electrified end of his staff into the man's neck before he could shout a warning to his friends. The man slumped unconscious over the steering wheel, and Izuku reached around him to pull the keys from the ignition, tossing them into a nearby storm drain. I hey, get a look at this thing. Izuku's head snapped towards the store and he crouched slightly behind the car, peering into the darkness to try and make out where the men were. Not bad at all. A deep, gravelly voice answered back, clearly appreciative of whatever item the other had found. It sounded like they were still at the far end of the store, behind the false wall that hid the illegal merchandise, so Izuku took his chance to dart away, back towards the building he'd come from. Although instead of taking to the roof again, he crouched down in the shadowy area between it and the store currently being robbed. Between his all-black garb and the black hood and mask covering his face, he doubted they would notice him hiding there. He knew that they'd notice the unconscious driver and immediately be put on guard. But Izuku hoped that he'd still have enough element of surprise to at least handle glass quirk and unknown quirk before they even knew he was there. If he could incapacitate those two first, he could use his deployable net on the fish man and call it a night. Speaking of calling, Izuku pulled the burner phone he'd been using for vigilante work from his pocket, quickly dialing the only saved number. Eyes still glued to the storefront. Izuku held the phone to his head and waited. Mustafu Poli, robbery in progress. Four men. It's a clothing store that's a front for illegal support gear. Izuku interrupted the person who answered the call, rattling off the information and then the address in a low voice. He mashed the hang-up button before the woman could get out any follow-up questions, sliding the phone back into his pocket. He didn't make a habit of calling the police before he'd apprehended the criminals, given that the police were just as likely to arrest him as the people he was fighting. But outnumbered as he was, it seemed prudent to do so. At least if things went sideways, law enforcement and an underground hero would already be on their way. The sound of excited chatter became clearer as the first of the criminals, the smaller man with some form of glass quirk, rushed towards the open car boot, turning his full bag over and letting its contents spill out. He hadn't noticed the state of the driver, and in a stroke of luck for Izuku, turned and sprinted back into the store the moment his bag was empty, passing the man with the unknown quirk on his way out. He unloaded his bag into the trunk a little more methodically than the other had, tasking items out of the bag two or three at a time as opposed to just dumping it out carelessly. Izuku couldn't be sure how far behind the big guy was, but truth be told, he was more worried about the quirk he didn't know than the two he did, and so he took his chance. Dashing from his hiding spot, Izuku came up behind the thief and, just as he'd done to the driver, stuck the electrified end between the man's shoulder blades. Unlike with the driver, the man didn't lose consciousness, although he did hit the ground almost immediately. Izuku pulled a pair of cuffs from his belt and snapped them around the dazed man's wrists. He had just locked the cuffs in place when a wordless shout of surprise came from just inside the shop, and Izuku looked up to see the larger of the three staring at the scene with wide eyes and open mouth. Hey, get out here. It's that vigilante they've been talking about. He called back into the store, dropping his duffel bag as he stepped out onto the sidewalk, shocked expression quickly melting into an exhilarated grin. Izuku cursed under his breath as he heard a similar crashing sound from inside the store, and knew that it was a matter of seconds before the other man joined them. The fish man charged towards him and Izuku leapt sideways, just barely avoiding getting tackled. He grabbed the net launcher from his pocket arsenal, pressing the button on top to prime it. When the fish man spun around to charge him again, Izuku was ready, launching the disc directly at his chest. The net exploded outward on impact, and the man's own momentum caused it to tangle around him, bringing him to the ground with a heavy thud. He groaned and struggled against the specialized ropes, but the net seemed to be holding tight. The crunch of someone stepping on glass drew Izuku's attention back to the storefront, where the final member of the crew had just emerged. He was staring at Izuku with cold, calculating eyes, and his expression made it clear that he was not impressed by what he saw. So you're a vigilante. The man scoffed. The shards of glass began defying gravity as they lifted slowly into the air, forming a jagged ring around his body. He took a few leisurely steps towards Izuku and the remaining glass in the window behind him strained outwards after him, drawn to him like metal shavings to a magnet. Pretty scrawny. I expected more from a wannabe hero. Izuku scowled behind his mask but didn't rise to the bait. Instead, he kept his eyes on the glass that surrounded the man in a loose orbit, tensing as he waited for the inevitable attack. Not much of a talker, huh? The villain taunted. He didn't seem to be interested in getting any closer to Izuku, staying out of range of his staff, no doubt, and Izuku weighed his options as the man continued talking. That's fine. You won't have much need for talking when we're done here. If the man used the glass to keep Izuku at a distance, the staff wouldn't be useful. For that to work, though, he'd have to stay on the defensive. And Izuku suspected that wasn't his plan. Even though he had no way of knowing that Izuku had already called the cops, he likely suspected that either the police or a passing hero would interrupt if they fought for too long. 
so the villain would have to play aggressive, which would no doubt leave openings for Izuku to exploit, assuming he didn't get diced up in the process. Izuku didn't know the limits of the man's quirk. So far, the glass he was manipulating seemed to be moving slowly, lazily around him, but that didn't mean that it couldn't move faster if he needed it to. And that's what worried Izuku the most. The smartest thing to do would be to attack first, before the villain had a chance to, but that meant bringing himself closer to the ring of shards, probably going to end up cut either way. Izuku thought grimly, frowning behind his mask for a moment. Then, abruptly, he smiled, spinning his staff with one hand as though preparing to attack. The villain's eyes tracked the staff intently. Izuku was fairly certain that his plan was to wait for him to lunge and then turn him into a human pincushion, and never noticed how Izuku's other hand reached for his belt, closing around a smooth metal disc and pulling it free of the hook that held it, pressing the button on top of the disc with his thumb. Izuku flicked it so that it landed in the street between him and the villain, who flinched back as a bright beam of light erupted from it at the same time as a high-pitched monotonous alarm. Izuku, ever prepared, already had earplugs in that made the ear-piercing shrieking tolerable and had been prepared for the sudden white light that was harsh against the darkness of the night. The villain, on the other hand, squeezed his eyes shut and instinctively clapped his hands over his ears as the beacon assaulted his senses. The glass around him wavered uncertainly, and Izuku took his chance to close the distance between them, prepared to tase his opponent quickly and end the fight once and for all. Between the earplugs and the beacon's alarm, not to mention the blood rushing through his head, it would be nearly impossible for Izuku to hear police sirens until they were nearly on him, and he didn't want to risk taking too long and having to run from another scuffle with the police. Unfortunately, he miscalculated exactly how incapacitated the villain was, something he only realized when the man suddenly opened his eyes and shouted wordlessly, hands still over his ears. Several shards of glass launched forward, and Izuku had gotten close enough that he had no time to react. Instead, he just doubled down on his planned course of action, and the electrified end of his staff met the center of the criminal's chest at the same time that the shards hit him. Luckily, the man didn't seem to have pinpoint accuracy with his quirk, as most of the glass did little more than graze Izuku through his hoodie sleeves, although two sharp edges found their mark, one burying itself into his right shoulder and the other into his left hip. Izuku gasped against gritted teeth, the noise only audible to himself, and not just because the villain had collapsed backwards, apparently unconscious as the floating glass dropped unceremoniously to the ground once more. Staggering backwards, it took a moment for Izuku to recover, the shock of being stabbed quickly giving way to a sense of calm urgency as his rational mind took over again. First thing, he needed to get away from the scene so that he could assess his injuries without fear of getting caught by the cops. Izuku collapsed his staff and hooked it back onto his belt before scooping up the beacon and doing the same, deactivating it with another push of the same butt. His net was a loss, given that it still held the guy with the mutant quirk, and Izuku couldn't help but scowl behind his mask. Not only had he given up one of his most useful tools, he had no way of replacing it because these idiots had just robbed the one place Izuku knew of that sold support gear under the table. Sure, he was certain that there were other places he could find, but this one had been conveniently close to his home and had the added benefit of being in an area generally considered safe, meaning that it was less suspicious for a 14, almost 15-year-old kid to be seen walking around the area. Besides, finding this store in the first place had been a mess, given that it had taken cutting a deal with a petty purse snatcher who used a grappling hook he'd purchased there to make quick getaways. Izuku had hoped to get himself a grappling hook from the store as well. He'd witnessed a racer head using his capture weapon to help him swing across distances that would have been too far for him to jump, and thought he might use a grappling hook for a similar purpose. Unfortunately, it was apparently a one-off item for the store, not something they usually bothered to carry. Occasionally, Izuku really regretted not taking the grappling hook when he'd caught the purse thief again a few weeks later. He'd left it for the police, instead, and no doubt it was gathering dust in an evidence room somewhere. Izuku's eyes strayed to the car, where most of the store's inventory lay in a careless pile. Stealing a stolen item was no more illegal than buying a stolen item, as far as Izuku was concerned, and he'd already done the latter. Moving quickly, Izuku limped towards the trunk, mindful of the glass still in him, leftover adrenaline helping him power through the pain as he used his uninjured arm to rifle through the pile of stolen goods. There, he huffed out a relieved sigh as he found not one, but three more compact nets, completely identical to the one he'd used on the shark guy. They too went on his belt, which he'd also bought from this store, although he'd modified it somewhat for his needs by adding extra hooks and a sturdy pouch to the back. There were plenty of items still there that Izuku was sure would be useful, but he knew he didn't have the time to figure out which ones. He'd already wasted enough time just finding the nets, and he was certain he saw blue and red lights illuminating the otherwise dark sky in the distance. Izuku would have felt better taking the rooftops away. 
It was faster than walking through the streets, and he was less likely to run into unsavory figures. But he knew that he'd never be able to make all of the jumps with the way he could barely move his left leg for the pain. Instead Izuku half limped, half dragged himself around the corner, in the opposite direction that he guessed the police cars were coming from. Obscured in the shadow of the building, Izuku took a deep breath and leaned back against the pitted brick wall, eyes squeezing shut as he wrapped a gloved hand around the shard in his leg. It would bleed more, once the glass was gone, but Izuku knew he'd be able to move easier without the shooting, white hot pain searing through his leg every time he jostled it. One, two. Izuku bit back a hoarse shout, jaw clenched tight as he tossed the bloody piece of glass aside. He pressed his hand to the gash, unable to feel the wetness of the injury through the glove but certain he had already lost quite a bit of blood, given the way he swayed momentarily as he straightened up. The unsteadiness faded somewhat as he forced himself to walk through the pain. It was only a 15-minute walk back to his house from where he was, although it took him nearly double that to actually arrive at his apartment building, panting and exhausted. His vision blurred as he forced himself to climb through his window. Though whether that was from blood loss or tears he wasn't entirely sure. He no longer kept his first aid kit in his backpack. Instead, when Izuku collapsed to the floor in front of his bed, he only needed to reach out with his good arm and slide it from underneath the edge of his blanket. He had, for the most part, gotten better about not coming home so injured that he could barely move. But in the early days of his not-vigilantism it was at least a once-weekly occurrence. Not-vigilantism because Izuku had very carefully researched the laws that had to do with vigilante justice, and the definition hinged on the unlicensed use of a quirk against a villain in any situation that could not otherwise be classified as self-defense. Since Izuku did not have a quirk, he could not legally be classified as a vigilante. Although he was well aware that the distinction did not matter to the police, or most of the pro-heroes he'd occasionally come across in his short time as a not-vigilante. Stripping out of his bloodied clothes proved to be the most difficult part of patching himself up, save for actually removing the glass still stuck in his shoulder, because of the way the blood had begun to dry around the edges, gluing stiff fabric to his skin and making him hiss when he had no choice but to just tug it free. The rest of the process was practically instinct for Izuku. The gashes were not as bad or as deep as he had feared, although they were still bleeding enough that he wasn't certain that gauze and cotton pads would be enough to staunch it. Instead, he found himself pulling out the tube of skin glue that he'd been so hesitant to use two months ago. He'd used it twice since then. An untrained not vigilante was prone to injuries, he'd realized fairly early on, and so it was an easy matter for him to apply the glue and pinch the skin back together. Izuku knew that the wounds probably should have had stitches as well as or instead of the glue, given that they were larger than what the instructions on various internet sources recommended the glue be used on. But he was hesitant to give himself stitches if he could help it. Besides, he'd purposefully bought the more expensive brand that was apparently used by medical staff at Hero Agency, the ones that didn't have someone on staff with a healing quirk, at least, so he hoped it would hold better than other types of glue. Even so, the gash on his hip worried him somewhat. It was just high enough that it wasn't exactly over the joint of his leg, but close enough that too much movement might pull the glue seal open. Oh well, Izuku was too exhausted to worry about that now, his limbs already heavy and sluggish as he put away the contents of the first aid kit and lazily shoved it in his bloodstained clothes back under his bed. He couldn't even be bothered to force himself into bed, instead just laying back on his floor and closing his eyes against the light he'd left on. Part of him wanted to pull his blanket off his bed and onto himself, even though he knew nothing was supposed to touch the skin glue and he'd no doubt have to rip the blanket off in the morning if he did so. Even so, it wasn't his fear of disturbing his injuries that kept him from covering himself in his blanket, but rather the fact that his arms simply would not move. Izuku knew he was still littered in smaller cuts from the fight that he hadn't so much as disinfected, but they were relatively minor lacerations in comparison to the places where he'd actually been punctured and they'd already stopped bleeding well before Izuku had made it home, so he wasn't that concerned. He'd splash some peroxide or ointment on them in the morning and call it done. Izuku's head lolled to the side, his limbs splayed out across the cool wood floor, and it wasn't long before he sank gratefully into the arms of deep unconsciousness. School rarely posed much of a problem for Izuku anymore. Sure, during class he was still ridiculed and shoved and accidentally hit in the head by backpacks, but it was nothing compared to what he experienced at night now. At least once a week, often more, Izuku found himself taking down criminals and villains of all sorts. He was getting pretty good at attacking from stealth, ending most fights before they even really started. But even when that wasn't an option, he'd learned how to become evasive. It wasn't uncommon for him to take on two or three petty criminals at once and come away with barely a scratch. But the skills he had learned had come at the cost of plenty of painful mistakes along the way. The ropey, raised scars on his shoulder and hip were a testament to how much progress he'd made, standing out starkly when compared to the smaller silvery scars that also littered Izuku's body. 
So, even though the word still stung sometimes and Izuku couldn't always stop himself from flinching when someone shoved him in the hallway, he felt it was safe to say that he'd gotten used to much, much worse than anything his classmates could dish out. Even the occasional burn from Kakan's explosions didn't carry the same weight that it used to. Somewhere along the line, getting stabbed had become something mundane to Izuku, and he reckoned that compared to that, a few burns and bruises were practically a pleasant change of pace. Even when his teachers took their turn, ruthlessly berating him in front of the class for offenses that ranged anywhere from not paying attention to doing too well on an assignment, he found it easy enough to tune the words out. Sometimes he distracted himself by combing over the details of his latest fight and pointing out things he did well and things he could have done better, similar to how he analyzed hero fights. And sometimes he thought about the times he met actual underground heroes over the course of his patrols. It was always thrilling to get to see an underground hero in action. His notebook was nearly full now, thanks to the handful of times his patrol had accidentally overlapped with a prose, and even more exciting to actually help them take down a villain. Of course, every time Izuku swooped in to assist an underground hero, he ran a 50-50 chance that they would also try and arrest him afterward. But he'd gotten good enough at his eraser had inspired Parker that it was just as easy to evade heroes as it was to avoid the police. Besides, he'd learned to tell which heroes were most likely to try and capture him and which would probably turn a blind eye as he slipped away from the scene. Overwhelmingly, it was the younger heroes, ones who had just graduated or had just moved from sidekick to solo, who would be the ones who tried to arrest Izuku. The way he figured, they had something to prove, and also took a harder stance on moral gray areas than the older, more experienced pros did. Most of the older underground heroes he'd encountered, on the other hand, usually treated him with something he could only call professional courtesy. Sometimes they warned him that if they met again, they'd have to arrest him. But for the most part those heroes who simply offer him a nod of gratitude for his assistance and politely turn away so that he could disappear in peace. And disappear Izuku did, grin hidden by his mask at the tentative acceptance he'd been offered. He knew that, as a vigilante, he would never truly experience the camaraderie that two underground heroes might experience should they ever cross paths or team up. But what he had was more than he had expected. Sure, Izuku would never have a support system to lean on or people he could count on to help him out of tight spots. Just because he offered his assistance to police and pro heroes didn't mean he could expect the same courtesy back. But what he did have was coexistence. Just the idea that he could occupy the night alongside those heroes, even if he would never really be one of them, was enough to keep Izuku smiling as he took down criminals and ran from the police night and night again. The harsh ringing of the bell pulled Izuku out of his thoughts, and he quickly shoved his notebook and pen into his bag and leapt out of his desk, rushing to be part of the crowd of students already streaming into the hallway. Kakan and his friends were never the first to leave the classroom, so as long as Izuku ducked out before they'd had the chance to finish putting away their own books, he was basically in the clear already. Shaking Kakan was always the hardest part of the school day, especially on days when the explosive boy was out for blood, but once he'd done it, it was child's play for Izuku to thread his way through the crowd of students eager to get home and slip out of a side door. Although, it also felt like Kakan had been expending less and less effort when it came to chasing Izuku down before or after class. His friends were just as bad as ever, but half the time when they caught Izuku between classes or at lunch, Kakan was nowhere to be seen. That wasn't to say that Kakan left him alone entirely, because there were still days when he seemed to enjoy making Izuku cry, but those days came less frequently than they had at the beginning of the year. Before the incident that Izuku still didn't like to think about, Izuku was certain that this wasn't some strange display of gratitude from Kakan who had made it clear that day that he didn't owe Izuku anything. Not that Izuku would have ever asked for anything in exchange for his actions against the sludge villain. But that was not the point. The point was that Izuku didn't understand why Kakan had become more tolerable in the past few months. But he had already decided that he wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. He had enough going on already. And trying to figure out what made Kakan tick sometimes was a bit like figuring out how to disarm a bomb when all the wires were the same color and tied in a knot. There were more important things for Izuku to worry about, like, for example, the upkeep on his support gear. As Izuku scaled the side of the school with ease, body moving on instinct from months of following the same path home every day, he thought about the arsenal that he used for his nightly hobby. At first, the gear had been a bit of a crutch for him. After all, going quirkless against even some of the weakest quirks could have meant his death if he hadn't found something to level the playing field, but were now just tools that made his job easier, but weren't necessary. He'd gotten so much better at unarmed fighting, now only employing his staff when he found himself facing down multiple opponents or someone whose quirk meant that Izuku couldn't feasibly take them down of his own strength. 
Aside from the staff, the net, and the cuffs, the rest of his kit was geared towards distraction and evasion, smoke bombs, beacons, flares, all items he could use to disorient his opponents long enough to get out of their line of sight or otherwise finish a fight. Those items were also extremely difficult to resupply. The smoke bombs weren't exactly available online. And the flares were specially designed to temporarily blind anyone who looked directly at them. So again, not exactly easy to buy. At least the beacons were reusable, and Izuku had bought three of those. One had been destroyed in a fight, ground under the heel of a man with elephant's legs. But the other two still functioned perfectly fine. For now, Izuku still hadn't been able to locate another store selling black market support gear. Most of the criminals he apprehended didn't feel much like telling him where they got their gear from, if they had any at all. And it wasn't like he could just go asking around. Hey, do you sell illegal support gear to 15-year-olds? By any chance? Yeah, that would go over real well with the average shop owner, he's certain. All this boiled down to, of course, was that if Izuku wanted to keep his gear working properly or be able to replace the gear he used up in the course of his vigilantism, he'd need to learn how to maintain and create the items himself. He felt fairly confident in his ability to reverse engineer something like his beacons and nets, given that he'd been teaching himself how to repair household appliances and other electronics for years now. Beyond that, getting the parts to make more of those items would be far easier than trying to find a new underground, highly illegal black market for support gear, and, frankly, it would be less of a hassle too. Plus, Izuku knew he could probably buy the raw materials he needed in bulk, which would last longer and be cheaper than having to rebuy the same items every time they broke, were taken by the police, or were otherwise lost to him. Of course, Izuku would actually have to crack open the beacon in the net launcher to be sure that he could recreate them, and it seemed unnecessarily risky to do so at home in his room, where his mom could walk in at any moment and wonder what exactly he was doing, even if he waited until she was asleep. There was always the chance that he might accidentally set off the beacon as he took it apart, and the siren was loud enough to wake not just his mama room over, but also his entire apartment building. It seemed too risky. Instead, Izuku decided he'd put off patrol that night in favor of sitting on the roof of some abandoned building in a non-residential area so he could fiddle with his support gear. At least that way, he ran less of a chance of disturbing people in the middle of the night, even if the beacon did activate unexpectedly as he poked around its internal wiring. And so that's what he did, slipping out of his room at just past 11 that night, over an hour after his mom had gone to bed. Izuku already had an area in mind. A few months ago there'd been a pretty major battle between the number 2 hero Endeavor and a villain with the ability to cause localized earthquakes strong enough to shake a city block. The battle had taken place in a largely industrial area, and any civilians who did happen to live there were evacuated, and hadn't been able to return due to structural damage to every building in the area caused during the battle. Izuku had only seen pictures of it on the news, having never had any reason to venture that direction himself, but it had looked like some sort of post-apocalyptic hellscape right after the battle. Some buildings had collapsed in on themselves thanks to the constant quirk caused earthquakes and left rubble and concrete dust in a fine layer over the street. Other buildings were darkened by soot from buildings that had caught fire and burned down to the supports by Endeavor's quirk. Somewhere in the back of his mind, Izuku remembered reading that the number two hero was also number one in terms of collateral damage during hero fights both in regards to property and people. It made sense. Fire was so destructive, but those with fire quirks were often praised for the power they held. People like Endeavor or Kakin never had to worry about what they burned because no one would ever hold them accountable for the damage. Hazily, Izuku got the impression that his father was the same way, although he could barely remember the man now. He did know that his mother never cried when Hisashi left, or at least, never when he was around to see. Izuku shook his head and focused on making his way towards the ruined district taking the most direct path across the rooftops even as the buildings got taller and the drops more deadly should he miss a jump. He'd come a long way in his five months of being a vigilante, and he found himself moving on instinct more often than not, his mind a thousand miles away while his body did what he needed it to do. It reminded him of how in awe he was as he studied the way a racer had moved, and he couldn't help but wonder if the man would be proud to see how much Izuku had improved with his advice. He doubted it, of course, given that he was a quirkless vigilante and a racer head was a pro hero, but still. Izuku would always be grateful for his conversation with the man, no matter how brief it had been. It had changed Izuku's life more than he had even realized at the time, more than his conversation with All Might even. When he arrived in the ruined district, Izuku found that the damage was even worse than the pictures had shown. It was startling to see how many buildings had crumbled in the wake of the battle between just two people. Even the ones that were still standing seemed dubious, as though a strong enough breeze could simply blow them over, and Izuku found himself slowing out of fear that the roofs might give way under his feet. It was weird. The Hero Commission had a budget ostensibly for repairing property damage following hero fights, and yet it had been months and it looked like no cleanup work had even been started. 
Maybe the commission's attention was elsewhere. At the moment, after all, hero battles happened nearly every day, albeit rarely on the same scale as the one that had taken place there. Even so, for such a large area to go neglected for so long, Izuku frowned and made a mental note to look into public records of the commission's expense reports. Maybe something there could explain why they wouldn't make the repairs to this part of the city a priority. But that was a problem for the next day, when Izuku was back home and had access to his computer. For now, he made his way to the most intact-looking building with the sturdiest roof, taking slow and careful steps as he went. The night was clear enough that the moon illuminated his path, and a gentle breeze danced through the wreckage, making the buildings around him groan slightly. Izuku tried to ignore the eerie sound as he sat cross-legged on the roof, dropping the backpack he'd brought in front of him so he could lay out the gear and tools he'd brought with him. Izuku decided to start with the beacon, figuring that it would probably be easier to figure out and put back together than his net launcher. Besides, he was a bit daunted by the fact that he only had one net left, and if he messed it up, it would be near impossible to get another. Maybe he needed to start thinking about alternative capture methods, preferably something multi-use as opposed to his single-use only launchers, but that would take a sort of mechanical skill that he just didn't have yet. The beacon was fairly easy to crack open once Izuku had managed to lever a flathead screwdriver into the seam of the plastic casing, which split clean into two halves. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief when doing so didn't set off the alarm and tossed the screwdriver to the side. The internal mechanics of the beacon seemed relatively simple. The button on the top half of the casing was actually a semi-opaque lens that apparently served to magnify and direct the beam of light into its usual blinding white pillar. And when pressed, the button hit a simple toggle switch that connected to the light and alarm piece. Izuku grabbed the notebook he brought along with his tools, a currently empty book that he planned to dedicate to his support gear, and, eventually, maybe even a costume. The black hoodie and sweatpants combo had served him well so far, sure, but it wasn't exactly the most sturdy garb. Besides, the mask he wore offered only minimal protection of his identity. When he was younger, Izuku had dreamed of what his hero costume would one day look like, sketching out All Might-inspired designs with a childish hand. Now, of course, Izuku knew he would be drawing inspiration from the various underground heroes he'd had the privilege of interacting with. Part of him ached to think about it. To think about the way his dream had been so simple and yet so impossible back then. But Izuku knew that his younger self would probably be proud of him now. After all, he always wanted to save people with a fearless smile, and that's exactly what he was doing. Even if no one could see his smile through the mask, maybe being a vigilante wasn't exactly the perfect culmination of his dream. But Izuku couldn't help but feel that it was the best, and possibly only, option available to him. The more he thought about what he was doing and what his future held for him, Izuku had come to realize that there was little chance he'd actually become a hero, underground or otherwise. Even though Yue had changed the rule that barred quirkless students from the hero course, they hadn't apparently done anything to actually make heroics exam more accessible to those without quirks. Or even, if Izuku was being honest, to those with quirks that were weak or useless. While he didn't know the details of the practical exam prospective students had to take in order to get into UAS hero course, the exam that Izuku had signed up to take in less than two months. Now, he did know that it was obviously geared towards applicants with flashy, offensive quirks. How many students with heroic potential had ended up in general education instead? And all because of an outdated test that didn't take into account that different quirks could be useful in heroics than just offensive quirks. Of course, Izuku knew that there was a way to get into the hero course without passing the exam. He and his mom watched the sports festival on TV every year, and he knew that Jen and students that managed to perform well enough had a shot at getting transferred into the hero course midway through the year. The problem with that was that the hero students would have already had several months of training to prepare them for the festival, while the general studies students would have to hope that their quirk was good enough to carry them into the final events, or at least to catch the attention of a hero agency or UA board member. It was, all in all, a flawed system that only catered to students with strong quirks, which, when Izuku thought about it, was a sentiment that could be applied to society as a whole. And wasn't that just the crux of it all? The reason that Izuku had spent the past few months sacrificing his sleep schedule, his health, and, to a degree, his morals just so that he could chase his dream of protecting the people that other heroes failed. Even if Izuku could somehow use his self-trained combat skills to pass the entrance exam, he wasn't really sure that that was what he wanted anymore. Izuku stared blankly down at the diagram of the beacon he'd been sketching before he got lost in thought, caught off guard by his own realization. He didn't want to join UAS hero program anymore, didn't want to have to claw his way through a system that had always been rigged against him just to do the same thing he'd already been doing on his own just fine. Even if a childish, naively hopeful voice in the back of his mind whispered that he still wanted to be a hero, the more logical part of Izuku knew that the only difference between what he was doing and what the underground pros were doing was a license and a paycheck. 
and Izuku didn't need to be paid in order to help people. Of course, that didn't mean that attending UA was a lost cause just yet. He'd need a day job to support himself and his vigilante lifestyle, preferably something that kept him close to the world of heroes without being too immersed in it. While his original goal had been the heroics department, Izuku was already guaranteed admission to general studies based on his score from the written entrance exam he'd taken months ago, before the incident. Better yet, instead of taking the heroic department's practical exam, Izuku could switch and take the support department's exam. While he wouldn't consider himself a mechanical or inventive genius, Izuku was a fast learner and had a basic grasp on the concepts he'd need to pass. Plus, he still had two months to teach himself everything he could about support gear and engineering it, which was plenty of time to prepare. He wondered idly if he could convince Yue to let him also take a few of the business course classes. Izuku was interested in hero law and the way the commission worked, if only because it meant he could better defend himself were he ever caught for being a vigilante. Though, and of course he'd have to see if there were any classes on quirk analysis. Izuku had heard of some hero agencies hiring consultants, people whose job it was to learn everything they could about active villains and their quirks so that they could be on call if and when a hero encountered a villain. It had sounded like an interesting and important job when Izuku had first learned about it, and for a while he had debated making that his backup plan should being a hero fail. That was until he learned that the only people that were usually hired for those roles were people with analytical or otherwise intelligence-enhancing quirks, of course. Funnily enough, that was the last time Izuku had ever tried coming up with a backup plan to being a hero. A sudden, deafening blast like a bomb going off tore through the night. And Izuku was on his feet in an instant, still collapsed staff in hand. He left his notebook and the dismantled beacon on the ground by his bag as he took off towards the sound. Instinct taking over, heading in the direction of the explosion led him towards a road in the center of the desolated district that was populated mostly by small, abandoned grocery stores and convenience chains, each no more than two stories high. Here, the buildings looked considerably less damaged than the taller ones surrounding the area, as though it had been sheltered from the hero battle. Some store windows were broken, and others boarded up, and there seemed to be a fine layer of grime on the face of every building. But aside from that, the only damage Izuku could see was the crater in the center of the road, where six people stood, only a few streets over from where he'd originally been. Izuku launched himself off the building he was on and landed with a practice roll on the lower roof of the nearest store, crouching against the raised concrete edge as he observed the scene unfolding on the street below. Oh, shit. Izuku's eyes widened as he took in the scene. Only illuminated by the full moon and a single yellowed, flickering street lamp that seemed determined to work even when none of the other lights along the street did. Eraserhead, of all people, was crouched in the center of the crater, goggles down and hair raised, capture weapon at the ready as he stared down the biggest of the five other men in the street with him. There was a chalky white dust coating his black hero costume in a thick layer, which Izuku could only assume was a result of being close to whatever explosion had created such a massive hole in the road. The other four men on the scene had fanned out into a semicircle behind him, careful to stay out of his peripheral vision as the underground hero carefully shifted to try and see them without taking his eyes off the big guy. Izuku assumed that was the one responsible for the explosion, given that Eraserhead never took his eyes off of him, even when he was outnumbered by the men behind him. The other four men, Izuku noted, all held weapons of some sort, two knives, an aluminum bat, and a crowbar, which was almost a sure sign that they did not have overtly useful offensive quirks. Still, any unknown quirk was a dangerous one, as far as Izuku was concerned. The sounds of shouting reached Izuku up on his perch, and he realized that the four men were taunting Eraserhead, daring him to blink or to turn his quirk on them, confirming Izuku's theory that the big guy had the most dangerous quirk. Eraserhead showed no outward acknowledgement of the men's jeers. He was tense and unmoving, no doubt waiting for one of the lackeys to get impatient and move close enough that he could incapacitate them with his scarf without ever taking his eyes off the leader. At least, that's what Izuku would be doing in his place. It was easy enough for Izuku to stick to the side of the roofs furthest from the scene as he hopped quietly and carefully across the conveniently close-set buildings so that he was closer to the four lackeys behind a racer head. While he didn't doubt the pro hero could handle himself, Izuku figured the least he could do was level the playing field, memories of his first ever act as a vigilante in mind. Izuku leapt from the roof, aiming to land on the man to the far right, wielding the crowbar, his feet connected with the man's back. And as he collapsed, Izuku rolled forward, softening the landing and bringing him closer to the next man in line, close enough that when he pulled the pin on his staff, the electrified end extended right into baseball bat man's throat. The man collapsed. Not unconscious but certainly incapacitated for now, while the man who had broken Izuku's fall was out cold. Two more and the big guy, Izuku called, unsure if Eraserhead had gotten a good enough look at the group to know how many men they were facing. The hero grunted in acknowledgement, barely audible over the shouting of the remaining three men as they recovered from the shock of Izuku's arrival. 
the racer head, apparently not one to waste an opportunity, decided to make his move against the big guy. Izuku tried to trace the fight in his periphery, but his focus was largely on the two knife-wielding criminals advancing in his direction. It's not too late to surrender, Izuku offered, his grin audible in his voice as he tracked the men's movement. He pulled his staff close to his chest and held it in both hands, grateful for the reach advantage. He really wasn't in the mood to get stabbed again. Not when he was nearly three weeks stab-free. No one has to get hurt. Well, no one else. One of the men, now that Izuku was closer, he could see the tiniest horns hidden in the man's mess of wiry hair, several of them all over his head and barely more than two inches long, lunged at him with an enraged shout. And Izuku quickly lashed out with his staff, catching the man in the shoulder. He swore and stumbled, dropping the knife as he brought his hand up to hold his other arm. Izuku almost felt a flare of sympathy for the man. He'd accidentally hit himself at least a dozen times when he was first learning to use the staff, and the bruises had taken forever to fade. I warned you. This time, Izuku didn't wait for the men to attack. He leapt towards them with a sweeping attack that they only barely managed to dodge, the uninjured man throwing himself backwards and dragging his compatriot with him. Another sweeping attack, which also missed, and then a quick follow-through strike that managed to catch the horned man in the ribs. He slammed into the brick facade of a nearby store before doubling over, winded. Another explosion rocked the street, causing every intact window to rattle and raining small chunks of debris everywhere. Izuku ducked and spun, scanning wildly through the dust cloud to find a racer head, there. With a sigh of relief, Izuku saw a racer head throwing himself back towards the villain and away from the concrete wall that had apparently exploded out towards him, capture weapon finding purchase around the villain's torso. Temporarily satisfied, Izuku turned his attention back to his own opponents just in time to duck around the knife being jabbed towards his chest. Huffing, Izuku whipped his staff into the side of the uninjured man's leg while he was still off balance from his failed attack. He winced when the sound of a pop reached his ears and the man crumbled with a wordless shout. Er, sorry about that. I'm pretty sure it's just dislocated, if that helps. The man groaned several choice swears in response, and Izuku cringed, or maybe not. The other man, with the horns, had ended up half sat, half laid against the wall, and when he noticed Izuku looking his way, he tossed his knife aside. I'm fucking out, he scoffed. Not getting paid enough to take a beating from some half-pint psychic. Good choice. Izuku turned back to check on a racer head and was pleased to see the man snapping a pair of quirk suppression cuffs around the man's wrists, capture weapon pinning his arms to his side still. As if sensing his gaze, a racer head looked up from the villain and met his eyes, at least, Izuku assumed so. It was hard to tell through the goggles, which was probably the point. There was a scowl on the man's face as he stood up and stalked towards Izuku, who quickly collapsed his staff and stowed it back on his belt. He didn't want a racer head thinking that he was a threat, after all. Izuku tensed, ready to run as a racer head came closer, but the man breezed past him to the three still conscious but very much defeated criminals. The fourth was still lying face down on the sidewalk, snoring lightly, watching uncertainly as a racer head cuffed the three men. Izuku debated on whether he should disappear or not. He knew that being allowed the chance to get away was a courtesy, one that he would be foolish not to take advantage of, but, well, it was a racer head. It had been almost six months since he'd first met the man. And while he wasn't foolish enough to seek the hero out intentionally, he had to admit that he'd always hoped to be at the right place at the right time to come across him again. There were so many things Izuku wanted to say, so many things that he wanted to ask the underground hero, but he was afraid to take the risk. He had yet to refuse a hero's silent offer to allow him to disappear unaccosted back into the night, because he feared that doing so meant they'd have no other choice but to try and arrest him. After all, letting him escape because they were too busy securing a villain was different than letting him go purposefully, watching him dally off to his next act of vigilante justice with a wave. Izuku had grown confident in his evasive abilities, but outrunning schoolyard bullies or fledgling heroes with barely more experience than himself was not the same as outrunning a racerhead. The mental image of his mother's face if she ever had to bail him out of jail was enough to make up Izuku's mind for him and he turned quietly on his heels, aiming towards a shadowy alley on the far side of the crater ruined street. Where do you think you're going, kid? Izuku wasn't sure what exactly he'd been expecting of UAS support department practical exam, but being assigned a table with a box full of scrap parts and told to just make something was not what he had in mind. Looking around the room, he was relieved to see that at least he wasn't the only person completely caught off guard by the assignment. Several other prospective students looked just as uncertain as he did, either staring at their box of parts in puzzlement or also staring around the room as though they might find help in the confused faces of their peers. Only two of the ten people in the room had immediately started on their project, seemingly enthusiastic about the assignment. One was a boy with messy black hair and equally dark eyes, 
who had a look of determination on his face. The other was a girl with long pink dreads tied back, a pair of goggles resting on her head. Her yellowish irises somehow resembled a scope, no doubt a physical manifestation of her quirk, and she grinned maniacally as she simply appended the box on the table, muttering to herself as she tossed the box aside and started picking up parts seemingly at random. Shaking his head, Izuku tore his eyes away from her and instead looked down at his own box, looking for parts that might look familiar to him. Most of the bits were standard electronic parts, bundles of wires and computer chips, batteries, conductors, spools of metal wire of varying tensile strengths, bits of metal or plastic plating. There were also some more specific items as well, an apparently broken laser pointer, several glass lenses with various levels of magnification, and a few different types of support gear-specific items that Izuku only vaguely remembered reading about at some point during his two-month-long crash course into building support gear. Izuku felt confident, looking down at all of the parts he had carefully laid out on the table, that he could make a fairly decent replica of his beacons with what he had available, minus the sound element, but that felt like cheating. He didn't want to get into the support department just to learn how to copy other people's inventions. He wanted to make his own ideas come to life. Being able to make his own support equipment to fit whatever he needed to further his career as a vigilante would be an incredibly useful and likely fulfilling skill. But he'd never reach that level of competence if he didn't take a risk and test the limits of his mechanical skills. With a deep breath to help steady the nerves twisting in his stomach, Izuku thought about what had piqued his interest in having support gear in the first place, a grappling hook. On its own, a grappling hook was nothing special or even particularly difficult to recreate. But Izuku had long since imagined what it would look like if he designed his own. And looking at the pile of parts spread before him, he was almost certain he had pretty much everything he might need for it. Pulling aside the items he thought he would need and shoving everything else back into the box, Izuku found the pile of scrap reduced to just a few key elements. A spool of the thickest metal wire he'd had available. Every piece of metal plating he could find, each varying in size and shape. Several long strips of canvas material like what many heroes' utility belts were made of. Two long metal rod that made Izuku think of a railroad spike. A heat sink that Izuku was pretty sure was used largely for heroes whose quirks built up a lot of extra heat that might otherwise overheat their equipment. And several cartridges of C2, as well as a few other bits of electrical parts that he wasn't entirely sure if he would need or not. The plan was to create a harness or belt that housed the metal rods, the closest item he had to a hook of any sort, which would be connected to the metal wire. At the press of a button on the harness, the compressed air would theoretically launch the spike straight ahead several feet with enough force to launch it into a concrete wall. It would be a useful item for both maneuverability and protection in case of a fall. Although Izuku wasn't sure if his prototype would actually support any amount of weight, given that he didn't have anything to actually anchor the spike into the wall. Izuku didn't want to second-guess himself and end up with no project at all when the time was up, so he just hoped that having a semi-functional proof of concept was enough to gain admission into the support department. The next hour and a half was spent carefully compiling the components into something resembling a functional support item, running back and forth between the welding station, the sewing station, and the various other tool stations around the room to accomplish what he needed. When all was said and done, Izuku found himself stepping into his finished harness with only three minutes to spare before the exam time was up. Not exactly enough time to test his invention and fix any issues with the design. He admitted to himself with no small amount of anxiety. The harness fit securely, wrapped around his thighs, shoulders, and waist with the cinch over his sternum, and the weight of the two metal rods holstered at his hips was barely noticeable. So it was comfortable, but was it functional? There was no way to know until the test was up and it was his turn to demonstrate his invention for power loader. The moment the last three minutes was up, the support hero stood up from his stool in the corner of the room and looked around at everyone's inventions, each in varying states of completion. He congratulated them all on completing the exam before calling the first student into the nearby test room. One by one, each hopeful student was called into the test room and the heavy metal door shut behind them. No more than five minutes later, and occasionally much, much less, they emerged, minus their invention. No one looked particularly devastated as they left, which Izuku hoped meant that Power Loader was not a harsh critic. Nerve-wracking, right? The black-haired boy that had seemed so confident at the start of the test said, breaking the tense silence that had fallen over the handful of remaining students. Ha, huh, yeah, it really is. Izuku offered him a small smile that he hoped came off as sympathetic and supportive. I'm not nervous, called the pink-haired girl cheerfully. I know my baby is incredible. What is your invention? Izuku couldn't help but ask, impressed by her apparent faith in her own skill. A portable electrical defense system. It'll zap anything that comes within a certain distance of it. She puffed up slightly, unabashedly proud of her own ingenuity. If it really worked as perfectly as she seemed to believe it would, then Izuku couldn't blame her for being so pleased with herself. 
He himself had been pretty proud when he put the finishing touches on his own project, which, now that he thought about it, was pretty underwhelming when compared to something as impressive and versatile as a portable electrical field. Wow, that sounds really cool. Izuku smiled at her, trying not to let his own dejection show through. What about you, HM? What does her baby do? She questioned in turn, leaning over her work table with genuine interest. Ah, well, it's a prototype grappling harness. Two metal rods connected to wire that launch at the push of a button. Theoretically, something like that could be used to cross long distances in an instant or save someone from falling. But it's not really as impressive as what you made. Izuku rubbed the back of his neck awkwardly, turning his face away from her very intense stare. No way. I was thinking the other day about some sort of arrow launcher that could be used to swing around tall places. We should combine our ideas and make the ultimate grappling baby. Izuku looked back to see her grinning wildly at him, eyes fiery in the same way they had been at the start of the test, and that sort of intensity startled Izuku, although he didn't necessarily find it scary. In fact, he felt like the way she felt about her inventions was similar to how he felt about his nighttime hobby, like it was the most important thing in the world to her and she defined who she was by her ability to make her designs a reality. Or maybe Izuku was just projecting. Either way, he instinctively liked the pink-haired girl. He hoped she never asked him what his quirk was, of course, if they both made it into the support class, it would only be a matter of time. For as long as Izuku could remember, every new school year began the same way, with the teachers going around the room and having their students announce their name and quirk to the class. It was always a humiliating experience for Izuku, even though he always had many of the same classmates and his quirkless status was well known to everyone attending Alderan. That'd be cool. Izuku replied noncommittally, trying to sound enthusiastic while also fully aware that there'd be no chance she'd still want to work with him on anything once classes started. It will be, she announced certainly, standing up from her stool and moving around her table towards his, one hand extended. Hatsume, we're going to make so many wonderful babies together, I can just tell. A laugh went around the room at her phrasing as Izuku turned red, knowing full well what she meant but taken aback by it anyway. He offered his hand back to her hesitantly, wondering if he should just tell her now that he was quirkless. She'd probably get angry later if he kept it a secret, but he also didn't feel like dealing with the stares or name-calling he'd inevitably have to put up with once his lack of a quirk was revealed. For now, he decided to keep his mouth shut, smiling to hide his inner turmoil as she enthusiastically shook his hand as though they were sealing some sort of business arrangement. Ha, huh, yeah, I bet we'll all invent some pretty cool gear this year, right? There were murmurs of agreement throughout the room. And Izuku's nerves settled somewhat when Mei finally released his hand and returned to her seat, her attention turning to the dark-haired boy, who also seemed nice, if somewhat reserved, as he chatted with Mei. Mei ended up being next on the list to demonstrate her invention, and when her time was up she flounced out with a wide grin and two thumbs up towards Izuku, who waved politely as she left the development studio. Finally, it was Izuku's turn. Of course, he felt bad that he was likely. Hopefully, about to put two holes in the wall of the room, but given the explosion they had all heard just before May exited the testing room, he figured a few holes in the wall wouldn't be any worse. The testing room was more spacious than Izuku had imagined it would be, filled with targets and test dummies, the concrete walls and floors already covered in holes and blackened by explosions and fires. Power Loader closed the door behind him and moved to the side, holding up a clipboard and a pen that were twice the size they would normally be to accommodate for his quirk. All right, Midoriya, let's see what you've got, Power Loader said without any preamble, gesturing for him to start the demonstration. Izuku turned to face the far wall, standing just in front of the door, and took a deep breath as he reached for the button in the center of his chest. The recoil from the force of the rod shooting out of their holsters was enough to send Izuku stumbling backwards, only just able to keep his balance. But he shouted in exhilaration when the spikes completely embedded themselves in the wall, all the way up to where the wire connected to them. Izuku gave the wires an experimental tug, the rods didn't budge. Grinning as he pulled a bit harder, he applied more and more pressure to the metal ropes until his weight was completely supported by them and he leaned fully back, letting out a disbelieving laugh. Izuku stood back up and moved over to the wall, tugging at the cord closer to the spikes. It took some wiggling and quite a bit of effort, but he eventually pulled the rods free, letting them drop to the floor with a heavy clang. He turned to look at Power Loader, who was marking something down on the clipboard. The excitement of having a working invention ebbed away as anxiety took its place once again, and he twisted his fingers as he waited for Power Loader to look up or say something. Impressive, Power Loader said idly, seeming to become aware of the tension seeping into the room. Now tell me, what improvements would you make if you had access to any tools and parts you wanted? 
Um, well, I would like to adjust the metal ends to have a more secure grasping mechanism. Paired with an automatic release and retract feature, I'd probably need hydraulic parts for that. Not to mention a motorized pulley system. And I'd like to replace the launching mechanism with something self-replenishing or multi-use, instead of a single-use cartridge. Oh, plus it'd be cool if each line could be launched and released independently of each other, should the situation call for it. Maybe a fail-safe feature in case the launching mechanisms jam or something. But that would take a lot of experimentation to sort out probably and Izuku cut himself off, realizing that his answer was getting a bit long, only to realize that Power Loader was writing something again. I see, the hero said, nodding idly for a moment before looking up. Your demonstration is over now. You can leave your invention here for me to look over. Right. Izuku shrugged the harness off easily, handing it to Power Loader somewhat awkwardly given that the metal attachments were dragging across the floor. As he stepped out of the room and the next student, the nice dark-haired boy, was called in, Izuku couldn't help but feel a little off-kilter. He had no idea if he'd passed or not. And while he didn't feel like he'd absolutely botched the demonstration, he wasn't at all confident that he'd done well either. He found himself frowning as he walked out of the room, head down while he thought about everything he could have done to improve his invention. Finally, as Izuku pushed through a set of double doors and found himself in an empty courtyard leading him towards UAS gate, he shook his head and tried to focus on the positive instead. Even if Izuku didn't get into the support department, He'd pass the general education and the business department exams with flying colors, which at least gave him two different possibilities to fall back on. It was nice, at least, to be guaranteed a place at the school of his dreams, even if said dreams had changed quite a bit since he'd first conceived of them. Hizuku pulled out his earbuds and decided on a podcast to listen to as he made his way home, the normal way, taking the train and walking the last few blocks. There are too many people out and about still, enjoying the cool weather and making good use of the few hours of sunlight they had left, and the vigilante Deku was becoming a bit too well known in the underground for Izuku to risk taking his usual mode of transport during the day now. The last thing he needed was some over-eager hero showing up at his house because someone saw him parker his way home in the middle of the afternoon. The apartment was empty when Izuku finally arrived, but he had expected that. His mom had warned him that morning she was staying late at work for a meeting with a client, where normally he would have been greeted the moment he opened the door by her gentle smile. And the smell of something cooking, he met only silence as he closed the door behind himself and made his way directly to his bedroom. Izuku collapsed face first onto his bed, limbs splayed out like a starfish, between studying engineering and support gear in preparation for the exam and the fact that he'd destroyed his sleep schedule by staying out at all hours of the night on patrol while also having to go to school during the day. Izuku was exhausted. It was the sort of tiredness that filled his body with lead and anchored him to the bed, mind for once blank as he stared at the backs of his eyelids. With his mom still at work and no more tests or assignments to prepare for, Izuku felt justified in indulging his exhaustion, and he was asleep in minutes. For the first time in weeks, Deku felt well rested as he prowled across the rooftops, skimming dark alleyways and keeping an ear out for any sign of trouble in the night. It had become a familiar habit over the past months to spend his nights patrolling the city, covering the areas that were neglected by the various underground heroes. Not intentionally, Izuku was certain, but he'd learned that underground heroes were mostly freelance and not tied to an agency, which meant that communication between them in regards to things like active cases and patrol routes was usually non-existent. The color-coded map Deku had made for himself of the various heroes' active zones had come in handy in figuring out where his own patrols should focus, although he still occasionally handled crime in zones that weren't his own. It was a risk, fighting villains in already established territory, but Deku refused to sit idly by and let people get hurt just because a hero might stumble onto the scene as well. He had already learned that heroes weren't the infallible pillars of society he had once thought they were well before deciding to follow the path of a vigilante, but now... Now Deku felt as though he'd become well acquainted with the failings of hero society as a whole. The districts he patrolled were more often than not considered high crime areas, places neglected by the limelight heroes and left to the underfunded and overworked underground heroes, who could only do so much when they were spread so thin. There were so many limelight heroes that a regular citizen could barely walk down the street without bumping shoulders with one, or at least with one of their sidekicks, and every city boasted dozens of hero agencies. Meanwhile, the number of underground heroes fluctuated weekly, with some disappearing or dying or going into retirement and the occasional new hero moving into the area. But Deku estimated that there were less active underground heroes at any given time than there were limelight agencies. It made sense. Underground heroes made a fraction of the pay that their daytime counterparts earned, and there was no glory in the job. Flashy limelight heroes, the sort the commission favored, earned fame with every fight, 
their accomplishments televised for the whole country to appreciate in the dead of night, with no camera crews or adoring crowds to observe them. Underground heroes stopped the sort of crimes that people liked to pretend didn't happen anymore. The average person liked to imagine that every criminal was like the villains they saw on the news. The sort who robbed banks and demolished buildings and was always defeated by a hero. Deku had to admit, he himself used to think the same way. He used to pretend like the gritter. Stomach-turning aspects of villainy didn't exist because he never saw it on the TV. Because it was easier to stomach bank robberies and mass property damage than human trafficking rings and cold-blooded murders and pointless, brutal assaults that might leave a victim scarred for life. Some of the things Deku had seen, some of the people he had fought, would have made it hard for him to sleep if he weren't already spending most days on the verge of sleep deprivation already. The schedule Deku had set for himself was brutal. When the nights were calm and crime scarce, Izuku might catch a few hours of sleep before school. On nights when Izuku couldn't seem to stop long enough to even catch his breath, he might go with no sleep at all until the next day. He knew it wasn't healthy, and that once he started at UA he'd have to find more time to dedicate to school, and he'd need more sleep to keep up with his classes, but he was reluctant to cut into his already limited patrol time. Deku sighed and looked around himself, noting the lack of anything going on that might disturb him or require his intervention. His usual patrol area had been mostly quiet for the past few days, and while he knew that was a good thing, it left him with nothing to do except be alone with his own thoughts for hours, which was less good. It wasn't that Deku was hoping for crime to happen, but he wished he had something to do other than pace the length of a few city blocks while he waited to be useful. Frowning, Izuku pulled out the phone he used specifically for vigilante work and pulled up the only image in the camera roll, a picture of the patrol map he'd put together. The area he had claimed as his own were a few blocks of run-down stores and unmaintained housing surrounded by a hero called Shade's patrol route on one side and none other than eraser heads on the other. It was a late Wednesday night, or early Thursday morning, depending on how one looked at it, which meant that Shade was almost certainly active at the moment. Deku had encountered Shade once before. And while the gruff old hero hadn't tried to arrest him, Deku could tell that he was on thin ice with her. He got the distinct impression that she wouldn't appreciate him foraying into her turf while she was actively on patrol just because he was bored. Eraserhead, on the other hand, wasn't likely to be out. His schedule could be more unpredictable than some of the other pros. But given that class at UA were scheduled to start next Monday, Deku figured the man probably had work to do leading up to classes returning that would keep the man from being out quite so late. At least, he hoped so, because Deku was just bored enough to risk moving out of his relatively safe operating area. I'll just go a few more blocks over, he reasoned to himself, sliding the phone back into his pocket and starting at an easy pace. The area a racer had normally covered was huge, not to mention the times when the man ventured out of his area to ostensibly cover for other heroes who were on vacation or recovering from injury. And Deku figured that the chances of running into the man were slim if he never went more than a few streets past the invisible boundary separating his patrol area from a racer head. Things were silent for another hour or so as Deku continued his patrol, although he was extra vigilant for any sign of a racer head. He wasn't sure if the man's threat to arrest him if they ever met again was a bluff or not, but he really didn't want to try and call him on it either way. Deku had grown confident in his skills, yes, but he wasn't so arrogant as to think he could escape a racer head of all people. It was a well-known fact that Yue only employed the best of the best, and the fact that a racer head was the only underground hero among the staff there spoke volumes of his skill and ability. Deku signed to himself, exploring the semi-familiar streets that were part of Eraserhead's territory, and had almost decided to call it a night when motion a street over caught his attention. There hadn't been any people out at all that night, only the occasional car cruising down the streets below, and it was strange for anyone to be out at all given that it was well past three in the morning. Even if the person wasn't up to anything suspicious, it was dangerous for them to be out alone, so Deku made his way to get a better eye on them. The lights of a 24-hour convenience store illuminated the person pacing back and forth on the sidewalk out front, and Izuku watched as he made several motions to actually enter the store before quickly aborting them and resuming his pacing. The kid, a scrawny brown-haired boy that looked younger than him by several years, was dressed almost exactly the same as Deku in a black jacket and dark pants, minus the utility belt and mask, and seemed to be debating quite hard about whether he actually wanted to walk into the store or not. He held one arm close to his body and the other across his chest, looking up and down the street every time he turned around as though he were expecting someone to come along at any moment, although he never thought to look upward. After a few more moments of uncertainty, the kid seemed to make up his mind, 
rushing into the store and directly towards where Deku guessed the checkout counter was. Frowning, he quickly climbed down to street level, making his way towards the storefront. As he got closer, he could see that he was right about the kid having gone to the counter, and he had a gun in his hands, aimed directly towards the cashier, a bald man in his 30s or 40s. Scanning the rest of the store through the windows, it appeared to be empty other than the kid and the cashier, who held his hands up above the counter. Deku knew that a lot of stores, especially the ones open all night, had a silent alarm under the register that they could trigger to notify both the police and local heroes that there was a robbery in progress. He also knew that it took the police 10 minutes at least to respond to calls in the area, sometimes even longer if they knew there was an active hero on duty. If the cashier had the time to press the button, then Izuku was on a time limit. The bell above the door chimed cheerfully as Izuku entered, arms held slightly out at his side so that his empty hands were obvious. The kid spun to face him face contorted as he tried to hold back the sobs that were racking his thin shoulders. Stop. Just, just get out. The kid shouted, the words as shaky as his hands were. Izuku looked past the gun, ignoring the drop in his stomach as he realized the kid was one sudden twitch away from pulling the trigger to look the boy in his pale, terrified face instead. Hey, it's okay, just relax for a moment, alright. Deku made his tone soft, trying to mimic the way his mom spoke to him when he had a really bad day and couldn't help but to break down in front of her. No, I'll, just leave, I just want the money, you don't need to be here. Remembering his goal, the kid jerked the gun back towards the cashier, even though his body stayed turned to face the door. Just give me it. The cashier didn't look as terrified as Deku would have expected him to, looking back at the kid with something almost like pity, rather than fear. That was okay, because Deku was scared enough for the both of them, watching the way the gun shook even when the kid moved to hold it with both hands. No, hey, Deku interrupted, almost relieved when the kid turned the barrel back in his direction. Yeah, just keep the gun on me, that's okay. You don't want to shoot anybody, do you? The kid shook his head hard. Yeah, I can tell. How about you just put it away, instead, and we can walk outside and talk about why you need that money so badly. Deku glanced at the cashier over the kid's head, trying to think of some way to urge him out of the back door, but the man didn't seem to get the idea. His eyes were on the kid, expression soft and sad. You should listen to him. The police are already on their way, the cashier added, only hesitating for a moment when the kid suddenly turned his attention, and the gun, back to him, you haven't taken anything yet. When they get here I can tell them it was all a big misunderstanding, but you need to go home. Deku blinked at the man's promise, every bit as surprised as the kid seemed to be, with his mouth open and eyes wide. A rush of gratitude towards the man filled Deku, who wished he had some way to thank him for the kindness he was showing. The kid's arms dropped ever so slightly, and Deku knew that he wanted to listen to them. Maybe someone had put him up to this, or maybe the robbery was an act of desperation, but either way, it had been clear from the moment Deku saw the boy hesitate outside the store that he did not want to do what he was doing. He was just glad that the cashier seemed to have understood the same thing. Just give it to me and we'll go, okay. Both of us, we'll be out of here before the police arrive. For a long, tense moment, the kid looked back and forth between Deku and the cashier, distrust warring with uncertainty until he finally came to a decision. Deku was grateful for the way his reflexes had improved, compared to his clumsiness of nearly a year ago, because it meant that he didn't drop the surprisingly heavy weapon that was suddenly thrust into his open hand, though would be robber practically throwing it to him. Deku had never held a gun before, never even seen one outside of TV before, but he knew enough to turn the gun over so he could check the safety. It had never been switched off, apparently, before shoving the weapon into his hoodie pocket. Thank you, Deku said, genuine relief seeping into his tone as he felt his body relax. He hadn't realized how tense he had gotten. The boy broke down fully. Wrapping his arms around his chest and curling in on himself as he started to sob outright, not attempting to hold back his tears anymore. Hesitantly, Deku reached a hand out and lightly placed it on the boy's shoulder, trying not to frighten him. The kid tensed in surprise for a moment before suddenly throwing himself forward into Deku's chest, who instinctively wrapped his arms around him. While the boy sobbed into his shirt, Deku made eye contact with the cashier, trying to communicate his gratitude with his eyes. If the man's warm half-smile was anything to go by, he understood the silent message perfectly. Hey, Deku spoke quietly, tone soothing and soft as he rubbed careful circles between the kid's shoulders. It's okay to cry, you don't have to stop, but we also have to go now. It took a moment for the kid to respond. Eventually he pulled away from the hug and nodded. Sobs turned to hitching, gasping breaths as he tried to rein them in. As I'm sorry, the boy managed to tell the cashier, the words shaky and barely more than a whisper, but the man nodded anyway. It's okay, this time. Deku kept one hand on the kid's shoulder, the touch light enough to not feel threatening but present enough to guide the boy out of the store. Which way do you live? The kid gestured to the right. And so they walked in that direction, silent at first except for the crying. 
Deku, having always been a sympathetic crier, was only barely managing to keep the tears out of his own eyes. I'm Deku, he informed the kid after they'd put about two blocks between themselves and the convenience store. What should I call you? Asahi. The kid answered so quietly that Deku barely caught the name. Nice to meet you, Asahi. They walked for a little while longer before the kid stopped suddenly, about halfway down a street line with tall, somewhat run-down apartment complexes, making an uncertain half-gesture towards the building across the street from them. Deku nodded his understanding before moving to sit on the curb facing the building, legs stretched casually into the street. Asahi followed suit, sitting next to him with his knees pulled up to his chest. Deku looked around, noting the empty streets and the lack of sirens, and felt safe enough to pull his mask down so that it rested under his chin instead. Asahi looked up at him through teary eyes, and Deku smiled reassuringly at him. Before I let you go home, I need to know that something like this isn't going to happen again. I need to know why you did this in the first place. Deku was careful that nothing in his tone could be perceived as angry or scolding, trying to keep his voice casual. I, the kid frowned and his deep brown eyes started to well with tears again. Hey, it's alright. Look, what if I just ask you one question at a time, instead of you trying to tell me everything at once? Would that help? That's what his mom did, when he was having a hard time explaining what was upsetting him. Asahi looked uncertain, but nodded anyway. Okay, is there someone at home waiting on you? The boy sniffed. My mom, but she's asleep. She don't know I left. Is your mom nice? Deku didn't want to dismiss the possibility that something about Asahi's home life had driven him to try to rob the store. The nicest. For the first time, something like a smile crossed the kid's face, although it was quickly stamped out by guilt. She'll be sad that I did this. Well, I won't tell her, Deku reassured him, and that seemed to ease some of the kid's worry. He stretched his legs out slightly, knees no longer pressed to his sternum, and muttered a soft thanks. Why do you need the money you were trying to get? I wanted to help Mama, Asahi answered earnestly, and Deku felt his smile slip for just a moment before he pasted it back on, hiding his concern. Why does she need the help? Is she sick? No. Deku leaned back slightly at the force in the kid's voice, the sudden anger that hadn't existed even when the kid was trying to make him leave the store earlier. He was bowling the fabric of his sleeves in his fist and glaring down at the asphalt. She's not sick. She, she's not. She's not. Okay. Okay, I believe you. I just want to know why she would need the money. Can you tell me? Is she in some sort of trouble? Some of the anger melted from Asahi's expression, but he still seemed guarded, jaw-clenching and unclenching several times before he finally answered. Mama doesn't have a quirk. She's not sick though, she just doesn't have one, but she doesn't need one either. Deku felt his breath catch as he processed what Asahi was saying. His mother was quirkless. Before he had time to recover from his surprise and say something reassuring, the boy continued, Sometimes though, sometimes people are really mean to her because she doesn't have a quirk. She says it'll get better once we move, but we won't be able to move for a long time, like a year, Mama says. I'm sorry, Deku said once he was sure Asahi was done speaking, heartbreaking for the boy and his mother. She doesn't deserve the way people treat her. No, Asahi's lip trembled. She's so nice and people are so mean. I know. Deku sighed, and added, I'm quirkless, too. You, you are. Asaha's eyes widened and he turned to stare into Deku's face, almost like he was searching for confirmation in his expression. But, aren't you a hero? Deku couldn't help the way his grin split wide and he let out a soft chuckle, No, I'm not. But I am starting at UA soon. He didn't feel the need to specify that he was going to be in the support department rather than heroics. Not when Asaha's face lit up and his own smile was finally chasing the last of his tears away. That's so cool. Mama says that people like her aren't able to go to schools like UA. She's gonna be so happy when I tell her. Maybe she can go to UA now, too. Deku chuckled again. Although it was mostly to hide the sharp jolt in his chest when he remembered just how recently UA had lifted their no quirkless applicants policy. Part of him wished he could meet Asaha's mother, to ask her how she'd made it so far, how she'd managed to defy the statistics that told her she'd be dead before she ever finished high school. The statistics had tattooed themselves onto his brain the first time he'd read the numbers, and now they always sat at the back of his mind, reminding him constantly that the world didn't expect him to make it to 20 any more than he expected himself to. Of course, meeting Asahi's mother was a bad idea if he was going to keep his promise of not telling her about how her son tried to rob a store in order to help her raise the money to move. But just knowing that someone like him was out there defying the statistics made him feel light and sigh. Even if it didn't sound like her life had gotten any easier for all that she was an adult, she was still alive, she had a son that adored her, and she still had hope. Deku wondered if that's all it would take for him to outlast the average quirkless life expectancy too. Just the stubborn hope that one day he'd find a place where things were better. The faint sound of fabric rustling and soft shoes scuffing reached Deku's ears, and he tugged his mask up quickly, just in time for a familiar figure to land in the middle of the street in front of them, goggles down and capture scarf on display. Asahi jumped up in surprise, 
and Deku was on his feet a moment later, using his body to block the kid from a racer head's view. Deku, the hero offered by way of greeting, tilting his head slightly as he stared at him. His hair was raised. He was trying to erase Deku's quirk. Deku might have laughed, if he weren't so tense. He had been listening for police sirens, ready to send Asahi inside the moment he heard them in the distance. But he hadn't expected a racer head to show up instead. Heard something about an armed robbery taking place around here. You know anything about it? Scowling behind his mask, Deku readied himself to run, or to fight. He wasn't going to let a racer head arrest Asahi. The kid's life was already hard enough. Having to face second-hand discrimination from having a quirkless mother, he didn't deserve to also have a juvenile record following him for the rest of his life. Not when all he wanted to do was help his mother. Yeah, yeah, Deku nodded, feeling Asaha's hands twisting into the back of his sweatshirt. He reached one hand back to place it reassuringly on the kid's arm. The other hand didn't stray far from his belt, where he had plenty of tools he could use to earn himself a head start. I heard it was all a big misunderstanding. Eraserhead's mouth crooked into something of a smile, although the expression was wry and disbelieving. That's what the night manager said, too. Guess there was no reason for me to waste my time coming out tonight. Deku swallowed. Guess not. Relax, kid. The manager didn't file a charge, even if I wanted to. I can't arrest anyone for a robbery that didn't officially happen. Letting out a breath of release, Deku stepped to the side, half turning so he could face Asahi while still keeping an eye on Eraserhead, who seemed content to stand in the middle of the street and watch them. Here, fishing out the notepad and pen that he kept in a pouch at the back of his belt, Deku hurriedly scribbled down the number of his burner phone and tore out the page, handing it to Asahi. If you or your mother need help, if someone's being mean, again, or anything, you can use this to contact me. Asahi held the scrap of paper in a tight fist, nodding seriously. Thank you. I, I promise I won't do anything like that again. I know. Go on. Go inside before your mom wakes up and worries about you. Stepping down off the curb, Asahi only made it two steps before he turned around and threw himself back at Deku, who easily caught him before they could both fall. As quickly as he'd initiated the hug, the kid ended it, turning back and sprinting past a razor head, straight into the apartment building behind him. The hero didn't turn to watch the kid leave, his gaze apparently glued to Deku instead, who sighed. Is this where you arrest me? Deku started charting possible escape routes, wondering how far he'd have to run before a racer head gave up the chase. If he used a flare, he could temporarily blind the man, given that his quirk seemed to rely on eyesight. Deku would bet that forcing the man to stop and protect his vision would buy him more time than a smoke bomb or beacon would. Don't get him wrong, the beacons were bright too, but they were more useful for the ear-piercing sound they emitted. Igniting the flares, on the other hand, was like suddenly holding a pocket-sized sun in your hand. Nothing illegal about helping a lost child get home at night. Deku blinked, and then offered the man a small smile that he couldn't even see. Right, yeah. Despite the man's words, Deku still tensed when a racer had started to walk towards him, only relaxing again once the man brushed past him and took a seat on the curb, sitting in the same spot Asahi had. He gestured for Deku to sit back down as well, and so he did. Why'd the kid do it? A racer had asked as soon as he was seated. And Deku hesitated, trying to study the man's face but getting nothing from the blank, impassive expression the hero wore. Was this some sort of trap designed to get him to confess to witnessing Asahi's crime? If he answered the question, was Eraserhead going to use it to arrest the kid anyway? Probably not. Deku admitted to himself, even if the wriggling fingers of anxiety had already taken their hold on his organs and were twisting them into painful knots. To help his mom. Deku answered simply, the less details he gave, the easier it would be to continue to deny that any crime had actually taken place. Maybe it was wrong, not letting Asahi face real consequences for what he'd done, but Deku couldn't find it in himself to feel bad about it. No one had gotten hurt, and he believed that the kid was being honest when he swore he wouldn't do something like that again. Everyone got desperate. Sometimes, in knowing firsthand what life could be like without a quirk, well, Deku didn't have to think very hard about the lengths he'd go to to make life easier on his mom, especially if he saw her being treated by her co-workers and peers the same way he was treated by his classmates, because the answer was that he'd do anything for her. Is it something I need to get social services involved for? No, Deku's eyes widened and he turned to fully face Eraserhead, leaning in and trying to impress the urgency of the words onto the man. No, it's not like that. If a racer had called social services, there was a good chance that Asahi would be taken from his mom and she'd never be able to get him back. No matter how good of a mom the woman might be, there was a chance that the system would only look at her lack of a quirk and decide that someone like that couldn't be in charge of the care of a child. 
He'd read stories about it on chat boards meant for quirkless people. He lurked around a few online quirkless support groups, although he never posted. Seeing quirkless parents begging for advice on how to get their children back after their quirked ex-partner had sued for full custody and won, or a resentful grandparent had taken the child from the quirkless parent, etc. Society often insisted that quirkless people were barely able to care for themselves, let alone able to raise their children, regardless of the child's happiness or health. It was part of the reason Deku didn't want kids if he got older. The racer head seemed taken aback by Deku's intensity, his expression unchanging but his head tilting ever so slightly. If you're sure, I am, Deku nodded, swallowing back his fear and trying for a steadier tone, I am. They sat in silence for a while, Deku eventually turning back to stare at Asaha's building, making a mental note to add it in the convenience store to his patrol route. He didn't care that it was technically a racer head's area. He wanted to keep an eye on them, to repay the store owner for his kindness and to show Asahi and his mother that there were people in the world who cared about their well-being. Maybe Deku could scare off some of the mean people who liked to mistreat Asahi's mom if they ever showed up to the apartment, give the pair a little breathing room away from the world's bullies. He hoped Asahi would call him if something bad happened. And more than that, he hoped he'd be able to keep his promise. Deku knew there were some things he couldn't solve. He couldn't give Asaha's mother enough money to help her move, for example, and he couldn't make the world be kinder to her either. But he would do his best to help where he could. He hoped it would be enough. Here, Eraser had held something out to Deku, who jumped in surprise before hesitantly reaching out to take, hey. Deku snagged his burner phone from Eraserhead's hand, scowling at the man in surprise. When had he gotten it? Moreover, how had he gotten it? It was safely in Deku's pocket last he checked. Glancing down at the phone, Deku noted it was open to his contact book, which had previously only had one entry, the local police department. Now, however, there was another. A racer head. If you're not going to take my advice and quit, then you need at least one person you can call if, when, you get in over your head. The name on the screen blurred as tears welled up in Deku's eyes, and he quickly used his sleeve to scrub them away. Hoping the hero hadn't noticed. Thanks, he whispered, the word coming out embarrassingly breathy. Use the number when you need it, kid. I mean it. Underground heroes all like to pretend that we're solitary creatures, but we all have a support system. People who'll notice if we disappear and know where to start looking. Those who don't. Those who insist that they can do everything alone. They die early. Deku wanted to ask why Eraserhead cared. After all, vigilantes were technically criminals as well, and Eraserhead had wanted to arrest him last time they met. He wondered what had changed between then and now. What had made Eraserhead decide to take any sort of interest in him, but he didn't ask. Instead, he smiled softly down at his phone before putting it back into his pocket, then, thinking better of it, put it into the other pocket, away from Eraserhead's apparently sticky fingers. It was pointless, seeing as how the hero had already taken the phone and given it back, but it made Deku feel better, and it made him grateful that he'd had the foresight to get a second phone specifically for vigilante work while he left his normal cell at home. Okay, Izuku agreed, the word carrying the weight of a promise even though he wasn't sure he'd ever actually use the number. He wouldn't delete it, though, just in case. Seemingly satisfied, a racer head nodded once in acknowledgement and stood, joints popping as he stretched and unwrapped part of his scarf from around his neck. Take care, kid. Deku held one hand up in a half wave, then froze, suddenly aware of the unfamiliar weight holding his sweatshirt down. Wait, the man turned back. One eyebrow raised as Deku hopped to his feet and pulled the gun from his pocket, holding it carefully out towards the man. Uh, don't ask where I found it. I don't really know what to do with it. Deku really hoped that Asahi wouldn't get in trouble for losing what he could only assume was a gun his mother had gotten to keep in their apartment. Even though guns were highly regulated and borderline illegal for anyone other than law enforcement or a select few heroes to carry, Deku was aware that there were ways for scared, desperate people to get their hands on one. If this gun really did belong to Asaha's mom, it was easy enough for Deku to understand why she would want it. Most people with quirks took quirkless to mean the same as defenseless. And as much as Deku hated to admit it, they were often right about that. If having a gun had offered Asaha's mom the same comfort the collapsible staff offered Deku, he couldn't blame her for keeping it around. Still, given how easy it had been for Asahi to get his hands on the weapon, Deku also didn't feel fully comfortable bringing the gun back to them. Not to mention the fact that, even though he knew what building Asahi lived in, he had no clue which actual apartment to go to. All in all, it just made more sense for him to turn the gun over, regardless of whether or not he personally felt kind of bad about it. Eraser had closed his eyes for a long moment, exasperation written across his face, before he took the gun from Deku, checking the safety and then unloading the gun with confident motions. He tucked the magazine and the gun into one of the pouches on his own utility belt, and then looked back as though to ask if there was anything else Deku was forgetting. Er, thanks. Have a good night, Eraserhead. Sure, problem child. You too. 
Deku blinked at the moniker, but didn't have time to question it as a racer had launched his scarf towards a nearby street lamp, using it to pull and propel himself forward through the air. The lamp and scarf acted as a catapult for him to reach the roof of Asaha's apartment building. Deku's eyes widened as he watched the man go, disappearing into the night with a speed and grace that Deku himself had only barely managed to graze the surface of. As Deku began his own journey home, painstakingly scaling the side of the closest building rather than launching himself into the air, all he could think was damn, I really need that grappling hook. The first day of the new school term was always a good indication of how the rest of the year would go. And in Aizawa's opinion, teaching his newest batch of students was going to be an exhausting experience. They had potential, of course, which also meant that it would probably be worth the inevitable stress headaches that came with turning a group of excitable, starry-eyed teenagers into actual hero material. Not a single student of his previous year's class had the same potential, so it was refreshing to see that there was still some hope for the next generation of heroes. Of course, there were already glaringly obvious problems that Aizawa was going to have to iron out, but that wasn't unusual. Some of his students were already displaying attitudes that would need adjustment in order to fully reach their heroic potential. Bakugo, in particular, clearly had something of a raging superiority complex and a myriad of anger issues to sort through. They were fairly common issues for many children with powerful quirks and heroic aspirations, and although Bakugo's case seemed particularly severe, Aizawa believed that some of the other students could rise to the task of knocking their classmates' ego down a peg or two. He really had no interest in training someone to become the next Endeavor. It was ironic, now that he thought about it, seeing as he had Endeavor's youngest son in his class as well. Given Aizawa's open and unapologetic disdain for the number two hero, he had no doubt that Nezu had intentionally placed Todoroki in his homeroom just to spite him. At least the boy didn't seem to share many of his father's personality traits at a first glance. Where Endeavor was boastful and imposing, Todoroki appeared reserved and apathetic. Aizawa worked his jaw as he thought about some of the other things he'd observed during his impromptu quirk assessment test and how he wanted to deal with them going forward, weaving between students as he made his way through the crowded hallway towards the staff room. Students flowed around him in streams, most of them chatting excitedly to old friends and new classmates about their new schedules, taking little notice of the teacher in their midst. Aizawa himself barely paid any mind to the kids around him, in turn, until a somewhat familiar flash of green caught his eye. Aizawa turned his head towards the hallway that led to the support department classrooms to see the boy that had approached him almost a year ago on patrol, Midoriya. Aizawa was certain. Years of teaching had sharpened his memory for names to a point. And Midoriya's name was especially easy to remember given how fitting it was and how memorable their introduction had been. Not to mention the other reason Midoriya stuck out in his mind. A sneaking suspicion that Aizawa had been hoping to have a chance to confirm. Midoriya was standing with a girl with pink hair and a manic look in her eyes. And it didn't take long for Aizawa to note that both students had two buttons on the arms of their jackets, support course students. Aizawa frowned slightly, remembering the boy's certainty that he wanted to be a hero, the shine in his eyes, the flash of something steely and defiant in his eyes as he had told Aizawa that he was going to be an underground hero in particular. Midoriya, Aizawa called, having to raise his voice slightly to be heard over the dull roar of dozens of simultaneous conversations taking place around them. The kid looked up and around, confusion on his face until his gaze landed on Aizawa. The expression morphed as his mouth pressed into a thin, bloodless line and his eyes took on a distant, dread-filled gleam. It was a look Aizawa had seen on plenty of his students' faces, usually when he announced a pop quiz that they knew they would fail, or when he smiled. The pink-haired student hovered for a moment before Midoriya waved her off and made his way across the hall, looking as though he was walking to his doom. Aizawa was pretty certain he knew why. Er, hello, Eraserhead Sensei. Midoriya greeted him politely, if somewhat uncertainly, keeping a white-knuckled grip of the straps of his yellow backpack. The kid looked different. He still had a slight baby face that made him look younger than he was at first glance. Still had the same massive green curls that Aizawa remembered, but some of the roundness had left the kid's face and there were dark bags under his eyes where there had only been the hint of a shadow before. It's been a while, you look well. Eraserhead wasn't much for pleasantries, but he knew that the best way to get information from a nervous student was to put them at ease first. I'm not surprised to see you here, although I expected that I'd be seeing you in the hero course today. Ah, well, that, that wasn't really ever going to work out for me. I'm in the support department, though, which is still really cool. Midoriya's hand flew to the back of his neck, a familiar motion. His eyes, deep green, familiar and filled with worry, glanced around constantly, as though he were looking for exits and escape routes, or hoping for someone to come along and rescue him from the conversation. There's always the sports festival, Aizawa offered as a consolation, watching Midoriya's reaction closely. He was surprised to see not hope in the boy's expression, but something like shame as the kid licked his lips and seemed to debate something with himself for a long moment. 
I uh, I'm quirkless, actually, so that's, it's just not realistic, you know, for me to try and be a hero, Midoriya confessed, words quiet and rushed as he spoke to the floor, not Aizawa. Aizawa blinked, before quickly hiding his shock being a layer of practiced apathy. Quirkless. It was rare, but not so rare that Aizawa had never met another quirkless person before, and puzzle pieces started to fall into place as he studied the dejected child in front of him. Why not? The kid looked up at him, puzzlement clear on his face. Why? Not. Why is it not realistic for you to be a hero? You've already told me you want to be an underground hero. That sounds more realistic than some of my students' goals already. I, oh, part of Aizawa wanted to double down. Wanted to make the kid understand that his potential didn't rely solely on whether or not he had a quirk, but it wasn't the place or time for it. The crowd in the hallway had thinned to be almost non-existent as they spoke, which meant class was close to starting, and Aizawa didn't want to make the kid late on his first day. Besides, a large part of Aizawa's argument relied on information that was unconfirmed, and while he would bet his entire savings and his favorite sleeping bag on him being right, accusing the kid of being a vigilante and telling him that that fact alone made him more than qualified for the hero course seemed like it would do more harm than good. The last thing he needed was to scare off the obviously already skittish kid. You should get to class, Aizawa told him, and watched as relief flooded the kid's body and he slumped slightly. Right, it was, uh, it was good talking to you. The kid wasn't convincing at all, but Aizawa didn't take it personally. He could feel the kid's eyes on him as he brushed past him, resuming his path towards the teacher's lounge, and, with a grin hidden in his scarf, noted that he could hear the rustle of Midoriya checking his pockets to ensure his belongings were all still there. Oh, and kid. Aizawa turned to look back at Midoriya, who froze and stared back with wide eyes, own it. You're the first quirkless student to ever make it into UA, even if it isn't the hero course. That's impressive. If others choose to focus on your quirklessness rather than your accomplishments, that's their own prejudice blinding them. Aizawa didn't linger after that, and he heard the sound of sneakers squeaking against the floor as Midoriya rushed to class before the bell could ring. There was a betting pool, between some of the underground heroes and a few police detectives, as to what the new vigilante's quirk was, most went for passive quirks, like agility enhancement or improved senses, while others placed money on things such as night vision or intelligence modifying quirks. Aizawa wondered if it would be too much of a betrayal of his colleagues' trust to enter his own bet, one he was now certain to win. God, the kid's been doing all this quirkless. Aizawa shook his head and let out something between a sigh and an impressed huff. Aizawa thought back to when he first began hearing rumors of Deku's appearance. Over six months ago, Midoriya had been a vigilante for almost seven months. By Aizawa's best guess, the entire time doing quirkless what others relied on their quirks to do. The kid still looked healthy, too, despite his obvious exhaustion, which, given what Aizawa knew about the kid's nightlife, made sense. There wasn't enough time in the day for a 15-year-old kid to go to school by day and capture criminals by night while still getting enough sleep to function. Aizawa himself still struggled with the balance, and no one had questioned his habit of taking cat naps throughout the day in years. It was impressive, frankly, knowing what the kid was capable of, having seen his fighting skills firsthand, as well as his compassion. It was also terrifying because he was a child, untrained and unsupported, and even heroes with years of experience and established support systems often struggled with the lives they had chosen for themselves. The kid needed the training the hero course offered, and he needed an actual license to do what he was doing, or else one day Aizawa knew he'd see the kid's face on the news. Headline, Local Vigilante Found Dead, Killed in Fight with Villain Aizawa hesitated, staring at the door to the teacher's lounge with one hand on the knob, and then spun quickly towards the nearby stairwell instead, taking the steps two at a time. He made a beeline for Nezu's office, a plan forming in his head. He only had 19 students this year, and while he was no stranger to having empty desks in his classroom, this one was just waiting to be filled. Izuku was still somewhat shaken up by his unexpected meeting with Eraserhead as he slid into his English class, barely making it to his assigned seat before the bell signifying the start of class rang. Present Mike, present Mike, didn't seem disturbed by his near tardiness, however, and Izuku breathed a careful sigh of relief when class began without him being berated or otherwise embarrassed in front of the rest of his class. Hello, listeners. The voice hero called as he moved to stand at the podium with only slightly more enthusiasm than was necessary, grinning at the class. Are you guys ready to learn? There were only a handful of students in Izuku's class, 1H was the smallest of the support course classes apparently, and during homeroom power loader explained that he had hand-picked each student based on their exam scores. The top five students, that would be Mei, Izuku, the dark-haired boy who introduced himself as Ito, and three other students who Izuku only vaguely remembered from the exam. They had introduced themselves to the rest of the class that morning, but Izuku had been so distracted in recovering from his own introduction that he hadn't actually been listening. 
There was a hesitant chorus of yeses in response to present Mike's question. No one entirely sure if it was meant to be rhetorical or not, but the man seemed pleased with the response nonetheless. Great. Now normally I'd call roll. But given that this is such a small class, what do you say we do a small icebreaker instead? Izuku couldn't help but smile to himself at the way present Mike spoke. He sounded exactly the same as he did on his radio show and podcast, both of which Izuku listened to and enjoyed frequently. He had assumed that the hero's persona would be somewhat lessened by the classroom setting, but it seemed that wasn't the case. The rest of the class seemed caught up in their teacher's enthusiasm as well. Small smiles starting to surface as the man reached down and pulled a yellow balloon from somewhere behind the podium. So, it's a pretty simple game. I toss the balloon, and whoever catches it says their name, their quirk, and a fun fact about themselves. I'll go first. Present Mike was still grinning as he explained the icebreaker, but Izuku felt his own smile drop instantly. Of course, he knew it would be only a matter of time before someone asked about his quirk, but getting through homeroom without the topic ever being broached had given him a false sense of security. Izuku tried not to frown as he wiped his sweaty palms against his pants legs and ignored the nausea welling in his stomach. My name's Yamada Hazashi, although you all probably know me as Present Mike. My quirk is voice, which means I can amplify my voice to high volumes. Oh, and a fun fact about myself. My favorite food is fried chicken. Telegraphing the move, Present Mike tossed the balloon over the podium towards Ito, who was sitting closest to the front. Um, hi. Ito leaned forward slightly to catch the balloon in both hands before sitting back in his seat and looking around. I, uh, I'm Ito. My quirk is magnet. I can attract metal objects to my hands, as long as it isn't anything too big or heavy. It's mainly useful for finding screws I drop while building something, to be honest, or reaching tools that are just out of reach. And a fun fact about yourself, present Mike prompted when Ito hesitated. Oh right, I'm pretty good at sleight of hand card tricks. Well, that's pretty cool listener. Mike sensei cheered. You'll have to give us a demonstration one day. Ito started to turn pink around the ears and neck, quickly tossing the yellow balloon to Mei, sitting directly to his left. I'm Hatsume Mei, my quirk is Zoom, and I love pre-quirk movies about superheroes, especially the ones who use awesome babies to take down the bad guys. Present Mike nodded enthusiastically as Mei turned in her seat to toss the balloon to the guy sitting behind her, and Izuku really tried to listen. But between the blood rushing in his ears and the way he couldn't focus on anything other than the yellow balloon moving from student to student, he didn't catch much of his other classmates' introductions at all. The urge to run heightened every time the balloon was passed and eventually the realization that he was going to be last dawned on him. Maybe he could say he wasn't feeling well and get sent to the nurse's office. Izuku was sure that he'd gone pale and clammy enough for the lie to be believable. It was pure reflex that allowed Izuku to catch the balloon when it was gently floated his way. And he swallowed loud enough that he was certain the whole class could hear it. Everything okay, listener? Present Mike asked after a moment. And Izuku shook his head, realizing that everyone had been staring at him while he in turn stared in horror at the yellow balloon clutched between his hands. Oh, yeah, everything's, everything's fine. Izuku cleared his throat and pasted a wan smile on his face, glancing around at the encouraging faces of his classmate. May in particular shot him a double thumbs up, and Ito nodded sympathetically when he caught his eye. Um, my name is Midoriya Izuku, and I'm, own it. The racerhead's voice cut through Izuku's panic and he paused, blinking down at the balloon. Easier said than done, but it couldn't hurt to try, right? If this was the moment that all the hope he'd had for the year was crushed under the heel of his classmates' rejection, then the very least Izuku could do was keep his chin up and pretend like it didn't bother him, clearing his throat again. Izuku started over, forcing himself to sound more confident than he felt. I'm Midoriya, I'm quirkless, and my fun fact is that my favorite hero is Eraserhead. There was a long pause as his classmates absorbed his words, and Izuku faked indifference as he tossed the balloon back to present Mike, who caught it with a wide smile that still seemed genuine, at least. Who's eraser head? One of his classmates asked, and Izuku turned to stare at him, surprised that that was the response he'd gotten. He's, he's an underground hero, and a teacher here, Izuku explained, shifting uncertainly in his seat. Oh, that's crazy. It's too bad we don't have a class with him then. The boy shrugged as he spoke, maybe you'll still get to see him around campus though. Wait, May called, face lighting up with recognition, is Eraserhead that homeless guy who wanted to talk to you before class? Er, I don't think he's homeless, Izuku told her, the words barely carrying over present Mike's sudden cackling. But yeah, wow, that's great, you actually know your favorite hero. I really like Ms. Joke, I don't know if she's my favorite hero, exactly, but it'd be cool if I could meet her one day. May informed him, her usual enthusiasm still intact. Izuku stared at her, 
Thoughts too scrambled to come up with a coherent response. He knew he was being rude, but nothing was making sense and he was left feeling completely off kilter. He'd just told his classmates that he was quirkless, and they had decided to latch onto his favorite hero instead. Were they just too afraid to tease him in front of a teacher? That didn't make sense. Teachers didn't care about things like that. Were they just waiting until class was over to catch him in the hallways and hiss insults at him? Or maybe they wanted to hit him but didn't want to risk getting up from their desks to do so. Or, a small, hopeful voice whispered at the back of his mind, maybe they just don't care that you don't have a quirk. That had never occurred to Izuku as a possibility when he imagined how telling his class about his quirklessness would go. There had only been two people in Izuku's life that didn't seem bothered by his lack of a quirk. His mom and, apparently, Eraserhead. Maybe Yue really was different than everywhere else, though. It was the first hero school to lift its anti-quirkless policies, after all. Given that Yue was one of if not the most influential school in Japan, and possibly the world, that was no small act. What Yue did, other schools would eventually imitate, and from there the rest of society would follow. Maybe in the next few years, more quirkless students would attend the various hero schools, and then more hero agencies would hire quirkless graduates for their support or business department. And maybe then even the commission itself would open more than just janitorial jobs to quirkless people. Maybe one day there'd even be a quirkless hero, that same small voice offered. But Izuku shook his head to clear the thought from his mind. He doubted that would ever happen. It was like All Might had told him all those months ago. It just wasn't realistic to hope that a quirkless person could be a hero. Izuku, and the people like him, would just have to hope that society changed enough in the wake of UAS actions to learn to accept them as worthwhile members of society. Maybe, if Izuku dedicated himself to his support classes, he could become a great enough inventor that he himself could get a job at a hero agency and help make a place for other quirkless people alongside him. Or maybe not. It was a lot to hope for, Izuku knew, but the idea that he might one day make a difference for other people who faced the same struggles he did was something that had always inspired him to do his best in spite of everything. Wanting to make life easier for the people who felt forgotten and neglected by society had been a large part of why Izuku had wanted to become a hero. And even though that dream had died, it didn't mean that Izuku no longer wanted to help people. Well, now that we're done with the icebreaker, we can really get this party started. Present Mike's cheer interrupted Izuku's thoughts, and he and the rest of his classmates directed their attention back to the front of the classroom. Let's start with a small quiz. Don't worry, it's not for a grade. It's just to see where you all are when it comes to English. Now, take one and pass it back. Izuku fished a pen out of his backpack and accepted the paper his classmate handed to him with a small smile. Noting the way his classmate didn't try to yank the quiz back or tear the page or otherwise sabotage Izuku. In fact, Izuku couldn't sense any hostility in the room at all. No one was sending him sideways glares or whispering conspiratorially with each other. And not once during the rest of class did anyone throw in pencil eraser at his head or pass him a note with insults written on it. When the bell signifying the end of class rang, May skipped over to his desk with a grin and waited for him to finish putting his notebooks away. I can't wait to get back to the development studio. She informed him as he slung his bag over his shoulder and followed her out of the classroom. I just had an incredible idea for a new baby. The pair walked side by side to their next class, May explaining her mental blueprint in great technical detail. Izuku only interrupted every so often to ask for clarification on a term he'd never heard used before, amused when half of them were phrases May herself had made up. May grinned and gestured excitedly as she spoke, her enthusiasm contagious as Izuku found himself offering suggestions to improve the design as well. May nodded at his input and grabbed his upper arm in excitement, insisting that he had to help her build it. It would be their first joint invention of many, she said, and Izuku nearly cried on the spot. Maybe it was some sort of trick. And Izuku would find himself regretting his own gullibility, but he couldn't help but feel like Yue was just different. Like maybe, for the first time since he was five years old, he could have friends and classes he loved and hoped for a future that was more than just one day throwing himself off of a very tall roof, alone and unwanted, because that was always going to be the outcome of his life, according to the statistics. But Izuku was more than just a number, and so he grinned back at Mei and mentally counted her as a friend, unreserved and earnest as he let himself get swept up in her enthusiasm and her genius. The door to Nezu's office swung open of its own accord as Aizawa approached, a party trick that had long since lost its intimidation factor, and he made himself right at home in one of the chairs across from the principal's desks. The chairs were nowhere near as comfortable as they looked, which Aizawa was certain was intentional. The principal of UA loved to play his little games with those who walked unsuspecting into his office, although after so many years of working under him, Aizawa was quite used to most of Nezu's tricks. Aizawa, I did not expect to see you quite so soon, Nezu offered in place of greeting, gaze never leaving his computer monitor as he typed away at an incredible speed, don't tell me you're expelling your entire class again this year. Midoriya Izuku, 
Aizawa stated instead of answering, and that seemed to gain the principal's full attention. His expression was as impassive and falsely pleasant as ever as he turned away from the computer. But Aizawa had learned to recognize the glint of curiosity in his beady eyes. Ah, yes, Midoriya, UAS first quirkless student, Nezu replied thoughtfully, very impressive. He's in Power Loader's homeroom if I recall correctly. But that's not what you're here to discuss. Have you heard of the vigilante Deku? He's been active for just under a year now. Surely you aren't implying that Midoriya Izuku is Deku. No, I'm not implying that. I'm telling you that he is. Nezu grinned wide and feral, an expression that might have sent anyone else running for the hills. How interesting. I want him moved into my class. And what of Midoriya? He passed the exams for general studies, the business course, and the support department with flying colors, but he didn't even attempt the heroics exam. Surely you aren't suggesting we switch the boy into your class against his will. Aizawa tucked his chin into his scarf and frowned, mulling over the principal's admittedly valid concern. Beyond that, Nezu offered before Aizawa had time to fully form a response. How would you explain the sudden, seemingly impractical move to those who might want to ask questions? That was an unfortunately good point. How would Aizawa explain why he'd stuck his nose into a seemingly random student's curriculum and had him switched into his own homeroom without either exposing the boy's illegal activities or starting any number of rumors? We could wait until after the sports festival, Aizawa conceded, thinking back to his own words to Midori and say that we were impressed with his performance. The kid's vigilante work is impressive. I'm certain he'll do well enough for that to be believable. Hmm? Nezu had no eyebrows to raise. But Aizawa could feel the weight of his expectant stare anyway. Of course the principal would notice that Aizawa had neglected to respond to the first concern. Vigilantism is illegal, Nezu. If the options are to join the heroics class or risk being arrested, the kid has little choice but to agree to the transfer. It just doesn't seem like you. Aizawa, Nezu stated with faux innocence, making a show of turning back to his monitor. I thought you were all for your students making their own choices and facing the consequences of their own actions. Midoriya isn't my student yet. Aizawa shot back, unsure of what game Nezu was playing. The principal was one of the most intelligent people in Japan, likely the world, and so Aizawa knew that Nezu understood where he was coming from. What the rat could have to gain from making Aizawa spell out his justifications was beyond him. Hell, for all he knew, Nezu could have just been bored. Aizawa took a deep breath. Midoriya is impressive, yes, but he's completely untrained and making things up as he goes along. Eventually, he's going to get in over his head and get himself killed. If I could convince him to give up being a vigilante, I'd be more than happy to leave him undisturbed in the support course. But you haven't met the kid yet. Midoriya is not going to just stop. Not now that he's proven to himself that he can be a successful vigilante. I knew that he had potential the first time I met him, and Deku has only proven himself time and time again. At least if he's in the hero course, he'll get actual training and his provisional license. And then I can rest easy knowing I won't have to call in every favorite Tsukachi owes me just to keep the kid out of jail, Aizawa doesn't say. Maybe it was illogical to be so invested in someone he'd met a total of three times, four, now. But whenever he tried to convince himself that the kid's life was none of his business, all he could see was Deku standing between him and that kid who tried to rob a store. The way Midoriya had been tense, shielding the younger boy with his own body as though he expected Aizawa to treat him the same way he might treat a villain. It was clear that something had happened to shake Midoriya's trust in heroes. And although Aizawa was certain there was no bitterness there, that lack of faith was likely what drove the kid to vigilantism. Midoriya had been betrayed by the system, and Deku now stood as a protector for everyone else that the heroes failed, too. There was something about that sort of single-minded goodness that made it difficult for Aizawa to turn his back on the vigilante. I agree that it would be best to wait until after the sports festival to transfer Midoriya into the hero course, Nezu conceded, and Aizawa let out a shallow sigh of relief to have the principal on his side. I'll ensure that he's in your class for the start of next term, although I would prefer it if you could convince the boy to transfer of his own free will. I'll try, Aizawa promised, standing up to see himself out of Nezu's office. He'd gotten what he needed from Nezu and their relationship wasn't such that he had any desire to linger afterwards. Stepping back out into the hall, Aizawa rubbed a hand over his eternally dry eyes and frowned, thinking about the whole situation. Knowing that Midoriya would be moved into the heroics course eventually was a relief, but the sports festival was weeks away. If the kid got himself arrested, or killed, or permanently injured, then it would do him no good. Aizawa got the feeling that his nightly patrols were about to get even more exhausting. If he couldn't give Midori a proper hero training yet, then he'd have to offer it to Deku instead. The kid didn't fully trust him, that much was clear, but he did seem to value his advice all the same. Aizawa could only hope that he would manage to earn the vigilante's trust in time for the next semester. A thick cloud cover hid the stars and moon from sight, making the night dark enough that even Deku, with his naturally excellent eyesight, was struggling to see into the deep shadows that swarmed the street below him. 
He was relying on his hearing, for the most part, listening out for any sound that seemed out of place in the still, near-silent night, and reflecting on the fact that he should probably get his hands on some night vision goggles. Unlike the rest of his gear, the goggles should be easy enough to get his hands on. There was the sound of gravel scattering behind him, barely audible over the to the point where he almost believed he had imagined it or been the cause of the sound himself. Still, Deku spun around, only months of practice helping him keep his balance on the raised edge of the roof he stood on. He felt someone's eyes on him, but the rooftop was as empty as the street below. Part of Deku wanted to convince himself that it was just paranoia that sent chills down his arms and a shiver up his spine as he stared into the night. But he knew better than to dismiss the feeling like that. It wasn't paranoia if someone was out to get him, after all, and as a vigilante, there was no shortage of people who wanted to see him dead or arrested. Deku continued on his run, backing up slightly so he could get the momentum to reach the next roof over, but at a faster pace, and moving in an erratic fashion, hoping he could shake the feeling of eyes on his back if he made it more difficult to predict where he was going. It didn't help, and with every passing block Deku became more and more certain that he was being followed. He considered taking to the streets. There were more hiding places on ground level, alleys and alcoves and plenty of things to obstruct someone's view of him, but he was more comfortable up high, more familiar with the city from a bird's eye view. Although, it seemed like whoever was following him was also fairly familiar with rooftop travel, given that they had managed to keep pace with Deku thus far while still staying out of sight. Damn, Deku knew he could keep running for a long time. But even with all his training, his stamina wasn't endless. If the person tailing him was just waiting for him to exhaust himself before they struck, then Deku knew he needed to force the confrontation sooner than they were ready for in order to give himself the upper hand. Deku slowed to a stop in the middle of a large roof with minimal protrusions for his shadow to hide behind. Hoping to force them into the open, shoulders tense and legs bent slightly. Deku felt his stomach flip as he heard the rustle of fabric from a roof to his right, and he spun to face the sound. One hand rested on his belt, over the flares and smoke bombs, while the other already held his collapsed staff in a closed fist. You can come out, now, Deku called, voice steady in a way that contradicted the blood rushing through his head and the slight tremble in his muscles as he prepared for a fight. I'm not really in the mood to play hide and seek. Bold, for someone looking in the wrong direction, Deku spun, quickly extending his staff on instinct as he drove it towards the voice behind him. A racer had leapt backward, perching on the edge of the roof and raising an eyebrow at him. Despite the rest of the man's face staying perfectly passive, Deku read the expression as amusement, and felt his face heat up behind his mask as he lowered the staff back to his side. Do you, can I help with something? He offered, shifting uncomfortably under the pro's stare as he tried to puzzle out why a racer head would have spent the past 30 minutes, and possibly longer, tailing him. No, Deku blinked and waited, hoping the man would elaborate further. He didn't. So, um, why, why were you following me, then? We need to talk. The words felt menacing to Deku. But a racer had shifted to sit casually on the edge of the roof, leaned back on his arms slightly, making himself look distinctly non-threatening. Okay, Deku agreed after a moment's hesitation, collapsing his staff before sitting cross-legged in the same spot in the center of the roof, a good few meters away from the pro hero. The last time he'd seen a racer head was two days ago, the first day of school, and while part of him had been hoping to run into the man again, an equally large point of him had been dreading it, too. Deku didn't interrupt the silence as it began to drag on instead scratching at the skin around his nails, left exposed by the fingerless gloves he'd adapted as part of his closet costume. He hoped that he'd get access to professional costume material soon, after the mandatory safety lessons that Power Loader said would claim most of the first week of class, of course, so that he could upgrade from his cotton sweatsuit to something that might actually protect him in a fight. Sure, his evasiveness had gotten better over time, but that didn't mean he never got injured anymore. Some people were just faster than him, or had a quirk that was near impossible to dodge, or otherwise just got lucky and managed to land a hit on him. He had some ideas already for what he wanted his costume to look like. As a child, the theoretical outfit designs he'd sketched into his hero notebooks had been pretty obviously inspired by All Might. Between the smile-like shape etched onto the mask and the bunny ears he imagined standing tall like the man's hair, but those designs were both clumsy and embarrassing to look back on. The new designs, the ones he kept hidden in a locked desk drawer in his room, were more suited to Deku's vigilante work, a protective bodysuit made of protective cut and burn-resistant material, loose enough to allow the full range of motion that his current outfit did while not having as much excess fabric to get in the way. Gloves, fingerless still, but with actual protective padding for his palms and grips to assist his climbing, and possibly hardened material around the knuckles, for the occasions when using his staff to fight wasn't an option. He'd need to experiment with that, of course, to make sure that the knuckle reinforcement didn't impede his grip strength in any way. Beyond that, 
Deku just needed a pair of boots that were light enough to keep his stubs quiet but reinforced enough to provide actual protection, unlike the sneakers he wore now. They were red when he bought them, because only one brand catered to quirkless people with their extra toe joint, and the only style of sneaker they had were the same bright red design. He had spray-painted them black, although the paint was starting to rub away in places, revealing the red canvas underneath. It'd also be cool if he added some sort of retractable spikes to the soles of his boots, but that was a consideration for another time. The racer head shifted in place, drawing Deku's attention back to him, and pushed his yellow goggles up onto his head, pinning his hair back. The man's dark eyes were fixed on Deku's face knowingly, and he couldn't help but sigh. He'd known, really, that a racer head knew. But when the man didn't say anything to that extent in the hallway at UA, he'd let himself hope that he was wrong. That maybe Aizawa didn't know that he was Deku, or simply didn't care. Deku sighed and reached up to pull his mask down, resigned as he met a racer head's gaze head on. He braced himself for the inevitable scolding, or possibly expulsion. Deku had clearly earned some form of acceptance from a racer head the last time they'd met, if the unused number saved to his phone meant anything. But that had been before the man realized that he was actually a 15-year-old quirkless kid. You're talented. For someone who I'm guessing is entirely self-trained, Aizawa started, and Deku blinked at him. But you still have a long way to go, if you want any chance of actually surviving to adulthood. Deku blinked again. And then once more, trying to decide if he should feel flattered or insulted and settling eventually on feeling both at once. I'm offering you training. A racer head finally told him outright, seeming to sigh as he pinched the bridge of his nose between two fingers. Once a week, to start with, after school on Wednesdays. Deku didn't mean to stop breathing. But as the words sank in and took root in his brain, he found himself frozen. Just staring at the man who just offered to take time out of his week to train him. The racer head, professional underground hero and heroics teacher at the Top Hero Academy in Japan, just offered to take time out of his undoubtedly very busy and important schedule to train Izuku. Quirkless Izuku who had taken inspiration from the man all those months ago, who sought to emulate the way he moved and fought. Seriously, is, there's a catch. Deku took a deep breath, starting to feel dizzy, and felt a sense of calm return to him as he realized that there had to be something a racer head wanted in return. Adults didn't just offer him help for no reason. They didn't offer him help, period. As much as Deku admired a racer head, and as much as the offer of personal training with the man had him seeing stars, he was still an adult and a teacher at that. There was always going to be a catch. There are two catches. Actually, a racer head confessed, and Deku tried not to show the way his heart sunk on his face. First, he'd also be training with another personal student of mine, Shinzo Hitoshi, from General Studies. Deku tilted his head. That wouldn't be so bad. Training with another person. And then he wouldn't feel guilty for taking up any of Aizawa's time, at least. And the other thing. I want you to consider transferring to the heroics course for next semester. When the silence began to stretch for too long, Eraserhead pulled his goggles back down and stood up, balancing on the edge of the roof with a frown. You don't have to give me an answer right now. If you agree, meet me at Test Site Gamma directly after school on Wednesday. Eraserhead was gone in a flash of capture scarf, launching himself across the city at speeds Deku couldn't yet match. Izuku watched him go, pulling his mask back up to hide his frown, even though there was no one else around to see it. The appeal of actual, professional training was difficult to ignore. Deku wasn't stupid, he knew that. In spite of all the progress he'd made by himself, he still had infinite room for improvement. It was only a matter of time before he came across a villain or hero that he just couldn't best. He'd been lucky, so far. And while his confidence as a vigilante had grown, he was not so blinded by his pride that he couldn't see how much he would benefit from real training. And it's not like Aizawa had told him that the price of training was transferring to the hero course. He'd only asked Izuku to consider it. Never mind the fact that he had considered it, several times in fact. At the end of the day, Izuku already knew that his dream of being a hero was dead and buried. He'd never be accepted in the hero world. Even as an underground hero, his quirklessness would always single him out as different, wrong, undeserving. Even if he managed to do well enough at the sports festival to warrant a possible transfer, which was doubtful when the hero course students all had undoubtedly powerful quirks and actual training to back their power up with, he would have to spend the next three years constantly justifying his place in the hero course, not just to his classmates but to every other student who'd hoped to transfer. It was just too much for Deku to bear, especially when he considered the love he'd discovered for inventing support gear. The warm exhilaration he'd felt when his first proper invention worked like he intended had started to seep into the holes in his chest where his dreams of being a hero had once resided, and he'd spent his time between the exam and the first day at UA creating more designs to fill the hollow spaces inside of him. 
So no, Deku had already decided that he wasn't going to try and transfer into the hero course. One day, there might be a quirkless hero who would rise above the discrimination and hold their head high, showing the world that quirkless people weren't the wastes of resources and space that society at large seemed to believe they were. But it wasn't going to be him. Izuku was still teaching himself how to be okay with that, but he knew that one day he'd get there. Until then, he had class to look forward to the next morning. And wasn't that a surprise? After years spent dreading every day of school, it was nice to find that he was actually excited to wake up and attend his classes. Yue was just so different to how Aldera had been. And his new classmates were just so nice that Izuku couldn't help but be hopeful for what Wednesday's classes would bring. Pain exploded behind Aizawa's eyes as he forced his damaged body to move so that he could push himself up. Forced his eyes to open despite the blood gushing into them, despite the excruciating brightness that burned them. It was enough to save Asui from the hand that covered her face, threatening to disintegrate her the moment Aizawa blinked. He refused to blink. Eventually there were just flashes, a familiar and far too loud voice that usually meant a stress headache for Aizawa. Just this once, however, he allowed himself to relax as All Might arrived. His students were safe again. The number one, weakened though he might be, was still more than a match for the villains, and his arrival meant that the other teachers must be on the way as well. Unconsciousness claimed Aizawa, his last feeling being that of relief as the pain faded into the darkness as well. When Aizawa woke again, he couldn't bring himself to open his eyes. There was a migraine already splitting his skull into pieces, and he could see how bright the room was in the orange of his eyelids. Something to his right was beeping, constant and loud, and it had been a long time since he'd been in a hospital. But Aizawa recognized the sound of the heart monitor and the smell of disinfectant that certainly didn't help the pain in his head. Shoda, Aizawa flinched at the sound of Hizashi's voice, familiar and comforting but still too loud. Even though the man sounded like he was taking great care to keep his voice low and soothing. You're awake. Hizashi lowered his voice even further, to a breathy whisper that was out of character for him, and Aizawa found it to be an almost tolerable level. Aizawa grunted in response, trying to reach one arm towards his husband only to be met with excruciating pain radiating out from his elbow. Hey, hey, don't move. A warm, gentle hand found Aizawa's and he held it tight, ignoring the pain that shot through his arm at the motion. The doctor should be here any moment. He'll get you some more painkiller. This is the first time you've been fully awake since we brought you here. Aizawa's throat was dry and aching and trying to speak sent white-hot pain searing through his head. But he managed to choke out two words, the most important words he could think of at the moment. My class. Even to his own ears, his voice was weak and hoarse, and it was a wonder that his ashy managed to understand him. They're all fine. You kept them safe, show. They're all okay. Aizawa couldn't nod or say anything else, but he managed to offer his ashy's hand a quick squeeze of acknowledgement before the darkness crept in on his mind again. By the time the doctor arrived, Aizawa was unconscious again his hand still clutching his husband's as he slept. Yamada Hazashi hated hospitals the same way most heroes did. Hospitals meant failure, meant injury or death, meant that someone he loved was hurting, or dying, or already gone. He hadn't been to a proper hospital in years. As heroes, he and Shota had both been certified in first aid, and they had taken to treating each other's wounds when they could, or going to recovery girl when they couldn't. To see his husband, his eyes, the only visible part of him behind layers of blood-stained bandages, squeezed tight against the fluorescent lights, voice raspy and only barely audible, in a hospital bed, injured worse than he had ever been in all his years of hero work. Hizashi didn't know what to do with the roiling anxiety that made it impossible to eat or sleep or do anything but sit at Shota's bedside and fight back hot, fearful tears. Helplessness clawed at his chest as he continued to hold his husband's hand even as the man fell back unconscious. He held Shota's hand in silence, completely still because he was afraid that any movement on his part might jostle his partner's injuries, for hours. It wasn't until Nimari arrived that he let go, and only then because she forced him out of the room, handing him a wad of money and telling him to go get himself something to eat. She promised to sit with Shota until he returned, and to call him if anything happened in the meantime. And even then he only left when she threatened to call Hound Dog to come talk to him instead. At first, Hizashi planned to just dip down to the cafeteria on the first floor of the hospital and return as quickly as possible to his husband's side. But he knew that wasn't what Nimiri had intended when she coerced him out of the room. Truth be told, as much as Hizashi wanted to plant himself in that uncomfortable vinyl chair and refused to move for as long as it took for Shota to recover, he knew that wasn't healthy, physically or emotionally. And given how often he scolded Shota for not taking care of himself, it would be hypocritical for Hizashi to do the same, no matter how extenuating the circumstances were. With a heavy, bone-deep sigh, Hizashi stepped out of the elevator and angled himself towards the hospital exit instead of the cafeteria, mind made up. 
he could use some fresh air and a walk to work out some of the nervous energy wreaking havoc on his insides. And besides, there was a small bakery two blocks down that sold specialty cat-shaped chocolates that Shota enjoyed. Hazashi would pick up a croissant for himself, something with chocolate and strawberry for Nimiri, and a box of those chocolates for whenever Shota was awake and felt up to eating something solid. It felt good to walk. His muscles sore from spending the entire day camped out in the hospital chair. And the last few rays of the evening sun helped chase away some of the chill that had settled deep in his bones. There weren't many people out and about besides himself, and he was grateful for that. Most civilians weren't likely to easily recognize him, given that he wasn't dressed in his usual leather hero getup but rather jeans and a soft black t-shirt that was actually Shota's. His hair was also pulled back into a loose half-up style, as opposed to his usual attention-grabbing spike. Still, Hisashi appreciated that there was no one around he needed to perform for. The press had been swamping Yue since the attack, but Nezu had made sure that there was no chance anyone would leak which hospital the teacher injured in the attack had been brought to. Only Yue staff and the small team of doctors and nurses who had taken Sho in for emergency surgery right after the attack knew who he was or what room he was in. And Nezu had the hospital bogged down in so many NDAS that they wouldn't dare breath the name Eraserhead to the press. Hazashi didn't get along with the principal the same way his husband seemed to, but he could appreciate his boss's dedication to respecting Shota's privacy and allowing him to recover in peace, less than a block away from the bakery. His ashy felt the hair on his neck stand on end, the feeling of eyes on his back causing him to tense imperceptibly, resisting the urge to look around. His ashy glanced at the windows of the store he was passing, checking the reflection of the street around him to no avail. Whoever was following him was staying out of sight. It wasn't the press, then, which was not the relief it might have usually been. He thought about calling Nimiri, but he didn't want to let whoever was watching him know that he knew they were there. Besides, Hizashi was perfectly capable of taking care of himself, and he'd feel better knowing that Nimiri was there to keep an eye on Shota rather than leaving him alone and defenseless to help him. Hizashi almost shouted in surprise when a figure in black dropped onto the sidewalk barely two meters ahead of him. Almost. Instead, years of training took over and Hizashi felt himself slap a cocky, carefree smile on his face as he eyed the figure, shoving his hands in his pocket in a faux casual stance. The figure stood up straight, and Hizashi was surprised by their stature, short and lean and made smaller by the bagginess of their clothes, not exactly the most threatening of figures, despite their sudden appearance. Hello, listener, Hizashi called, taking note of the hood pulled low and the mask covering the lower half of their face. He had a creeping suspicion that he knew exactly who he was looking at. Shota had mentioned the vigilante haunting the underground scene several times before, including a few interesting stories of actually meeting the so-called Deku face to masked face. You must be that vigilante I've heard so much about. Deku, right? He blinked at Hizashi, surprise obvious in his deep green eyes. You've heard of me. The vigilante's voice broke halfway through the sentence, and Hizashi was suddenly reminded why Sho referred to him as just the kid. Deku cleared his throat and shook his head slightly. And even with most of his face hidden, Hizashi could see the blush rising in his cheeks. No, never mind, just, here. This is for Eraserhead. The kid held up a bright yellow envelope. Eraserhead scrawled messily across the front, and Hizashi hesitated. It was a thin envelope, and the chance that there was something dangerous inside was slim. Besides, Shota seemed to trust the vigilante, enough that he'd apparently given the kid his personal number to use in case of emergency. That in itself was reason enough for Hizashi to extend Deku and his brightly colored envelope the benefit of the doubt. It's not sealed, Deku added, noticing Hizashi's hesitation. So you can check that it's nothing dangerous. I don't expect you to just trust me. He trusts you. Hizashi took the envelope from the kid and didn't look inside it. That's good enough for me. I'll make sure he gets this. Deku nodded in gratitude and started to turn away before pausing, staring out into the empty street rather than looking back at him. He's gonna be okay, right? Hizashi swallowed the lump of anxiety in his throat before he answered, hoping to sound more assured than he felt. The honest concern in the vigilante's voice wasn't a surprise exactly, but it tugged at Hizashi's heart all the same. Yeah, little listener, it'll take a while, but he'll recover just fine. Some of the tension drained visibly from the vigilante's shoulders and he slouched slightly as he crossed the street, disappearing into an alley between a bread store and a pharmacy. If his ashy stood and watched, he reckoned that he'd see the vigilante scale the wall and take to the rooftops. Not unlike how his husband traversed the city, but instead he turned away, resuming his journey towards the bakery. Nimiri shot him a strange look when he returned to Sho's bedside nearly an hour later with a bag of pastries, a box of chocolates, and a brightly colored envelope on top. Shota's got a fan, Hizashi explained with a shrug, pulling the second chair in the room up to the side of the bed. Sho was still out cold, heart monitor beeping out a constant and comforting tempo. That Shinso kid he's always mentioning. You mean? Nimiri asked, smiling appreciatively as he handed her a strawberry tart. 
No, not him. Although that little listener is supposed to be coming by tomorrow after school, Hisashi tore a piece off of his quas, taking a moment to appreciate the fluffiness of it even as his stomach revolted at the idea of actually eating it. You remember that vigilante show's been talking about recently. Oh, right. Nimari's eyes lit with recognition, and she glanced over at the sleeping man with a fond expression. The kid, you mean. I swear, if you aren't careful, the two of you will end up with more children than cats. As Ashi couldn't help the huff of laughter that escaped him, Shota never could resist a stray, such a softy. Anyway, Deku caught me on the way to the bakery, asked me to give this. He held the envelope up with a slight flourish, to show. Nimiri plucked the envelope from his hand, checking its contents before Hazashi had the chance to protest. Inside the envelope was a white card with a grey cat drawn on the front, an ice pack on its head and a bandage on its front paw. The phrase get well soon was printed underneath in black. Aw, cute, Nimiri cooed, opening the card up and scanning the inside before turning it for Hazashi to see. Inside was another cat, this one looking happier and healthier than the one on the cover. The words feeling feline were printed under the cat. And below that was a short, messily scrawled message, clearly written by the vigilante himself. Don't worry, I'll keep an eye on your patrol routes until you're better. Just focus on recovering and get well soon. Eh. Hazashi wasn't sure if knowing that the vigilante was going to watch over his husband's usual patrol area was going to be a relief or a concern. I can see why Sho has taken to the kid already. Is he really that young? Couldn't see his face or anything. But I'd guess that Shota's right when he says teenager. Our little vigilante friend is probably the right age to be one of our students. As Ashi chuckles to himself and kindly doesn't mention the kid's voice cracked to Nimiri. Oh, could you imagine? I think we'd notice if we had a vigilante in our classes, though. You think? MHM. Nimiri confirmed, leaning back in her chair as she finished off the tart as Ashi brought her, someone like that would almost certainly stand out in class. That sort of youthful energy, but honed by months of working outside the law and seeing some of the worst things heroes ever have to deal with. I feel like we'd notice this Deku if he weren't UA. As Ashi considered her words and nodded sagely. Yeah, you're probably right. Always am. Nimiri chirped back, stuffing the get well card back into its envelope and setting it gently on the bedside table, where Hizashi had also put the box of cat-shaped chocolates. Hizashi smiled and relaxed into his chair, as much as the stiff-backed, metal arm chair would allow, at least, and settled in next to his friend as they kept each other company well into the night, waiting for any sign of stirring in the bed next to them. Some of pressure that had been building in Hazashi's chest was alleviated by Nimiri's presence, her occasional quips and the way she forced him to go take a walk every time he started looking too anxious again. And he couldn't help but appreciate the company as he waited for his husband to wake again. One of the biggest downsides to being a secret vigilante, Izuku decided, was that there just wasn't enough time in the day to do everything that he needed to get done and get more than four hours of sleep with any sort of consistency. The dark bags under his eyes had become a permanent accessory early on. But at least he'd eventually gotten used to never getting as much sleep as he really needed. Unfortunately, he still needed some amount of sleep to function, no matter how little, and he hadn't gotten any rest at all the night before. He'd been patrolling from sundown to just after sunup, and had to get ready for school the moment he returned home. Izuku already knew that Eraserhead's patrol routes were extensive, but it wasn't until he began following those routes himself that he realized exactly how heavy the pro hero's workload was. He frankly wasn't sure how the man found time to teach at UA on top of his heroics. But Izuku suspected there was no small amount of caffeine involved. At least, that's how Izuku himself had been coping with the increased patrol time and drastically decreased sleep schedule. The thermos he normally would have used for water had been instead filled with energy drinks for the past three days. And he was really starting to worry about the effect that much caffeine was having on him. It certainly wasn't doing his anxiety any favors, and he was pretty sure May was starting to notice the way his hands shook as he tried to fiddle with the intricate mechanisms of the spike inlaid boots he was working on. Everything okay, Midori? May asked him after he huffed a frustrated sigh when he couldn't force the spring-loaded mechanisms into the right places thanks to the tremors racking his hands. Looks like you're letting your baby get the better of you. Yeah, I'm fine, Izuku bit back. The words coming off snappish and unconvincing, and he closed his eyes and took two deep breaths. I'm sorry. I'm fine. I'm just frustrated because I wanted to have this done by the end of the day, and at this rate I won't be able to finish it until next class at least. I could help, you know, May offered, starting to reach for the boot laid across his workspace before she stopped and pulled back. She'd figured out pretty early in the week that it made Izuku uncomfortable when other people touched his things without permission, and even though she never asked about it, he had noticed that she made an effort to respect that. Izuku really appreciated her thoughtfulness, especially when it was clear that Mei didn't always extend the same courtesy to their classmate. She apparently liked to snoop around when she was bored or had hit a roadblock on a project, searching for inspiration in Ito's history notes or other people's toolboxes and the like. 
I won't even add in any of my own designs. No electrifying the spikes or adding booster jets. You can just tell me what needs doing and I'll do it. Izuku actually managed a genuine, albeit tired, smile, warmth blooming in his chest at her offer. No one had ever offered to help him with any sort of project. Not even group projects, which he always ended up doing alone anyway. And even if they had, Izuku would probably have believed it was some sort of trick so they could further sabotage his grade. Mei was not like that. Unless she was playing an unbelievably long game, Mei was just genuinely nice to him. She really seemed to enjoy talking to him, walking with him between classes and eating lunch with him, although, the latter might have just been because they both chose to eat in the development studio instead of the cafeteria. Izuku hadn't seen Kakin yet. But he'd heard him at lunch on the first day, the sound of small, popping explosions just loud enough to be heard over dozens of simultaneous conversations, quickly taking his tray and keeping his head down. Izuku had rushed from the cafeteria and practically sprinted to the only place in the school he was certain he'd be safe. They had already been in the development studio, having never left the room when it was time for lunch. She was already working on a project. Despite the fact that Powerloader hadn't yet given them the okay to start building at that point, Izuku ended up sharing his lunch with her. And every day since then he picked up two trays to bring back to the classroom. Izuku realized that Mei was still staring at him expectantly, hand twitching on the table as she resisted the urge to pull his boots towards herself, so he pulled himself back to the present to offer her an appreciative smile. That's alright, but thank you. I want to finish these on my own, even if they're being really annoying right now. May nodded immediately and leaned back to her own side of the workspace. Well, if you change your mind. Thanks, May. Of course. You know, those boots will probably come in crazy handy during the sports festival. Izuku blinked, glancing between May and the boots and back again. I hadn't really thought about the sports festival, to be honest. I forgot that we have to take part in it, too. It's not just a chance for hero students to show off. May insisted, eyes bright as she met his disinterest with enthusiasm. It's a great chance to show off our babies and get the attention of people who might want to buy them. Plus, if we beat out a bunch of hero kids using our babies, potential investors will be falling over themselves to sponsor us. Izuku tilted his head in acknowledgement, impressed by how far ahead Mei was thinking. As far as he was aware, support course students couldn't sell their inventions or accept sponsor deals until they got their support certifications in their second year. Still, being noticed in their first year would be a good way to stir up interest in their support gear and ensure that they had offers available in the future. You've got pretty good business sense, May. May grinned, puffing slightly at the compliment. I'm not just an inventor. I'm a businesswoman, too. May paused and thought for a moment before her eyes widened into the same expression she got every time she found inspiration for a new baby. Izuku mentally braced himself. We should team up. Between the two of us, the hero course students won't stand a chance. We'll make it to the final round for sure. May's excitement hit Izuku with none of its usual contagiousness, and instead he felt his mouth pulling into a frown. He'd forgotten about the sports festival entirely, and hadn't factored it into his plan for UA in the slightest. The plan being, mainly, to keep his head down and stay in his own lane. The fewer people outside of his class who knew that he existed, the better, and it was especially important that Kakin never realized that Izuku had also made it into UA. Even though Izuku had given up on being a hero and had joined the support course instead, Kakin would take it as a personal slight that he decided to attend UA at all. Doing well in the sports festival would come with unwanted attention, and if Izuku wanted to avoid Kakin and his rage for the next three years, it would be best to avoid that. I'll help you prepare for the festival if you want, but I'm probably just going to throw the first event and watch from the stands, you know. I don't really have any interest in competing. Ignoring the pang of guilt he felt as May's expression fell. Izuku turned back to his boots and clicked the cover panels into place, hiding the mechanisms inside the thick soles of the shoes. He wasn't getting any work done on them and there were only five minutes until the end of class, anyway. He busied himself putting away his tools and storing scrap bits in the bin with his name on it, hoping that he'd be in a better state to finish his project tomorrow. He wanted to get started on his own version of his staff soon, but was forcing himself to only work on one project at a time for now. Well, just think about it, okay. We'd be unstoppable. May turned back and started putting her own things away, humming slightly to herself as she went. When the bell rang to signify the end of the school day, the pair walked out together, May chatting about the projects she wanted done before the sports festival. Several times throughout the past week, Izuku had found himself awed by her vision, and he didn't just mean her quirk. Any problem a hero could face, May could think up an invention to solve it. Moreover, she could build her ideas, grinning in the face of failure and daring it to try and stop her. She had the same sort of drive that Izuku had always admired in Kakin. But where Kakin refused to accept that he might one day need help in his climb to the top, Mei seemed eager to form partnerships and accepted help as easily as she offered it. 
Oh, I can definitely help with the wire arrow. Izuku brightened as he listened to Mei explain the gear she wanted to bring into the sports festival with her, nearly interrupting her in his excitement. It sounds similar to what I made for the exam. We can use my base design and modify it. Oh, what if we attached it to your jetpack idea so that it's all one cohesive unit rather than two separate support items? That way, we can use the jet's propulsion system to also power the arrow launcher. If we use the right material with that sort of force, it could probably penetrate a steel wall. May's grin stretched even wider, somehow, and Izuku felt his cheeks start to ache at his own smile. Yes, we can start the design process tomorrow. This is going to be one incredible baby. Though, we also need something to work on crowd control. There's going to be a lot of students competing in the festival, and if we have any chance of getting to the one-on-one -on -one rounds, we need a way to deal with the masses. Something that could incapacitate large groups of people at once would be useful. For sure, Izuku agreed, chewing his lip as he thought about his own gear. A net launcher is pretty basic, but it's solid. Maybe some sort of chemical compound. A quick hardening solution? It'd have to be a pretty strong compound. But also easy to carry and distribute, May mused, like putting cement in a spray bottle. They bounced ideas off each other for a while, until they had to separate at the train station, and Izuku found himself making his way home on autopilot. Thoughts filled with possible inventions that would be useful not just for hero work, but also for getting May into the final round of the sports festival. He grinned at the prospect of May using her inventions to win. Maybe not first place. That was a fantasy a little too unrealistic even for Izuku's optimism. But he imagined her placing second or third instead. It would certainly be one way for her to draw attention to her inventions. And to prove that it took more than just a good quirk to cut it in the world of heroics. Support gear was essential. And good support designers should be in high demand. After all, mine made up. Izuku decided that even if he didn't care enough about the festival to compete, he would still do his very best to ensure that May made it all the way to the end. That was, after all, what any good business partner would do. As Ashi was angry, that much was clear. The man had turned himself into a hunched, fuming mass of heated glares in his seat next to Aizawa, who was well aware that his anger was actually a mask for his concern. Aizawa didn't mean to cause his husband so much distress, but frankly, he'd done all the healing he could do in his hospital bed and he was ready to be back on his feet, even if he didn't look ready, mummified in bandages as he was, across the table from him. Mimari kept sending him pointedly disapproving looks. She, unsurprisingly, shared his ashes opinion that Aizawa should still be on constant bed rest. Tashinori, next to her, looked two seconds away from falling on his knees and begging Shouta's forgiveness for being late to the USJ. His guilt was pointless, however. Shouta would only be truly angry if All Might's lateness had caused the injury of a student instead. Hazy, red-tinted images of Asui flashed through his mind and he quickly blinked her face away. Despite what the nightmares that had plagued him since the attack at the USJ told him, Aizawa had been able to protect his students, and they had protected themselves just as well. Aizawa was proud of his class. The other teachers in the lounge shifted uncomfortably at the energy radiating off their co-workers, but Aizawa simply occupied himself with the printed email in front of him as they all waited for their boss's arrival. Nezu, as always, was making them wait. It was a power play, one that they were all used to by now. Nevertheless, they had all shown up for the meeting at the time Nezu specified in the email. Years ago, a younger and more foolish Vlad had gotten frustrated by Nezu's habit of showing up late and had himself decided to be late. It was the first time Nezu had ever shown up to a meeting on time. They all suspected that he'd caught wind of Vlad's complaining and had decided to prove a point. Out of the corner of his eye, Aizawa noted All Might glancing towards the wall-mounted clock with increasing frequency and a steadily deepening frown, and said nothing. Aizawa didn't look up when the door finally swung open, Nezu's larger-than-life shadow falling across the meeting table in dramatic fashion as the rat himself strode into the room, hands held behind his back and a placid grin on his face. Ah, good morning everyone, he called, taking his place at the head of the table. Aizawa, it is good to see you back at work, though, I do believe it's a bit sooner than any of us were expecting. Has Recovery Girl cleared you to return? Hizashi and Nimari perked up. Smug victory written across their faces to hear the principal ostensibly on their side. Aizawa managed to refrain from rolling his eyes at them. She has, so long as my lessons stay in the classroom for now. His friend's faces fell, and his own smug expression was hidden behind the frankly ridiculous amount of bandages he was still buried under. Why, exactly? His doctors found it prudent to wrap him from head to fingers when his only open wounds were on his face and elbow was beyond his understanding. But Chio had made it perfectly clear that if she were going to allow him to return to work so soon, it would only be under the condition that he remained bandaged until his injuries were completely healed. Nezu's smile became slightly more genuine at Aizawa's answer. Lovely, we're all glad to have you back. 
In fact, your return has quite fortuitous timing, given the topic of today's meeting, the sports festival. They all knew that. Already, given the villain attack on the USJ, there are some people from both within and outside of UA calling for the sports festival to be cancelled. Student safety had to be a priority. After all, and people's faith in UAS security had been shaken. Of course, cancelling the sports festival would likely send the wrong message entirely. There might be those who claimed that postponing the event was a silent admission of UAS weakness, and that certainly wouldn't do. The commission allowed Nezu, and by extension, the rest of UAS staff, a certain degree of freedom so long as the school kept operating smoothly, turning out the next generation of heroes and being a bastion of hope for the future of hero society. If things got too out of hand, the commission would step in, and nobody wanted that. We should cancel it, Powerloader voiced his opinion. His sideways glance towards Shouda not at all hidden by his headpiece. The safety of our students comes first. And it's already been compromised once. I'm working on updating our security system already. And I urge you to at least postpone the festival until I'm done with the upgrades. Nezu didn't frown, though his smile faded to make way for a more thoughtful expression. I disagree, Vlad announced. Just as unprompted, we need to prove that we've recovered from this incident and are not afraid of any further attack. We haven't recovered yet. Or have you forgotten that 13 is still in the hospital? And Aizawa certainly isn't fully healed. Nimari shot back. Don't bring me into this. Aizawa interrupted her, sitting up straighter and casting his red-eyed glare around the table. We should hold the sports festival, with added security, of course. The increased presence of pro heroes at this year's event will go a long way to restoring the public's faith in us, as well as send a message to the villains that while we were caught unprepared once, it won't happen again. Besides, the sports festival was the only chance for Shinso and Midoriya to get transferred into 1A. Not that Aizawa would ever tell the others that was his main reason for wanting the festival to continue as planned. Although, the knowing sparkle in Nezu's eyes made Aizawa feel like his inner thoughts weren't as private as he might have liked them to be. He suppressed the instinctive shiver that tried to crawl down his spine. Well, as the injured party here, I would say that Aizawa's opinion carries quite a bit of weight in this discussion. Nezu announced, smiling serenely as he continued, speaking over the sudden outburst of arguments and agreements taking place. The sports festival will proceed. I've already taken the liberty of contracting a few pro heroes to patrol the festivities and make their presence known. I'm sure you're all familiar with Mount, Lady, Death Arms, and Kamui Woods, although there will also be a handful of other heroes as well. All UA alumni, of course. The shouting wound down into grumbles at that. As each teacher realized in turn that their arguments had never meant anything at all, Nezu had made his decision long before the meeting was called, and this was all just a formal announcement. Aizawa supposed he wasn't surprised. I trust there are no further concerns, Nezu asked with false innocence, smiling disingenuously at them all. Excellent. Present Mike, I trust that I can count on you to commentate this year, as you've done every year since you started working here. The storm cloud that was his husband hadn't untensed once during the meeting, but now his ashy sat up straight and Aizawa was almost afraid of the sudden wide, sharp grin he was giving the principal. Only if Shouta is my co-commentator. Aizawa blinked. Absolutely not. Done, Nezu announced, completely disregarding Aizawa's refusal. Hazashi grinned, vindictive and triumphant, and settled back in his chair, radiating smugness, sighing, but not bothering to argue. Aizawa resigned himself to his fate. He supposed that there were worse punishments than sitting in a private, air-conditioned spectator booth for a few hours with his husband watching from a bird's eye view how his students fared in the festival. Not that he'd ever tell his ashy that. If his husband suspected for a moment that Shouta was not suffering through the event, then he was certain he'd go out of his way to come up with a more fitting form of revenge, like dragging Shouta along next time he and Nimari went out to a bar, for example. Well, now that that's all settled, Nezu hopped off his chair and made his way towards the door. Meeting dismissed. The others lingered at the table for a while longer after the principal's departure before eventually dispersing. Some, like Vlad and Powerloader, went straight to their classrooms to prepare for the day, while others chose instead to stay in the lounge until the last possible minute. Carefully, Aizawa pushed his chair back from the table and stood, no easy task with both of his arms in slings and crossed over his chest, fully intent on making the most of the hour before students would start arriving with a cat nap. His sleeping bag was already spread across his usual couch, courtesy of Hizashi, and he slid into it as gracefully as he could manage, trusting that either Hizashi or Nimari would wake him before homeroom began. Aizawa closed his eyes and willed himself to fall into deep sleep, which probably would have worked better if his brain hadn't decided that it was the perfect opportunity to remind him that he hadn't seen any of his students since the attack. While Hazashi had told him that they were all well, physically, Aizawa hadn't been around to gauge any emotional or mental damage that they might have taken, heroes needed to be tough and ready for anything. But his class weren't heroes yet. They were first years, just children still. 
and not even a full semester into their training. Pound Dog had enough on his plate already, but Aizawa figured making sure his students got at least one session with him would probably be for the best, just to assess their recovery. It was something to bring up with the counselor later, at least, while he was at it. Maybe he should book appointments for his unofficial students as well. While neither Shinso or Midoriya had been at the USJ, they both could probably benefit from a guidance session. Of course, it'd have to wait until they were transferred into 1A after the festival. Shinso had visited Aizawa in the hospital, and they'd discussed strategy for the festival at Aizawa's insistence, of course. The kid had seemed hesitant to be there, uncertain and anxious, and while Aizawa wasn't sure if it was his injuries or the hospital itself that made his student so uncomfortable, he decided that acting as if it were a training session might help Shinso calm down. It had worked, and by the end of their visit Aizawa was certain that nothing the sports festival could throw at Shinso would stop him from making his mark in the event. And then there was Midoriya. Aizawa hadn't seen the problem child since he offered to train him. And how unlucky that the USJ trip occurred the same day the kid was supposed to have his first training session. He had, however, received a card from the young vigilante, and while the sentiment had warmed him slightly, he was concerned by the fact that Midoriya seemed intent on taking over his patrols. The kid already seemed exhausted every time Aizawa saw him. He couldn't imagine how he was faring now, with twice the workload. Aizawa wasn't foolish enough to imagine that he'd be allowed back on patrol anytime soon. He suspected that if he so much as brought up his return to hero work, Shio and Hizashi would tie him to a hospital bed and leave him there. He hoped that he could convince the kid not to run himself into the ground on his behalf. He wondered if Powerloader would mind him pulling Midoriya from class at some point during the day. Well, maybe not. It'd be more logical to catch the kid at lunch. Or in between classes, even if that meant the time he had to talk to the kid would be limited. With a huff, Aizawa peeled his eyes open and glared at the clock above the door, annoyed to find that he had just five minutes left before he needed to make his way towards class. Clearly, sleep was going to elude him until he managed to see his students, both official and unofficial. Ignoring the worried looks from Hizashi and Nimiri, Aizawa struggled into an upright position and stretched as much as he could without causing too much pain. While he was perfectly capable of teaching his class in his state, he wasn't too proud to admit that some of his injuries were only just bearable. His elbow, in particular, was in a state of itching, searing pain, and his face, with its litany of bruises and hairline fractures, ached constantly. There would be scarring, although not even Recovery Girl could guess the extent of it. That was fine. Aizawa had never cared overly much about his appearance, so long as the scar tissue didn't somehow impede his ability to do his jobs. Ready to head to class, then? Hizashi asked with a frown, standing up from where he'd been going over lesson plans and hovering a gentle hand over Aizawa's shoulder as though to help him stand. Aizawa did not refuse the silent offer. He didn't need Hizashi's help getting to his feet, but if it made his husband feel better to mother hen him, then Aizawa wouldn't deprive him of that. Hizashi gathered up his sleeping bag for him and tucked it under one arm. Aizawa allowed himself a grateful smile, which was hidden entirely by the bandages. Though based on the slight softening of Hizashi's expression, his husband could likely see his gratitude in his eyes. All right then, let's get to it, but don't overdo it today. I mean it. All lectures today. Aizawa reassured him as they made their way out of the lounge and towards his homeroom. The only thing I risk injuring is my voice. Good. Hizashi nodded sharply. And then paused. Well, not good. Don't injure that either. No promises. Hizashi huffed. But it was more amused than irritated. And Aizawa counted it as a win. Hey, Midori, is this yours? Izuku's breath caught in his throat, quickly joined by his heart and stomach and all the rest of his organs. Izuku was choking, his dread thick and cloying. As he eyed the notebook, his notebook, dangling from May's fingers, held up where the whole class could see. It was his analysis book, the brand new one he'd bought specifically for UA. It already had pages and pages of notes, and it wasn't just quirk-based anymore either. His notes on his classmates also included their design styles, their business sense, how fast they worked or how neat they kept their workstations. Izuku knew that his quirk analysis was already creepy by other people's standards. If May opened that book and saw his analysis of their design and work styles, too. Well, Izuku had already witnessed the destruction of one of his notebooks, and now he braced himself for the same. Yeah, he managed to choke out, the single syllable sounding strangled even to his own ears. May's brow wrinkled, and Izuku wasn't sure if it was concern or confusion that caused her to frown at him. Here, sorry, I know you don't like people touching your stuff. She held the notebook out to him with both hands. I think it fell out of your bag earlier, that's all. Right, thanks. Izuku forced himself to take a deep breath, reaching out with only a little hesitance. He half expected May to yank the book away the moment he tried to take it, but she relinquished it easily. You okay? You're looking pretty pale. May tilted her head as she studied him, and Izuku tried not to squirm under her gaze. His head was spinning as he tried to find the words to make her forget she ever saw the notebook at all. 
He didn't want to lose another friend, didn't want his nice classmates to turn on him. It was foolish of him to keep bringing his analysis books to school. Hadn't he already learned this lesson? Stupid. After a long moment of silence, May's eyes lit up with realization and her pinched expression smoothed out into a smile again. Oh, is it like your diary or something? Don't worry, I didn't read it. Pinky swear. I just picked it up off the floor and thought it looked like your handwriting on the front. Yeah it's, it's basically a journal, yeah. Izuku latched onto May's words like a lifeline, his organs all at once launching themselves back into their proper places so that his breath could flow easily again. He still felt a little dizzy, but he offered her a shaky smile, sorry, I didn't mean to freak out. Thank you for returning it. No problem. Try not to lose it again if you're that worried about it. Izuku decided not to point out that he hadn't dropped the notebook on purpose, far too relieved to find the matter dropped, now. Eh, will do, he muttered instead, tucking the notebook into his bag and promising himself to just leave it at home tomorrow. Eager to change the subject, he glanced at the incomplete blueprint spread across May's workstation. So, how's the design coming along? Bah, she huffed, smile dropping slightly as she glared at the schematics like they'd personally wronged her. I don't see why this is necessary. I've got the design in my head already, why can't I just start building it? Izuku's own smile felt a bit more genuine as he leaned across his table to get a better look at her blueprint. Powerloader insisted that every project worked on in his design studio had to have schematics drawn up and submitted for approval, a restriction that really seemed to wear May's patience thin. She was of the mind that the best inventions were spontaneous, not planned out to the smallest component. Izuku supposed he could see both sides. Powerloader needed to make sure they weren't building anything too dangerous, and besides, it made it easier to keep track of how much material went into each project. May's style of inventing on the fly often meant perfectly good parts ended up scrapped when she altered her design on a whim. Still, Izuku had seen enough of May's babies to know that she was an engineering genius, and she seemed to work best in chaos, throwing bits and pieces together until all at once she had something whole and functional. Watching May build was the definition of trusting the process, as far as Izuku was concerned. I could finish the design for you, if you want, Izuku offered, laughing to himself at the way she perked up and shot him a hopeful look. We all know you aren't going to stick to the blueprint anyway. You're the best. May partially rolled the blueprint as she picked it up, eager to be rid of it, but Izuku held up his hand with a teasing grin. She paused, eyes wide. Not so fast. In exchange, I need your expertise as a consultant about a project I want to work on. Like you even need to bargain. May shoved the schematics into his chest with enough force that he rocked back on his stool slightly, though he managed to keep his balance with a laugh. You haven't mentioned a new idea. What is it? You're not holding out on me, are you? We're business partners now. No, not holding out. I just wanted to get the design down before I brought it to you. Izuku spread her blueprint out on the desk. The jetpack, wire arrow combination design. He could see where she intended to allow the two parts to separate, so that both could be used independently of each other, although she hadn't finished sketching out the mechanics of that. Easy enough to finish. In exchange, Izuku picked up one of the cardboard tubes that leaned against the leg of his workstation and offered it to me whose eyes shone with curiosity. She popped the plastic cap off the tube and shook out the schematics. Izuku had marked out the design at home, using his current staff as a starting point. He liked the length of his staff, but a racer head had been right in saying that he needed something more suitable for close combat. His current gloves did nothing to protect his knuckles from damage when he had to use his fist. And for as fast as he was, his punches didn't have half as much force behind them as those of the criminals he found himself fighting. So, in order to account for that, Izuku had the idea for a staff that could also be split into two parts. He also hoped to keep the taser element of his original staff, though that was negotiable. And, in the corner of the blueprint, he had a note about the sort of material he wanted it made from. Only used for support gear, sheer steel was similar to what was used for the ropes of capture nets or the fabric of a racer head scarf. It was a compound of high tensile strength and impressive flexibility that could, with the right stimulus, be made stiff and entirely unyielding. Essentially, if Power Loader approved his use of the material, Izuku could make a staff that could alternate between being completely solid and completely flexible as he needed. The concept wasn't all that dissimilar from video game swords that turned into whips. May's expression was promising as she studied his design. Her grin stretching into the wide, toothy grin that promised mayhem and always made Power Loader pale behind his headgear. Usually, her mad inventor smile was followed by no small amount of fire and explosions. It made Izuku nervous, at first, but he'd quickly learned that May's chaos was always more controlled than she let on. And if it wasn't, well, Izuku was always nearby with a fire extinguisher, just in case. It requires a constant low-level electrical current to stay solid. How did you plan? May started to wonder aloud, before she cut herself off. Oh, I see, the gloves. Yep, wiring in the gloves should provide the right level of current. And as long as they're properly insulated inside there's no danger to the wearer. 
and that way you can control the current no matter what part of the staff you're holding. Exactly, and, with a weighted switch on the glove, there's no chance of accidentally toggling the current. Staff when you want, rope when you don't. May paused, leaning back on her stool and tilting her head at the secondary design. It could only be split when hardened, Izuku pointed out, wondering if that's what had caught her attention, but it should be easy enough to create a current through both gloves to account for that. HM, yeah. Easy enough, May agreed absently, and Izuku leaned onto his elbows and waited. After a moment, May nodded to herself and grinned at him again. If we can make a way to block the current by sections, it could function as a sort of rope weapon. We'd have to modify the base design for that, to adjust the weight balance and account for some sort of grip on the rope end. Adding a flat ring to the end wouldn't be difficult, but it'd be odd to have when using it as a staff. Detachable, then, May proposed, before shaking her head. No, too clumsy in a fight. Maybe not. Though we'd have to design a special locking mechanism so it can be attached when the staff is solid and stay connected when it goes flexible. Should be easy. Problem is, the part we'd be holding wouldn't be electrified, but the end would have to be to stay stiff. That won't work because the current comes from the gloves. May frowned, her fingers starting to drum on the tabletop. Izuku could tell that she was itching to just start building a staff and figure it out from there, but it was his project. Forgot about that. Yeah, could just make the end out of a different material, I guess. Wouldn't have to change the basic design much, just add an extra bit on the end. True, but that would mean it would split into longer halves. Hmm, that wouldn't be much of a problem, really. The extra length would actually be pretty convenient all around. Well, problem solved. May leaned forward and put on her very best hopeful expression. You gonna let me help build it? Izuku pretended to think about it, one hand cupping his chin and eyes turned up towards the ceiling. Maybe, he drew the word out, fighting the smile that tugged at the corners of his mouth when she huffed in exasperation. I was hoping to get it done before the sports festival, so it might be helpful to have an extra set of hands. May straightened up at that, and Izuku looked up at her in surprise. You're participating. Izuku blinked. What? You want it done for the sports festival, you just said so. You changed your mind. Oh, Izuku felt a flash of guilt for getting May's hopes up. No, sorry, I didn't mean to make it sound like that. I just thought it'd be good to get it done soon, so maybe you could use it. If you wanted to, most of your inventions are mobility or evasion based. I thought it'd be good for you to have something offensive too. Oh, May wilted for just a moment before perking back up. You'll let me use your design for the festival? Our design, now, Izuku pointed out. He'd read up on the rules of what equipment support students could register to use during the festival. And it very specifically stated that gear could only be used if it was designed and built by the student themselves. The rules didn't, however, specify that the student had to be the only one to work on said project. The way Izuku understood it, as long as May helped him finalize the design and actually build his staff, there was no reason why she shouldn't be allowed to use it in the festival. May's smile was near blinding, and Izuku returned it easily, excitement building in his chest. The sports festival was the perfect environment for testing the staff. And if it worked as intended, Izuku looked forward to bringing it out on patrol with him, under the guise of working on it at home, of course. Power Loader was pretty lenient with how often students were allowed to take their works in progress home with them. He'd still have his other staff as a backup, of course, but Izuku liked the idea of having a more flexible weapon, something that could adapt to nearly any fight he might find himself in. Besides, the idea of taking down villains with a weapon that he designed and built by his own hand, albeit with May's help, filled him with a warm sense of pride. Premature pride, admittedly. He was getting a little ahead of himself. Great, you take that to Power Loader to get it approved, and I'll finish this so we can start on both projects by tomorrow. Izuku gestured to the still unfinished and mostly forgotten blueprint in front of him. May nodded and hopped off her stool, practically bouncing with excitement. Blueprints in hand, she rushed up to Power Loader's desk. Izuku tried not to be amused by their teacher's obvious suspicion of her eagerness. Izuku picked up his pen and turned his attention towards the work in front of him. He was putting a lot of extra work on himself, working on two projects at once on top of his already doubled vigilante patrols, but he knew it'd be worth it. Grinning down at the blueprint as he listened to Power Loader approve all materials requested for the staff, Izuku figured that, with all the work he was taking on, he was lucky to have May around to help. Between the two of them, Izuku knew that the building process would be a breeze. Midoriya, Izuku froze in place, heart jumping into his throat at the familiar voice calling his name. He spun around, doing his best to keep anything from sliding off the lunch trays he was carrying a bit precariously in each hand, and felt his face break into a grin at the man leaning against a classroom doorway. A racer head. You, are you okay? I mean, I heard what happened, er. Hi, how how are you? Izuku squeezed his eyes shut, taking a pain moment to recover from his babbling. When he opened them again, he found himself studying the teacher, frowning slightly at the bandages around his head that covered everything but his eyes and hair. 
His arms, too, were bandaged, both crossed over his chest in sling position. He looked bad, obviously, but he was standing on his own two feet and was clearly well enough to return to work, well, one job at least. Izuku doubted the man would be returning to hero work as well, but that was okay. He didn't mind covering the man's patrols in the meantime, if it meant that Eraserhead could focus on recovery. I wanted to talk to you about your training, Eraserhead told him, and Izuku felt his stomach drop slightly. He glanced around the hall for anyone who might overhear them, but of course there was no one. Everyone else was in the cafeteria. Er, sure, I just, is it gonna take long? I mean, I'm happy to talk to you. But my friend is, uh, Izuku hesitated, lifting the lunch trays in a careful gesture, waiting for me. It won't take long. I'm resuming Shinzo's usual training sessions tomorrow. And the offer still stands for you to join him. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, thanks. I, I'll be there. T-test ground gamma, still. Aizawa nodded and Izuku took that to be the end of the conversation. He started to turn away, a goodbye on his tongue, but the hero spoke up before he could say anything. Thank you. W what? Izuku turned back, blinking in surprise at the man and only narrowly avoiding launching May's juice carton off her tray. The card, Aizawa explained, and Izuku felt his mouth twitch into a smile even as his cheeks started heating up. He heard the underlying meaning in Eraserhead's tone. The patrols. Yeah, no problem. It's the least I could do. Eraserhead's expression was obscured by the gauze, but by the tilt of his head, Izuku could practically see the raised eyebrow aimed in his direction. You look tired. I'm fine, he lied. You should get some sleep. Even heroes take time off. Izuku's smile dropped, although he was quick to paste it back on, keeping up a casual expression. I'm not a hero, though. Not yet. His breath hitched at the words, so quiet he wasn't certain he was meant to hear them. They burrowed into his chest and made themselves space under his ribs. But Izuku did his best to ignore the ache that they caused. Eraserhead didn't seem one to mince words. And this was the second time he'd managed to set Izuku off kilter with just two simple words. It wasn't a comfortable feeling. Not ever, he shot back. And they both pretended like they couldn't hear the quiver in his words. I'm a support student, and I've really got to get back to the design studio. Izuku spun on his heels, striding down the hall at an angry pace until the manners his mother instilled in him forced him to stop. Er, he glanced back over his shoulder and spared a moment to wish he could see Eraserhead's expression, even though he suspected it would be as unreadable as ever. I'm glad you're back and recovering well. See, see you later. Not waiting for a response, Izuku tried to close the distance between himself and the corner that would lead him to the support department hall as quickly as possible. He was so focused on getting away from Eraserhead. Head down and shoulders hunched, that he wasn't paying much attention to what was in front of him. So it caught him completely off guard when he suddenly slammed straight into the chest of someone turning the corner at the same time as him. He managed to keep a hold of the lunch trays as he yelped and started backpedaling. But the food itself didn't seem to have fared particularly well, completely spread out over the plates and trays and all mixing together. Izuku found himself staring mournfully at the food for a moment before his brain caught up to what had just happened. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Izuku's head snapped up to look at who he had just run into, a stream of apologies already rushing from him. Really, I wasn't looking where I was going. I'm so sorry, are you okay? All Might, the skinny, skeletal version of himself, at least, stared back at him, expression caught between startled and uncertain. It's really quite alright, All Might said, offering a pale smile as Izuku gaped at him. His organs were suddenly flooded with ice water, and he found himself somehow even more tense than he'd been just moments ago. A small voice at the back of his mind insisted that he should start bringing food for himself and May from home. That way he would never have to leave the design studio again. No harm done. Well, except for your lunch. Uh, that's, it's no big deal. Um, well, sorry again. Izuku found himself stammering, slowly circling around All Might while never taking his eyes off him. The man looked almost like he wanted to say something else. But the moment Izuku was past him, he spun and sprinted off towards the design studio. By Eraserhead, by All Might. He didn't stop running until he was in the studio, back pressed against the door and chest heaving. May didn't look up from where she was welding a braided metal cord to the shaft of an arrow, though he could tell she was aware of his presence by the way she tilted her head towards him. He were gone a while, run into trouble in the cafeteria. Eh, more like in the hallway. I ran into, literally ran into, a teacher, Midori explained as he moved to his workstation, setting down the trays. Our food is kind of scrambled. May lifted her face shield and grinned over her shoulder at him, putting down the welding torch. That's alright, it'll taste the same anyway. Which teacher? I doubt that. Izuku frowned skeptically down at the cup of custard now covering his rice, and all might. Pretty crazy, right? He hoped she didn't hear the insincerity behind his cheer, or, if she did, he hoped that she'd attribute it to his embarrassment. Oh yeah, I forgot he was teaching hero courses this year, May mused, and Izuku couldn't help but gape at her in shock. You forgot that the number one hero is a teacher here. 
Seriously? Yeah. May flapped a hand dismissively at him as she finished setting her welding gear aside and took a seat on the stool across from him. It'd be different if it were someone like, you know, David Shield working here or something. But I just don't care that much about celebrities. I, All Might is more than just a celebrity, Izuku insisted, scandalized. He's, he's a symbol. Of peace, May finished, rolling her eyes good-naturedly. I've heard. I'm not saying he's not great or whatever, I just don't personally find him that interesting. He doesn't even use support gear other than his costume anymore, so there's no reason for me to be that invested. Izuku bit back his next argument as May dug into her lunch, seemingly unbothered by the fact that it was largely an indistinct pile of different foods. Frankly, he wasn't entirely sure why he was bothering to defend the man in the first place. Izuku of all people knew that All Might wasn't the infallible pillar of society that everyone held him up to be, but he supposed old habits died hard. Even though Izuku had spent the past year mostly avoiding the topic of All Might, that didn't erase the fact that he'd still spent the first 14 years of his life idolizing him. That makes sense, I guess, Izuku admitted, instead of anything else he might have said. I used to be a big fan of his. Used to be. I'm more impressed by underground heroes now. May just nodded in understanding, her mouth full. And Izuku himself finally took a seat and set about separating his food as best he could. All in all, his lunch was mostly salvageable. And the two spent the rest of the lunch period in companionable silence. The comfort of May's presence settling around Izuku's shoulders like a comfortable, if unfamiliar, sweater. Aizawa watched the kid sprint away as best he could while also keeping two lunch trays steady before turning his gaze to Yagi. Not All Might, but Yagi, the gaunt, hunched over giant of a man who looked completely flummoxed as he looked back at Aizawa. Kids these days, Yagi remarked casually, shifting somewhat under the scrutinizing stare Aizawa was leveling at him. Always in a hurry, Aizawa stayed silent, but kept his full attention on All Might. He'd learned a few tricks for getting people to talk, and one of them was to force them to fill the silence. Usually, a student who was guilty of breaking some rule or another would accidentally confess if he just waited for long enough. All Might, however, was not one of his students, and Aizawa supposed it was a point in Yaga's favor that he kept his composure under the weight of the pointed silence stretching between them. Is there something you wish to ask me, Aizawa? The man finally questioned, shuffling closer so they could speak more quietly. Aizawa weighed the question for a moment, considering. Eventually, he decided that being blunt was the most logical way forward, as it often was, and he tilted his head slightly as he asked, You know Midoriya, though, is that the young man's name? All might look thoughtful for a moment. Although Aizawa could see the man's nerves in the tightness of his shoulders and the way he glanced down the hall as though looking for an escape. Yes, I do believe I've met him before. I autographed a notebook for him, if I recall correctly. He certainly seems to remember you well, Aizawa stated pointedly, further emphasizing his meaning when he added, Yagi. All Might's eyes widened for a moment as he caught the meaning, before his expression shifted entirely, almost as though a shudder was slamming down over his face, even though he wasn't in his puffed-up muscular form. Aizawa could see the steel of the number one hero lurking under his expression. It was quite unlucky. I ran out of time not long after meeting him, and he saw me in this form, All Might confessed, bracing himself as though he expected Aizawa to berate him for his carelessness. While it was careless of the man to let himself run out of time in front of a civilian, it was also none of Aizawa's concern. So long as All Might stopped using all of his strength before the school day even began, Making him unable to teach his own classes, Aizawa did not have the time, energy, or investment to scold the man. I see, Aizawa said instead, leaning back and finally pulling his eyes away from All Might. Out of his peripheral vision, he could see the man relax slightly. Lucky that it was Midoriya, then, and not someone with a bigger mouth. It's true. I've not heard any rumors or had to deal with any reporters asking strange questions about my quirk since the incident. My PR manager would have had my head if so, so I suppose young Midoriya is keeping my secret well. Aizawa knew there was more to the story, but he didn't have any desire to weasel it out of Yagi. He could ask Deku later, if his idle curiosity persisted. Unlike the pro hero standing in front of him, Aizawa knew that he could get Midoriya to spill the whole story if he applied the same silent pressure. For all the confidence the kid showed in a fight, or sprinting across rooftops in the dead of night, Midoriya was clearly a nervous creature at heart. Done with the conversation, Aizawa turned and set off down the hall, aiming for the teacher's lounge. All Might would almost certainly be going the same direction, but Aizawa had no interest in keeping pace and making small talk with the man. The only person he could stand small talk with was his Ashi, and that was because his husband's version of small talk only required him to listen, rather than actively participate. Aizawa had always been that way. He supposed, it's why he got along so well with people like Hizashi and Nimiri, people who could talk and talk without so much as a pause for breath. They didn't force him to exchange pleasantries or make meaningless contributions to equally pointless conversations. 
When they themselves were first years and Aizawa had just transferred into the Hero Course Post Sports Festival, it had taken Hizashi all of a single day to realize that he just wasn't interested in answering questions about himself or gossiping about classmates and teachers. Instead, Hizashi planted himself across from him at lunch and just started talking. Aizawa couldn't remember what he was talking about, but he could clearly recall the passionate hand gestures that accompanied his speech and the wide grin, only a little bit strained, that he kept on his face as he acted like they were already friends. After a week of being talked at by his infuriating, persistently friendly classmate, teenaged Aizawa suddenly realized that he was starting to look forward to listening to Hizashi ramble about whatever had grabbed his interest that day. He'd never forget the look on Hizashi's face the first time he willingly participated in a lunchtime conversation. The sheer pride and enthusiasm in his expression was bright enough to brand itself into Aizawa's memory forever. Not long after that, Nimuri and Tensei and Aburo started joining them in their little corner of the cafeteria, trickling in one by one until one day Aizawa blinked and found himself surrounded by more friends than he'd ever had in his life. Shaking his head, Aizawa turned his thoughts away from the past, focusing instead on his schedule for the rest of the day as he slid into the teacher's lounge, leaving the door open for Yagi, who was only a few paces behind him, and took his place at one of the many desks, spreading his lesson plan across it. Still, it was lucky that there were so many bandages covering his face. It meant that no one could see the fond grin that tugged insistently at his mouth at the warm memories curled cat-like at the back of his mind. Despite his own reluctance to cut his patrol short, Izuku did end up calling it a night almost a full two hours earlier than he normally would have. He wanted to say that it was because he was a mature, responsible vigilante who knew how to recognize his own limits. But the truth was that it took three close calls with the edge of a roof and a long drop before he realized that maybe fighting villains while sleep-deprived was not his brightest idea. Luckily, it had been a quiet night with no actual crime to fight. The most good Deku had done that night was pick up some litter from an overturned trash can. Important for the environment, sure, and he was probably making some sanitation workers day easier, but not exactly the sort of task that he needed to be out in the middle of the night for. The upside to reluctantly taking Eraserhead's advice was that Izuku got nearly double the amount of sleep he normally would have, and woke up feeling less fuzzy and frustrated than he had in days. He was sure that his body would have appreciated another hour or twenty to rest, but he couldn't exactly afford to miss a day of school, not with the number of projects he and May needed to finish before the rapidly approaching sports festival. Even with the two of them splitting the workload, Izuku knew they'd be cutting it close to the deadline to submit all their inventions so that May could actually use them in the event. He really wanted to finish the staff first, although May had made the excellent point that mobility items like her rocket boots or the wire launcher would probably be the most useful no matter what the festival threw at her. Still, there was something to be said about keeping a balance, evasion was good. But she also needed defense and offense if she wanted to have any chance of beating out the hero course kids and making it to the final round. They had essentially no combat training, nor any interest in picking up hand-to-hand, -hand, so she would have to rely solely on her own invent, young Midoriya. A familiar voice interrupted Izuku's thoughts as he ducked and weaved his way through the crowded halls on his way to homeroom. He froze midstep, causing several other students to jostle him as they quickly corrected course to get around him. For a brief moment, Midoriya considered ducking his head and letting the crowd pull him along, away from the booming voice and the eyes he could feel boring into his back. But politeness eventually won out. Izuku turned around and made his way towards the wall, where the crowd was thinnest, and closed the distance between himself and All Might, in his puffed-up quirk form, of course. Several students side-eyed him as they passed, though most were distracted by the stars in their eyes as they noticed the number one hero loitering in a classroom doorway. Hello, All Might, Midoriya muttered, hooking his thumbs behind the straps of his bag and glancing around for a flash of pink. Sorry again about running into you yesterday. Consider it forgiven and forgotten, my boy. All Might reassured him, sounding genuine enough. Midoriya shuffled in place, torn between uncomfortable and curious as he waited for the man to explain why he'd called him over. I was actually hoping to speak with you, in regards to our previous meeting. Midoriya wasn't surprised. He was one of what he could only assume was a mere handful of people to know what was possibly the biggest secret in the entire history of heroics. I haven't told anyone, I swear. I know, my boy, that's not what I'm concerned about. It's not. No, All Might confirmed before pausing for a long moment. He scanned the thinning crowd of students, no doubt to ensure that no one was listening in, before taking a deep breath. Young Midoriya, I.O. Midoriya, May's enthusiastic shout cut through All Might's sentence mid-syllable, and the man looked momentarily taken aback as she bounded straight for them in a rush. There you are, you're late. The bell hasn't even rung, Midoriya pointed out as she latched onto his arm, giving a token half-hearted resistance as she tugged him away from All Might. Doesn't matter, we're running out of time. We need every second if we're going to finish our babies before the deadline. 
part of Midoriya really wanted to know what All Might was going to say, while the other part of him was grateful for May's interference, offering the hero an apologetic look as he was pulled away. Given the way their previous conversation had gone, Midoriya was terrified of what All Might could have to say to him now. What if he didn't even want someone like Midoriya attending UA and had been about to tell him that he should drop out? What if he wanted to tell the other teachers that Midoriya had been responsible for the sludge villain attacking Bakugo so many months ago? Admittedly, neither scenario seemed likely. He reminded himself that even when All Might told him that he couldn't be a hero, there was no particular malice there. All Might didn't seem to wish ill on Midoriya just by nature of him being quirkless, and he didn't seem overly concerned about the fact that Midoriya knew his secret, either. Of course, that just left Midoriya even more anxious and confused. His organs a twisted mess as he stumbled along behind Mei, the excited buzz of her ranting a background noise for his own internal rambling. Midoriya couldn't believe how quickly time moved once he'd fallen into the rhythm of a steady routine. Wake up for school, stay late working on his inventions with Mei, slip out to patrol the streets after his mom had gone to bed, get home way too late, try his best to get a few hours of sleep, wash, rinse, repeat. It felt like he'd only just begun attending UA a week ago, but the sports festival's rapid approach was a solid reminder of the unrelenting march of time. Too soon, Midoriya found that there were mere days between now and the festival. The good news was that he and Mei had finished all of their projects well before the deadline for submission, which helped free up Midoriya's schedule for the after-school training he was supposed to attend that day. He would have felt bad bailing on Mei so close to the festival. On that note, Mei's forms were all in order so that she could use anything and everything they had built in the festival. She'd submitted forms for him, too, apparently, just in case he changed his mind, she'd said though Midoriya was fairly certain that wasn't going to happen. The plan, as always, was to throw the first round and spend the rest of his time watching May annihilate the competition with their babies. Weaving through the crowd of students streaming towards their final classes of the day, Midoriya was careful to keep his head down and shoulders hunched so he was indistinguishable from the surging masses cramming the hallway. It wasn't that he was avoiding All Might, per se, but he was certainly not going to do anything to encourage another chat. As far as he was concerned, he and All Might would both be better off pretending they had never met each other. So far, he'd been successful at going unnoticed by the hero, and Midoriya couldn't help the way he smiled every time he made it to class unimpeded, even when he passed right by the man. His stealth skills were really coming along. Unfortunately, his progress towards his own classroom was quickly stymied by a particularly dense and unmoving group of students, packed like sardines around the door to Hero Class 1A. Midoriya had heard about the 1A students through the grapevine, he had asked around. Even, once he'd learned that it was Eraserhead's homeroom class, which is how he knew that Kakin was one of them. Frowning, Midoriya consciously made himself even smaller, keeping close to the backs of larger students as he tried to push through the crowd. He was making little progress, but at least he was relatively certain he would remain unnoticed among all the other people. There was shouting towards the front of the group, and Midoriya caught something about blocking the doorway and holding someone hostage, and only then did he realize exactly what was going on. 1A was the class that had been attacked at the USJ, the class who now had a reputation for being the only group of first years to have faced down and survived a full-scale villain invasion. Largely due to the efforts of Eraserhead and the other teachers, Midoriya assumed, but it was said that the students held their own surprisingly well given how little training they'd had until then. Almost as though to confirm his theory, Midoriya heard an all-too-familiar voice carry over the crowd. They're scouting out the competition. Idiots. Were the class that survived a real villain attack. Midoriya was half-surprised that the statement wasn't punctuated by the telltale pop of explosion. At least now you know what a future pro looks like. Now move it, extras, scoffing to himself even as his muscles tightened instinctively. Midoriya resumed his efforts to get through the crowd before he was late to class or worse, seen by Kakin. This was the closest Midoriya had knowingly been to his former classmate since the new semester began, and he would hate to have his perfect streak ruined. So this is class 1A. A voice from the crowd called out, cool and collected, I heard you guys were impressive, but you just sound like an ass. Midoriya couldn't have stopped the shock gasp that escaped his throat even if he'd wanted to. He'd never heard anyone talk to Bakugo that way, and he knew it was only a matter of time before the explosion started. The crowd, somehow immovable despite Midoriya's best efforts, prevented his escape, and so he stilled, half peeking around a student twice his size as he waited for the situation to escalate. He could vaguely make out a taller student with purple hair pushing his way to the front of the group, and it seemed a safe bet that he was the one that had called out Kakin. Is everyone in the hero course delusional, or just you? Honestly, if Midoriya wasn't so tense, he might have found the situation amusing. Something about hearing someone talk to Kakin the way he spoke to everyone else was both startling and gratifying. If only he could enjoy the moment. 
How sad to come here and find a bunch of egomaniacs. The crowd had fallen silent and still, clearly as startled by the turn of events as Midoriya was, though likely for different reason. That student had a way of speaking, tone even and yet somehow compelling, that made them all listen with rapt attention as he spoke. I wanted to be in the hero course, but like many others here, I was forced to take a different track, such as life. General studies, Midoriya guessed. It was the fallback plan for every student who wanted to join the heroics department but lacked the sort of quirk that would guarantee their entrance. The sports festival was the biggest opportunity for those students to prove their merit and possibly earn themselves a transfer into the hero course. At one point, Midoriya had the same plan in mind, before he realized that the life of a vigilante was the better option, of course, scouting the competition. Midoriya's attention was drawn back to the confrontation half-blocked from his view, as the gen-ed student continued his monologue. Maybe some of my peers are, but I'm here to let you know that if you don't bring your very best, I'll steal your spot right from under you. Consider this a declaration of war. There was a collective gasp from both inside the classroom and out in the hallway, in shock at his boldness. Midoriya was likewise taken aback. But at the same time, he couldn't help but feel a bit of respect for the mystery student. He had guts, and clearly he had determination. Midoriya would keep an eye out for him while watching from the stands. Maybe he'd see something really impressive. There was some more shouting. From some newcomer Midoriya couldn't quite get a look at. And then someone telling Kakin that he should say something. Midoriya held his breath as he waited for the response, expecting explosions or threats of death and or bodily harm. Instead, Kakin's answer was level and serious. These people don't matter. The only thing that's important is that I beat them. The air left Midoriya's lungs in a quick gasp as Kakin apparently pushed his way through the crowd in the opposite direction. That was such a typical Kakin answer. And yet the delivery was not at all what Midoriya had expected. Maybe his time in class 1A had cooled his temper, somewhat. Wouldn't that be something? Turning away from the classroom, Midoriya was relieved to find that some of the crowd had begun ebbing away, to the point that he could finally brute force his way through what remained. He made it to Power Loader's class just in time for the bell. And all thoughts of the confrontation he'd witnessed were quickly wiped away by the sight of May's familiar, slightly manic grin that meant she'd had another brilliant idea. Those smiles always meant days of frantic building and one too many spontaneous combustions. But Midoriya couldn't help but feel a rush of excitement for whatever she had in mind. Test ground Gamma was larger than Midoriya had expected. He'd know, of course, that UA was famous for the size of its training grounds, most of them being a replica of several city blocks. Still, it was one thing to know that UAS campus was inordinately large, and another thing to actually see a miniature city contained within school grounds. He found himself gaping as he approached the gate. Hands clutched tight around his backpack straps. Aizawa sensei and another student were already there waiting for him, so he quickly smoothed his odd expression into a polite smile instead. It was only as he got closer to the pair that his eyes caught on lilac hair, and he realized with a start that Eraserhead's personal student, Shinso, was it, was the same person who had antagonized Class 1A earlier that day. Well, no wonder he was so confident that he'd be taking one of their places. He wouldn't have the same handicap that most of the general studies students had to contend with. With Eraserhead himself overseeing his training, of course he could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the hero course students, no matter what his quirk was. Midoriya felt his smile twitch into a frown for just a moment. It had been a tactical mistake for Shinzo to have drawn Class 1A's attention to himself. The fact that he was an unknown student, with ostensibly no training and a quirk that wasn't suited to the hero course, would have been a great advantage when it came to the one-on-one -on -one events. Now that he'd drawn attention to himself, it was more likely that other students would try to target him, to get him out in the early rounds in case he was more than just talk. Still, maybe there was a reason for that arrogance. Maybe Shinzo really was as good as he claimed to be, skilled enough that it just didn't matter if he painted a target on his own back. Midoriya would see for himself soon enough. So, Shinzo said when Midoriya reached the pair, your Eraserhead's other pity project. Midoriya blinked, glancing back and forth between the two. For the last time, I don't do pity, Aizawa droned with a sort of put-upon sigh that meant they'd had that conversation more than once before. Shinzo's mouth quirked into a lopsided smirk for just a moment. I prefer to think of myself as a charity case. Midoriya joked in response, grinning when Aizawa grunted in exasperation and Shinzo's smirk returned. I'm Midoriya. Shinzo. Nice to meet you, Shinzo. Come on. Aizawa turned to lead the way into the test site proper, and Midoriya felt his awe at the scale of it returning again. Midoriya and Shinzo followed him into the heart of the training ground. Or at least, Midoriya assumed they were somewhere near the center of the model city. The borderline skyscrapers surrounding them made it difficult to really judge where they were in relation to the wall around the site. Aizawa turned to face the pair again. Midoriya, he started, and Midoriya straightened attentively, trying not to let his nerves show on his face. What would you say is your biggest strength? 
Um, Midoriya hesitated, unsure how to answer that. He assumed that Eraserhead was asking about his biggest strength in a fight, which would be his speed and evasiveness. In general, however, Midoriya knew that it was his ability to mentally break down the situation and his opponents that really got him through most of his roughest nights. My analytical skill. His answer didn't sound confident, lilting up at the end like a question, but Aizawa only nodded, expression unchangingly neutral. And her biggest weakness. Well that one was easy, at least. Not having a quirk, Midoriya pretended not to notice the way Shinzo turned to look at him in surprise. He assumed Eraserhead would have mentioned that little detail to his other student, but apparently not. No, Aizawa rejected his answer without hesitation, and Midoriya blinked at him. Being quirkless is something you have to account for in a fight. That's true, but there are heroes whose quirks aren't inherently useful for hero work. Now try again. What is your biggest weakness? Midoriya frowned, partly at Aizawa's strange indifference towards his quirklessness, and partly because he wasn't entirely sure what else to say. Sure, he wasn't going to win any fights on brute strength alone, but he'd already taught himself to compensate for that by being quicker and more agile than his opponent, or utilizing support gear when his own skill couldn't bridge the skill gap between himself and a villain. Then again, that in itself could be a problem. The fact that he used support gear as a fail-safe instead of an A. One day, he'd find himself in a tight spot without the right equipment to make himself some space to maneuver, and that'd be it for him. He needed to learn how to hold his own, even if he didn't have any gear to even the playing field. I can be pretty evasive, but once I'm caught I have a hard time regaining control of the situation. Midoriya tried, speaking slowly as he tried to phrase his answer in a way that made sense while also not outright alluding to his nighttime hobby in front of Shinso. I feel like, currently, I would have to rely on support equipment to deal with a stronger opponent rather than my own ability. Aizawa nodded approvingly, and Midoriya felt some of the tension leave his shoulders at having provided a good answer. So, ideally, you want to come out of these training sessions feeling like you could hold your own against an opponent, regardless of their quirk or what gear you have at your disposal. Midoriya nodded, maybe a little too eagerly, and locked his hands behind his back as he bounced on the balls of his feet. That was exactly what he wanted, although eventually learning to better utilize the gear he did have would also probably be helpful. All right, that's something for me to keep in mind. Aizawa nodded to himself, and I already know what you're looking to get out of this, Shinso. Midoriya saw Shinso nod out the corner of his eye. His posture was relaxed, slouched with his hands in his pockets, at a juxtaposition with Midoriya's own stiff stance as he fidgeted with nervous excitement, a reminder that Shinso had already been training with Aizawa and was likely well ahead of Midoriya in technical skill level. But I've got practical experience, Midoriya reminded himself, trying not to feel inadequate to someone he hadn't even seen fight or use his quirk. It was so easy to feel confident when he was out as Deku, taking down low-grade villains at night, and less so as himself, standing next to someone who was, for all intents and purposes, his peer. Since there are two of you now, I've decided that today's session is going to be something of a team-building exercise. Aizawa tossed something at Shinso and then Midoriya, who both just managed to catch the strange disc-shaped objects. Midoriya idly examined it as Aizawa explained. I'm going to give you two the amount of time it takes me to make it back to the entrance to come up with a plan, and then I'm going to activate the robot inhabitants of this city. Some of the robots will be civilians, others, villains. Your job is to work together to stop the villains while minimizing collateral damage and civilian casualties. The training exercise ends either when the villains have all been foiled, meaning you use those discs to deactivate them, or when the damage exceeds what I consider to be acceptable losses. Understood. Both students nodded, Midoriya fighting to repress an excited grin. Oh, and I had initially planned to let both of you use one piece of authorized support gear to complete this assignment. Aizawa tacked on, almost as if it were an afterthought. But Midoriya thought the man sounded a little too smug for that to be true. But given what we discussed, I think it'd be best for you to do this without, Midoriya. Is it too late to change my answer? Midoriya muttered, and Shinso huffed in quiet amusement next to him. Shinso, however, may still choose a single item to assist you, if you so choose. Nah, Shinso answered after a moment. I think we can do this without any tools. Don't you agree, Midoriya? Midoriya glanced over in surprise to find Shinso offering him a cocky, lopsided grin. His first instinct was that his new teammate was mocking him somehow. But for as dry as Shinso's tone was, he didn't seem to have any malicious intent towards Midori. After a beat, Midoriya smiled back, trying to sound more certain than he felt as he agreed. Definitely. Good. Give me your bags. With both Midoriya and Shinzo's backpacks slung over his shoulders, Aizawa strode past them, seemingly taking his time as he made his way back towards the entrance gate. Midoriya spared a moment to wonder if the hero planned on snooping. Not that Midoriya really had anything to hide. 
Eraserhead already knew about his alter ego, so Midoriya didn't have to worry about him finding the burner phone or the mask that he kept in the bottom of his bag, just in case. So, Shinso started, any ideas on how we should handle this? I'll tell you now, my quirk's no good against robots. That's the reason I'm in general studies in the first place. The practical exam was against robots. Yeah, the more you take down, the more points you get. Different robots were worth a different amount of points. That sort of thing. Midoriya scrunched his face up. That's hardly fair. No wonder so many students have to transfer into the heroics department. So, you didn't take the heroics exam. No, I. Midoriya hesitated, not sure how honest he should be. If he confessed that he had no desire to be a hero, Shinso would likely question why he had agreed to training with Eraserhead. In the end, he settled on a half-truth. I knew I wouldn't get in, regardless of what the test was. I chose the support department, instead. You still could have tried, Shinso pointed out. I did. Midoriya blinked. And it took a moment for him to beat back the surge of emotions that threatened to choke him. First was the anger, but that was familiar to him. He'd had a decade of experience with holding back the rage that simmered under his skin and made him wish, just for a moment, that he was a different person. A worse person. It was easy enough to remind himself that Shinso hadn't meant any harm. Really, and that even if he did, Midoriya would not let himself be what the world tried to make him. He would not be broken under the cruelty his peers had treated him with. Would not let himself be turned into something calloused and unforgiving. He refused. Next came shame, as illogical as it was. And while it was far from a foreign emotion, Midoriya had a harder time swallowing it back. Shame burned, too. But it was a different sort of heat than rage. It was slower, steadier, and it flowed through his veins like magma. It was like anger turned inwards, burning away all of his good qualities until he was left with only his failures exposed. He didn't want to be seen as weak, as the sort of person who was so helpless that he didn't even bother to try, already knowing that it was a lost cause. But hadn't that been what he'd done? He'd given up a lifelong dream of heroics because he knew that no matter how hard he fought, there would always be yet another uphill battle. That's different, Izuku reminded himself, clenching his fists behind his back. He had given up on being a hero, but he hadn't given up on saving people. Against all odds, Midoriya had carved himself a place in the night, had turned himself into someone that made civilians feel safe when they saw him high above on the rooftops, almost as if he were a hero, as far as they were concerned. But of course, it's not like he could tell Shinzo that. Exhaling slowly, willing the fire in his body to suffocate, Midoriya uncurled his fists and flexed his fingers, offering his training partner a wry smile that he knew didn't reach his eyes. Maybe I'm just tired of trying, he confessed, a concise summary of the feeling that had settled deep in his bones all those weeks ago when he realized that the hero course wasn't meant for him. Shinso blinked, and for just a moment, Midoriya saw understanding in his eyes, and then his expression shifted into a scowl, his gaze catching on something past Midoriya's shoulder. Shit, he muttered, more to himself than to Midoriya, who spun around on instinct, we wasted our time. Midoriya stepped back until he stood shoulder to shoulder with Shinso, starting at the robot that was approaching them with slow, methodical steps. They had no plan, no weapons, and no idea what exactly the robot was capable of. There was a moment of tense panic as Midoriya looked around wildly, looking for something, anything, that might offer him the upper hand. And then he looked up, at the buildings towering over their heads, and he felt a sense of calm settling over him, his thoughts sharpening themselves to points as his months of hard-won instincts kicked into gear. All right, Shinzo, Midoriya said, offering his partner a sharp grin as he sank back into a defensive stance, muscles tensing in preparation for fight. I hope you know how to climb.